The Chicago School. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Robert Ross. The Chicago School by William James. First published in Psychological Bulletin 1 1 5. The rest of the world has made merry over the Chicago man's legendary saying that Chicago hasn't had time to get round to culture yet, but when she does strike her, she'll make her hum. Already the prophecy is fulfilling itself in a dazzling manner. Chicago has a school of thought, a school of thought which, it is safe to predict, will figure in literature as the school of Chicago for 25 years to come. Some universities have plenty of thought to show, but no school. Others, plenty of school, but no thought. The University of Chicago, by its decennial publications, shows real thought and a real school. Professor John Dewey and at least ten of his disciples have collectively put into the world a statement, homogeneous in spite of so many cooperating minds, of a view of the world, both theoretical and practical, which is so simple, massive, and positive that in spite of the fact that many parts of it yet need to be worked out, it deserves the title of a new system of philosophy. If it be as true as it is original, its publication must be reckoned an important event. The present reviewer, for one, strongly suspects it of being true. The briefest characterization is all that will be attempted here. Criticism from various quarters will doubtless follow, for about the new system as a bone of contention discussion is bound to rage. Like Spencer's philosophy, Dewey's is an evolutionism. But unlike Spencer, Dewey and his disciples have so far, with the exception of Dewey's admirable writings on ethics, confined themselves to establishing certain general principles without applying them to details. Unlike Spencer, again, Dewey is a pure empiricist. There is nothing real, whether being or relation between beings, which is not direct matter of experience. There is no unknowable or absolute behind or around the finite world. No absolute either in the sense of anything eternally constant. No term is static, but everything is process and change. Like Spencer, again, Dewey makes biology and psychology continuous. Life, or experience, is the fundamental conception, and whether you take it physically or mentally, it involves an adjustment between terms. Dewey's favorite word is situation. A situation implies at least two factors, each of which is both an independent variable and a function of the other variable. Call them E, environment, and O, organism, for simplicity's sake. They interact and develop each other without end, for each action of E upon O changes O, whose reaction in turn upon E changes E, so that E's new action upon O gets different, eliciting a new reaction, and so on indefinitely. The situation gets perpetually reconstructed, to use another of Professor Dewey's favorite words, and this reconstruction is the process of which all reality consists. 
I am in some doubt as to whether, in the last resort, Dewey thinks monistically or pluralistically of this reality. He often talks of experience in the singular as if it were one universal process and not a collective name for many particular processes. But all his special statements refer to particular processes only, so I will report him in pluralistic terms. No biological processes are treated of in this literature, except as incidental to ethical discussion, and the ethical discussions would carry us too far afield. I will confine myself, page 3, therefore to the psychological or epistemological doctrines of the school. Consciousness is functionally active in readjustment. In perfectly adapted situations, where adjustments are fluent and stereotyped, it exists in minimal degree. Only where there is hesitation, only where past habit will not run, do we find that the situation awakens explicit thought. Thought is thus incidental to change in experience, to conflict between the old and new. The situation must be reconstructed if activity is to be resumed, and the rejudging of it mentally is the reconstruction's first stage. The nucleus of the studies in logical theory becomes thus an account of the judging process. In psychological terms we say, in explanation of the judging process, that some stimulus to action has failed to function properly as a stimulus, and that the activity which was going on has been interrupted. Response in the accustomed way has failed. In such a case there arises a division in experience into sensation content as subject and ideal content as predicate. In other words, Upon failure of the accustomed stimulus to be adequate, activity ceases and is resumed in an integral form only when a new habit is set up to which the new or altered stimulus is adequate. It is in this process of reconstruction that subject and predicate appear. The old subject, the that of the situation, stands for the interrupted habit. The new subject, the that with the new what added, stands for the new habit begun. The predicate is thus essentially hypothetical. The situations to which the use of it leads may have quickly to be reconstructed in turn. In brief, S is a stimulus intellectually irritating P is an hypothesis in response. SP is a mental action which normally is destined to lead or pass into action in a wider sense. The sense of objectivity in the S emerges emphatically only when the P is problematic and the action undefined. Then only does the S arrest attention, and its contrast with the self become acute. Knowing, therefore, or the conscious relation of the object to the self, is thus only an incident in the wider process of adjustment, which includes unconscious adjustments as well. Page 4. This leads Professor Dewey and his disciples to a peculiar view of fact. What is a fact? A fact and a theory have not different natures, as is usually supposed, the one being objective, the other subjective. They are both made of the same material, experience material, namely, and their difference relates to their way of functioning solely. What is fact for one epoch, or for one inquirer, is theory for another epoch, or another inquirer. It is fact 
when it functions steadily. It is theory when we hesitate. Truth is thus in process of formation like all other things. It consists not in conformity or correspondence with an externally fixed archetype or model. Such a thing would be irrelevant even if we knew it to exist. Truth consists in a character enclosed within the situation. Whenever a situation has the maximum of stability and seems most satisfactory to its own subject factor, it is true for him. If accused here of opening the door to systematic Protagorianism, Professor Dewey would reply that the concrete facts themselves are what keep his skepticism from being systematic in any practically objectionable sense. Experience is continually enlarging, and the object factors of our situations are always getting problematic, making old truths unsatisfactory, and obliging new ones to be found. The object factors, moreover, are common to ourselves and others. And our truths have to be mated with those of our fellow men. The real safeguard against caprice of statement and indetermination of belief is that there is a grain in things against which we can't practically go. But as the grain creates itself from situation to situation, so the truth creates itself peri passu. And there is no eternally standing system of extra subjective verity to which our judgments, ideally and in advance of the facts, are obliged to conform. There are two great gaps in the system, which none of the Chicago writers have done anything to fill. And until they are filled, the system, as a system, will appear defective. There is no cosmology, no positive account of the order of physical fact as contrasted with mental fact, and no account of the fact, which I assume the writers to believe in, that different subjects share a common object world. These lucane can hardly be, page 5, inadvertent. We shall, doubtless, soon see them filled in some way by one or another member of the school. I might go into much greater technical detail, and I might in particular make many a striking quotation. But I prefer to be exceedingly summary, and merely to call the reader's attention to the importance of this output of Chicago University, taking it on gross, which strikes me most in it is the great sense of concrete reality which it is filled. It seems a promising via medium between the empiricist and the transcendentalist tendencies of our time. Like empiricism, it is individualistic and phenomenalistic. It places truth in rebus and not ante rem. It resembles transcendentalism, on the other hand, in making value and fact inseparable, and in standing for continuities and purposes in things. It employs the generic method to which both schools are now accustomed. It coincides remarkably with the simultaneous movement in favor of pragmatism or humanism, set up quite independently at Oxford by Mr. Schiller and Sturt. It probably has a great future and is certainly something of which Americans may be proud. Professor Dewey ought to gather into another volume his scattered essays and addresses on psychological and ethical topics. For now that his philosophy is systematically formulated, these throw a needed light. End of the Chicago School
Wherein should the education of a woman differ from that of a man? This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Robert Ross. Wherein should the education of a woman differ from that of a man? By Kate Gordon. Mount Holyoke College, first published in School Review, 13, 789-794. Members of the New England Association, it is my privilege to speak to you upon the subject, Wherein Should the Education of a Woman Differ from That of a Man? What changes in school and college does this involve? The question of woman's education is seductively close to the question of woman's sphere. I hold it to be almost a transgression even to mention woman's sphere. The word recalls so many painful and impertinent deliverances, so much of futile discussion about it, and yet the willingness to dogmatize about women in general is so common an infirmity that I am emboldened to err. Let us ask, then, what is a woman's business, and what is the best way to train her for it? Certain theories recently advocated remind one of the London cab driver whom a gentleman engaged to take him to the station. The driver set off at a furious rate in the opposite direction, and when his passenger called out, Cabby, cabby, you're going in the wrong direction, he answered, Ah, but see what a beautiful pace I'm giving you. In my opinion, President Stanley Hall, in his work on adolescence, has been giving us a beautiful pace. Only he has been traveling backward. Permit me to quote from the chapter on Adolescent Girls and Their Education. What seems to me a fair representation of the medieval standpoint, done, perhaps, in oriental color. He says, Volume 2, Chapter 17, page 562. She, woman, works by intuition and feeling. If she abandons her natural naivete and takes up the burden of guiding and accounting for her life by consciousness, she is likely to lose more than she gains, according to the old saw that she who deliberates is lost. Biological psychology already dreams of a new philosophy of sex which places the wife and mother at the heart of a new world and makes her the object of a new religion and almost of a new worship that will give her reverent exemption from sex competition and reconsecrate her to the higher responsibilities of the human race into the past and future of which the roots of her being penetrate, where the blind worship of mere mental illumination has no place, and where her real superiority to man will have free course and be glorified. Page 790. We find further on page 646 that the author profoundly sympathizes with woman's claims that he has worship and adoration of her shrine, and that he is more and more passionately in love with woman as he conceives she came from the hand of God. This is certainly all very handsome indeed, but to adore this naive being passionately to worship an unconscious divinity, the roots of whose being are so penetrating, it is not a very apothesis of the vegetable. This attitude toward women did very well in the Middle Ages, but, to tell the truth, 
the modern woman is made a little bit ill by the incense. She longs for fresh air and common sense, and is not willing to be a dolt for the sake of being called a deity. In a word, she is ready to resign the charm of her naivete and to brave the perils of consciousness and reflection. President Hall's central thesis is that a woman ought to be trained to regard matrimony as her one legitimate province. Concerning the details of curriculum and method, he offers the suggestion that botany should be taught with an emphasis on its poetic aspect, zoology with plenty of pets. Astronomy and geology are valuable because they can be taught out of doors. Specialization hurts a woman's soul more than it does a man's. The serious valuations of this writer's conclusions need not detain us long. For a work so bizarre both in style and taste is not to be classed as literature. Neither can an inquiry so uncritical in method find a place in science. I have quoted at some length because the above discussion raises the two questions upon which I wish to speak. First, should a woman's school and college training be in any sense a matrimonial education? This I should call the social side of the question. Second, when a woman is pursuing the same subject that a man is, must she be taught by a different method? This is the psychological question. The first point must not be confused with the query whether a woman needs special training for matrimony. Nobody denies that a woman, if she marries, should be acquainted in some degree with domestic economy and the care of children. The question is, are the school and college years the time for such instruction? Or are these institutions the place for it? In the first place, a girl's domestic training should not begin until she knows not only that she will marry, but whom she will marry. An adequate matrimonial education should be regulated to wit, the taste, and the income of the man whose wife she is going to be. So one will pretend that all men like the same thing in a woman nor that the administration of a very humble and a very pretentious household requires the same technique. The proper time for such training, then, is subsequent to her engagement in marriage to some individual. Page 791. In the second place, domestic economy is a strictly technical professional pursuit and to give it any considerable position in school and college curricula would be to alter the very foundation idea of those institutions. As a special technique, it has no more right there than military tactics or agriculture. Certainly the knowledge of cooking, housekeeping, retail buying, and nursing must be recognized as technical, and not in any sense liberal, knowledge. The college, as I understand it, aims to give four years of non-professional training, years of respite from strictly utilitarian interests, a period of leisure for the cultivation in a variety of directions of taste, of character, and of judgment. The essential idea of the college is the carrying on of liberal or non-specialized inquiry. Our question would then reshape itself to this. Ought a woman to receive a liberal education, or ought she to spend the usual college years in a school for matrimony? My conviction is all for the collegiate education. Matrimony is only one of a large number of possible occupations for women. In the ministry, in law, in medicine, in teaching, in journalism, in scientific research, in civil engineering, in insurance, in business of many kinds, women have worked successfully and contentedly. 
although it will always be true that the greater number of women will elect the domestic career, yet I cannot but think that the superlative fascination of that estate has been by recent writers a trifle overworked. Sentiment aside for a moment, it is not matrimony the most precarious business in the world. The matrial returns, not to mention the vagaries of affection, are notoriously disproportionate to a woman's efficiency. If it be the business of a domestic woman to rear a large family of children, she must acknowledge that her reward in worldly goods is inversely proportional to her success, for with every additional child the same income must be made to reach farther. Of course, no self-respecting woman marries merely for money, but are we not coming to see that it is not respectable to enter any calling merely for money? Again, are we not likely to fall into the fallacy of supposing that there is something intrinsically desirable in a mere quantity of human beings? As Jane Austen says, A family of ten children will always be called a fine family, where there are head and arms and legs enough for the number. We must remember that reproduction is too often a vain repetition. Why repeat? until we find something worthwhile. Indeed, I would almost say that a woman had no business to be a mother until she can demonstrate her ability to be something else. However, be the allurements of different callings what they may, of a woman's inalienable right to choose for herself, I cannot understand that, page 792, there should be any question. And if a woman has abilities to follow various professions and the right to choose which she will, is it just or is it honorable to so manage her education that she never would follow, never would choose, but the one? If her teachers decide for her what she ought to be, if they foreordain her to some one career and then instruct her accordingly, she never has any real freedom or any real choice. In every trial, both sides are supposed to get a hearing before judgment is pronounced. Our sense of fair play demands that. It seems to me only an affair of common honesty to educate a girl so that she really comprehends more than one possibility in her life. A biased education is half truth and half lie. A woman's education, like a man's education, should fit her to make a free and intelligent choice of a life occupation. A woman's education should place within her reach the possibility of economic independence, that is to say, the possibility of competing with men. For the woman who does not marry, economic independence is, of course, almost indispensable. But for the woman who does marry, this possibility is hardly less desirable. I am not saying that a married woman ought actually to be earning an independent living, but I do say that she ought to be so educated that such a thing is within her power. Historically, women have as a sex occupied a position inferior in dignity to that of men. Man's work in the world has been considered as more important than woman's work. If it really is more important, of course nobody can blame women for aspiring to do the higher kind of service. If it is not more important, there is but one way for women to prove it and that is to meet men upon their own ground. We measure one man against another by setting the two at the same kind of work. We use the objective result as a measure of value. What women must be able to do is to produce the same definite impersonal objective result that a man does. And if the event shows that women can compete creditably with men, 
This fact enhances the value of whatever career the woman chooses. The woman who could follow another calling, if she would, dignifies by so much the calling which she does follow. She goes into it with the enthusiasm of a personal conviction, not because there was no alternative. We should have even more respect for matrimony as a vocation if we knew that it never was the only possible resource for any woman. Moreover, there are many married women for whom it would be a valuable experience to know the meaning of a hard day's work. A woman's estimate of her husband must be considerably altered when she comes to appreciate the strain and effort of the work by which he supports her. In answer, then, to our question in its social aspect, I should say that a woman's prospect for, page 793, social equality with men is conditioned by her ability to do the same work, and this ability is largely dependent upon her having the same school and college training which a man has. Let us turn now to the psychological aspect of our question. Supposing that we wish to get the same grasp of a subject into a girl's head which we wish to get into a boy's, are her mental processes so diverse that we must adopt a radically different method of instruction and discipline? The scientific investigation of the mental differences of the sexes is thus far limited in its scope and tentative in its conclusions. Many inquiries which have been made are almost entirely worthless on account of the lack of rigor in method. A contribution of the highest merit and importance has been made in this field by Dr. Helen Thompson in her book, The Mental Traits of Sex. Her conclusions are drawn from a systematic experimental study. She says, the psychological differences of sex seem to be largely due not to difference of average capacity, nor to difference in type of mental activity, but to differences in the social influences brought to bear on the developing individual from early infancy to adult years. The question of the future development of the intellectual life of women is one of social necessities and ideals, rather than of the inborn psychological characteristics of sex. Some mental distinctions of sex there probably are, but they certainly are pretty difficult to determine. The environmental conditions of men and women are so disparate that it is hard to be sure the differences, apparently sexual, are not to be explained upon another basis. For practical purposes of education, the mental likenesses seem overwhelming, and to attempt upon any such basis as we have to reconstruct the plan of woman's education would be wholly fantastic. I have said that education has three ends in view, the training of judgment, character, and taste. Let us turn them in order. In forming a judgment, a woman must observe exactly the same logical procedure as a man. She has no royal road to learning. The feminine syllogism has just as many terms and premises as the masculine, and no more. There is an old superstition that women's minds work by feeling and men's by reason. Surely it is time to give that up. Does a woman solve the binomial theorem by feeling, or a quadratic equation by intuition? Does a man never move without consulting the principle of sufficient reason? Does he appreciate a sonnet by logical deduction, or respond to a lyric in reasoned conclusions? Again, in cultivating right character, how are we to be distinguished? Are girls not to have energy and initiative? Are boys not to know gentleness and obedience? Is stealing not stealing? Is a lie not a lie? Are meanness, page 794, 
and cowardice, any the less mean and cowardly because of a sex distinction in the culprit? Are not honesty, veracity, courage, courtesy as admirable in the one as in the other? Or finally, informing taste cannot both sexes learn by the same acquaintance with the best in art? Must women be lured on by flower pieces and men by battle scenes to appreciate good painting? Shall we have a Mrs. Browning for men and Jane Austen translated into the masculine? Must we edit a woman's Bible or the lady's own Shakespeare? Let me then answer the original question in this way. The education of a woman should not differ from that of a man until after she becomes engaged to be married. This difference would not involve any changes in school and college. To my mind, the simplest, most natural, and most certain way of securing to men and women an identity of opportunity is the coeducational plan. I believe that coeducation helps to correct the faults of both sexes without at all endangering the development of a desirable individuality. To the fear that women may be coarsened by the association, or men made less manly, I am inclined to reply that if men and women are fit to marry one another, they are fit to go to school together. Let me say in conclusion that it would seem to me both frivolous and morally wrong for a school or college to spend time, money, and intelligence in devising different systems of training for the two sexes. While so many, and those so real, problems in education are waiting for solution. End of Wherein Should the Education of a Woman differ from that of a man. The Significance of Suicide This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Avai in October 2010. The Significance of Suicide by James Gibson Hume, University of Toronto. First published in Philosophical Review, number 19, pages 179 to 180. Abstract of paper presented at the ninth annual meeting of the American Philosophical Association, Yale University, 1909. European investigators have endeavored to discover the influence of climate, season, weather, age, sex, marriage, profession, religion, upon suicide. These statistical tables are valuable. We require, however, 1. A separate table for those undoubtedly insane, putting in a class by themselves those sane enough to lie influenced by rational motives. 2. Under religion, those who really believe in some creed should be distinguished from those nominally attached to it. 3. There should be a table of statistics of the divorced. 4. There should be an earnest attempt made to get beneath the statistics to the hidden influences, the moral causes. The commission and report by the Prussian government on suicides among school children indicates the need of similar inquiries into the causes and conditions leading to adult suicides. This might lead to insights that would guide preventive measures. These investigations should take into account the following. Physiological. The influence of epileptic, neurotic, dissipated parents. Influence of nerve-exhausting vices, of mental overwork, of monotonous employment, of sedentary occupations. Psychical. The influence of monotony, of excitement, of excessive pursuit of wealth or pleasure, of disappointments, worries, of gambling. Literature. 
the influence of morbid sentimentalism in poetry and prose representing death as extinction ignoring or denying the moral element in life conduct and destiny the influence of dramatic representations of suicide sometimes as in the case of romeo and juliet as the tragic ending of passionate love the influence of realistic accounts of suicide in the newspapers sometimes it is claimed initiating imitative epidemics social the influence of solitariness loneliness brooding the presence or absence of social or family ties the sex instinct and the effect of the perversion or thwarting of this then it might be in order to try to find out to what extent and in what ways educational social moral or religious influences cooperate with the hygienic in keeping men and women in physical and mental health and normal sane and suitable activity even from the present data we may get some fairly obvious suggestions many suicides are undoubtedly insane others are in the incipient stages obsessed with various phobias and probably all are in some degree morbid might not much be accomplished if we could succeed in convincing people of the hopefulness of cure and the need of expert advice and assistance in checking the earlier stages of threatened insanity at present there is widespread despair suicide accompanies civilization and education as an unerring index of maladjustment in society and defects in education true education acts as a deterrent in teaching self-control and in giving objective interests literary artistic scientific philosophical philanthropic moral religious the perverting influence of the realistic newspaper accounts of suicide should be checked by legislation end of the significance of suicide The Contribution of Psychology to Education This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Carl Manchester, 2010 The Contribution of Psychology to Education Edward L. Thorndike, 1910 Teachers College, Columbia University First published in the Journal of Educational Psychology, 1, 5-12. Psychology is the science of the intellects, characters and behaviour of animals, including man. Human education is concerned with certain changes in the intellects, characters and behaviour of men, its problems being roughly included under these four topics. Aims, materials, means and methods. Psychology contributes to a better understanding of the aims of education by defining them, making them clearer, by limiting them, showing us what can be done and what cannot, and by suggesting new features that should be made parts of them. Psychology makes ideas of educational aims clearer. When one says that the aim of education is culture, or discipline, or efficiency, or happiness, or utility, or knowledge, or skill, or the perfection of all one's powers, or development, one's statements, and probably one's thoughts, need definition. Different people, even amongst the clearest-headed of them, do not agree concerning just what culture is, or just what is useful. Psychology helps here by requiring us to put our notions of the aims of education into terms of the exact changes that education is to make, and by describing for us the changes which do actually occur in human beings. Psychology helps to measure the probability that an aim is attainable. For example, certain writers about education state or imply that the knowledge and skill and habits of behaviour which are taught to the children of today are of service not only to this generation and to later generations through the work this generation does, but also to later generations forever, through the inheritance of increased capacity for knowledge and skill and morals. But if the mental and moral changes made in one generation are not transmitted by heredity to the next generation, the improvement of the race by direct transfer of acquisition is a foolish, 
because futile, aim. Psychology enlarges and refines the aim of education. Certain features of human nature may be, and have been thought to be, unimportant or even quite valueless because of ignorance of psychology. Thus, for hundreds of years in the history of certain races, even the most gifted thinkers of the race have considered it beneath the dignity of education to make physical health an important aim. Bodily welfare was even thought of as a barrier to spiritual growth, an undesirable interferer with its proper master. Education aimed to teach its proper place, to treat it as a stupid and brutish slave. It is partly because psychology has shown the world that the mind is the servant and co-worker as well as the master of the body, that the welfare of our minds and morals is intimately bound up with the welfare of our bodies, particularly of our central nervous systems, that today we can all see the eminence of bodily health as an aim of education. To an understanding of the material of education, psychology is the chief contributor. Psychology shares with anatomy, physiology, sociology, anthropology, history and the other sciences that concern changes in man's bodily or mental nature, the work of providing thinkers and workers in the field of education with knowledge of the material with which they work. Just as the science and art of agriculture depends upon chemistry and botany, so the art of education depends upon physiology and psychology. A complete science of psychology would tell every fact about everyone's intellect and character and behaviour, would tell the cause of every change in human nature, would tell the result which every educational force, every act of every person that changed any other or the agent himself, would have. It would aid us to use human beings for the world's welfare, with the same surety of the result that we now have when we use falling bodies or chemical elements. In proportion as we get such a science, we shall become masters of our own souls, as we are now masters of heat and light. Progress towards such a science is being made. Psychology contributes to understanding of the means of education, first, because the intellects and characters of anyone's parents, teachers and friends are very important means of educating him, and second, because the influence of any other means, such as books, maps or apparatus, cannot be usefully studied apart from the human nature which they are to act upon. Psychology contributes to knowledge of methods of teaching in three ways. First, methods may be deduced outright from the laws of human nature. For instance, we may infer from psychology that the difficulty pupils have in learning to divide by a fraction is due, in large measure, to the habit established by all the thousands of previous divisions which they have done or seen, the habit, that is, of division decrease, or number divided results smaller than the number. We may then devise or select such a method as will reduce this interference from the old habits to a minimum, without weakening the old habits in their proper functioning. Second, methods may be chosen from actual working experience, regardless of psychology, as a starting point. Thus it is believed that in the elementary school a class of 15 pupils for one teacher gives better results than either a class of 3 or a class of 30. Thus also it is believed that family life is better than institutional life in its effects upon character and enterprise. Thus also it is believed that in learning a foreign language the reading of simple discussions of simple topics is better than the translation of difficult literary masterpieces that treat subtle and complex topics. Even in such cases, psychology may help by explaining why one method does succeed better, and so leading the way to new insights regarding other questions not yet settled by experience. Third, in all cases psychology by its methods of measuring knowledge and skill may suggest means to test and verify or refute the claims of any method. For instance, there has been a failure on the part of teachers to decide from their classroom experience whether it is better to teach the spelling of a pair of homonyms together or apart in time. But all that is required to decide the question for any given pair is for enough teachers to use both methods with enough different classes keeping everything else except the method constant 
and to measure the errors in spelling the words thereafter in the two cases. Psychology, which teaches us how to measure changes in human nature, teaches us how to decide just what the results of any method of teaching are. So far, I have outlined the contribution of psychology to education from the point of view of the latter's problems. I shall now outline very briefly the work being done by psychologists which is of special significance to the theory and practice of education and which may be expected to result in the largest and most frequent contributions. It will, of course, be understood that directly or indirectly, soon or late, every advance in the sciences of human nature will contribute to our success in controlling human nature and changing it to the advantage of the common wheel. If certain lines of work by psychologists are selected for mention here, it is only because they are the more obvious, more direct and, so far as can now be seen, greater aids to correct thinking about education. The first line of work concerns the discovery and improvement of means of measurement of intellectual functions. The study of means of measuring moral functions, such as prudence, readiness to sacrifice an immediate for a later good, sympathy and the like, has only barely begun. Beginning with easy cases, such as the discrimination of sensory differences, psychology has progressed to measuring memory and accuracy of movement, fatigue, improvement with practice, power of observing small details, the quantity, rapidity and usefulness of associations, and even to measuring so complex a function as general intelligence, and so subtle a one as suggestibility. The task of students of physical science in discovering the thermometer, galvanometer and spectroscope and in defining the volt, calorie, erg and ampere is being attempted by psychologists in the sphere of human nature and behaviour. How important such work is to education should be obvious. At least three-fourths of the problems of educational practice are problems whose solution depends upon the amount of some change in boys and girls. Of two methods, which gives the greater skill? Is the gain in general ability from a disciplinary study so great as to outweigh the loss in specially useful habits? Just how much more does a boy learn when $30 a year is spent on his teaching than when only $20 is spent? Units in which to measure the changes wrought by education are essential to an adequate science of education and though the student of education may establish these units by their own investigations, they can use, and will need, all the experience of psychologists in the search for similar units. The second line of work concerns race, sex, age, and individual differences in all the many elements of intellect and character and behaviour. How do the Ingorots, Ainus, Japanese, and Eskimo differ in their efficiency in learning to operate certain mechanical contrivances? Is the male sex more variable than the female in mental functions? What happens to keenness of sensory discrimination with age? How do individuals of the same race, sex and age differ in efficiency in perceiving small visual details or in accuracy in equaling a given length or in the rapidity of movement? These are samples of many questions which psychologists have tried to answer by appropriate measurements. Such knowledge of the differences which exist amongst men, for whatever reason, is of service to the thinker about the particular differences which education aims to produce between a man and his former self. These studies of individual differences or variability are being supplemented by studies of correlations, how far does superior vividness and fidelity in imagery from one sense go with inferiority in other sorts of imagery? To what extent is motor ability a symptom of intellectual ability? Does the quick learner soon forget? What are the mental types that result from the individual variations in mental functions and their intercorrelations? Psychology has already determined with more or less surety the answers to a number of such questions, instructive in their bearing upon both scientific insight into human nature and practical arrangements for controlling it. 
the extent to which the intellectual and moral differences found in human beings are consequences of their original nature and determined by the ancestry from which they spring is a matter of fundamental importance for education so also is the manner in which ancestral influence operates whether such qualities as leadership the artistic temperament originality persistence mathematical ability or motor skills are represented in the germs each by one or a few unit characters so that they mendelize in inheritance or whether they are represented each by the cooperation of so many unit characters that the laws of their inheritance are those of blending is a question whose answer will decide in great measure the means to be employed for racial improvement obviously both the amount and the mode of operation of ancestral influence upon intellect and character are questions which psychology should and does investigate the results and methods of action of the many forces which operate in childhood and throughout life to change a man's original nature are subjects for study equally appropriate to the work of a psychologist a sociologist or a student of education but the last two will naturally avail themselves of all that the first achieves although as yet the studies of such problems are crude speculative and often misguided we may hope that the influence of climate food city life the specialization of industry the various forms of the family and of the state the different studies of the schools and the like will come to be studied by as careful psychologists and with as much care as is now the case with colour vision or the perception of distance the foundation upon which education builds is the equipment of instincts and capacity given by nature apart from training just as knowledge of the peculiar inheritance characteristic of any individual is necessary to efficient treatment of him so knowledge of the unlearned tendencies of man as a species is necessary to efficient planning for education in general partly in conscious response to this demand and partly as a result of growing interest in comparative and genetic psychology there have been in the last two decades many studies by psychologists of both the general laws of instinct and their particular natures dates of appearance and disappearance and conditions of modifiability the instincts of attitude of interest and aversion are of course to be included here as well as the tendencies to more obviously effective responses it is unfortunately true that the unlearned tendencies to respond of ants and chickens have been studied with more care than those of men and also that the extreme complexity and intimate mixture with habits in the case of human instincts prevents studies of them even when made with great care from giving entirely unambiguous and elegant results but the educational theorist or practitioner who should conclude that his casual observations of children in homes and schools need no reinforcement from the researches of psychologists would be making the same sort of though not so great an error as the pathologist or physician who should neglect the scientific studies of bacteria and protozoa also the psychologist who condemns these studies in toto because they lack the precision and surety of his own studies of sensations and perceptual judgments is equally narrow though from a better motive the modifications of instincts and capacities into habits and powers and the development of the latter are the subjects of researches in dynamic psychology which are replacing the vague verbal and trite maxims of what used to be called applied psychology by definite insights into reality far in advance of those which common sense sagacity alone can make we are finding out when and why practice makes perfect and when and why it does not wherein the reinforcement of a connection between situation and response by resulting satisfaction is better than the inhibition of alternative connections by discomfort and wherein it is not what the law of diminishing returns from equal amounts of practice is what it implies and how it is itself limited how far the feelings of achievement of failure and of fatigue are symptomatic of progress retardation and unfitness for work such a list of topics could be much extended even now 
and is being increased rapidly as more psychologists and more gifted psychologists come to share in the study of the learning process. Only twenty years ago, a student could do little more than add to his own common-sense deductions from the common facts of life the ordered series of similar deductions by the sagacious Bain. Bain utilised all the psychology of his day, as well as the common fund of schoolroom experience. But today his book is hopelessly outgrown. Although it was the source of the minor books on the topic during the 80s and 90s, no one would now think of presenting the facts of the science of education by a revised edition of Bain. Other lines of psychological work deserve more than mention. Incidental contributions from studies of sensory and perceptual processes, imagery and memory, attention and distraction, facilitation, inhibition and fatigue, imitation and suggestion, the rate and accuracy of movement, and other topics, even from studies made with little or no concern about the practical control of human nature, sum up to a body of facts which do extend and economise that control. The special psychology of babies, children and adolescents is obviously important to education. False infant psychology, or false child psychology, is harmful, not because it is infant psychology, but because it is false. I give only mention to these, so as to save space, in which to call attention to another relation between psychology and education which is not sufficiently known. The science of education can and will itself contribute abundantly to psychology. Not only do the laws derived by psychology from simple, specially arranged experiments help us to interpret and control mental action under the conditions of schoolroom life, schoolroom life itself is a vast laboratory in which are made thousands of experiments of the utmost interest to pure psychology. Not only does psychology help us to understand the mistakes made by children in arithmetic, these mistakes afford most desirable material for studies of the action of the laws of association, analysis and selective thinking. Experts in education studying the responses to school situations for the sake of practical control will advance knowledge not only of the mind as a learner under school conditions, but also of the mind for every point of view. Indeed, I venture to predict that this journal will before many years contain a notable proportion of articles reporting answers to psychological questions got from the facts of educational experience, in addition to its list of papers reporting answers to educational questions got from the experiments of the laboratory. All that is here written may seem very obvious and needless, and meet the tragic fate of being agreed with by everyone who reads it. I hope that it is obvious and needless, and that the relation between psychology and education is not, in the mind of any competent thinker, in any way an exception to the general case that action in the world should be guided by the truth about the world, and that any truth about it will directly or indirectly, soon or late, benefit action. End of the Contribution of Psychology to Education The Case Against Introspection This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Case Against Introspection by Knight Dunlap It is rather generally agreed among English psychologists that there is something, state, process, act, relation, or whatever, which may properly be called introspection. There is also rather general agreement in the definition of the term, whatever may be said of divergences in regard to its practical application. The greatest disagreements have been over the temporal nature, the difficulty, and the reliability of introspection. It is now high time that we should question, more seriously than has been done heretofore, the existence of introspection in the traditional sense. It is for this purpose 
necessary to present some actual usages of the terms introspection and consciousness in English psychology. Although it is not at all necessary to go over the whole field of psychological writings and call every instance in which use has been made of these terms, the discussion of the uses of Selbstbeobachtung, Bewusstheit, and other German psychological terms is an entirely different piece of work, which may or may not be profitable. It certainly is not profitable in English, and I have no intention of engaging therein. Introspection is usually defined in terms which are equivalent to the expression consciousness scrutinizing itself. Such definitions are significant only when consciousness and scrutiny and itself or whatever terms are substituted for them, are more explicitly defined. Typical statements from psychological texts are given below. James says, quote, It means, of course, the looking into our own minds and reporting what we there discover. Everyone agrees that we there discover states of consciousness. End quote. Principles, Volume 1, page 185. Angel Quote, it consists simply in the direct examination of one's own mental process. Close quote. Psychology, 4th edition, page 5. Judd, quote, in observing this conscious state, he introspects. End quote. Stout, quote, to introspect is to attend to the workings of one's own mind. End quote. Manual, introduction, Chapter 2, page 2. Stratton, quote, This direct acquaintance with the state of our minds which all of us to some extent possess. End quote. Experimental Psychology, page 2. Yerkes, in discussing introspection, quote, It is by observing my own consciousness that I directly study the objects of consciousness. End quote. Introduction, 4i. Mayer, the exponent of Thomism, quote, states of consciousness can only be observed by introspection, that is, by the turning of the mind in on itself, end quote. Psychology, 4th edition, page 11. The technical use of the word introspection in this way is of recent introduction, see Oxford Dictionary, but the signification is very old. We need not pursue it back farther than Reed, Hamilton, Bain, and James Mill to get a definite understanding of the extent to which self-consciousness is involved in British theories. The discussion here runs into the consideration of the term consciousness, to which we must give a little space. Bain, footnote, The Feelings and the Will, 4th edition, 538, et sec, end footnote, distinguishes and lists thirteen different senses in which the term was used. The catalogue is now too short, for James' usage of the term does not belong anywhere in it. With the greater number of the uses we have no great concern. We should point out, however, that Reed made of consciousness a separate faculty, practically the introspective observation of the modern psychologists. First Essay, Chapter 1 Hamilton, while having some agreement with Reed in the use of the term, contended that consciousness is involved in every mental act. Quote, Can I know without knowing that I know? Can I desire without knowing that I desire? Can I feel without knowing that I feel? This is impossible. Now this, common condition of self-knowledge, is precisely what is denominated consciousness. End quote. Metaphysics, Lecture 9, page 110, in American edition of 1880. The whole of this lecture is especially important. What we now call introspection is described by Hamilton as follows, quote, In an act of knowledge, my attention may be principally attracted either to the object known or to myself as the subject knowing, and in the latter case, although no new element be added to the act, the condition involved in it, I know that I know, becomes the primary and prominent matter of consideration. End quote. Lecture 11, page 135. 
in strong contrast with the use of the term consciousness by reed and hamilton we find james mill declaring quote, to say i feel a sensation is merely to say that i feel a feeling which is an impropriety of speech and to say that i am conscious of a feeling is merely to say that i feel it in the very word feeling all that is implied in the word consciousness is involved End quote. analysis chapter five to which bain felt constrained to add a footnote correcting what he considered a serious error the modern views of introspective consciousness are best represented by the statements of stout and james because these two have made the attempt to work out a system in which introspection is not only admitted but is really provided for i shall confine my discussion therefore to these two authors other introspectionists have simply claimed that introspection occurs without trying to show the nature or details of the process footnote this of course does not apply to those who explicitly hold to the scholastic doctrine of introspection i hope to show in a later paper that in the scholastic doctrine of the intellect there is a good foundation for the doctrine of introspection End footnote. in stout's writings there is less confusion between consciousness in the cognitive aspect at least and the objects of consciousness than in the writings of other psychologists Quote, physical states as such become objects only when we attend to them in an introspective way otherwise they are not themselves objects but only constituents of the process by which objects are recognized End quote. manual page 124 Quote, the object itself can never be identified with the present modification of the individual's consciousness by which it is cognized. This holds true even when we are thinking about modifications of our own consciousness. The conscious experience in which we think of another conscious experience is always at least partially distinct from the conscious experience of which we think. End quote. If we confine our discussion for the present, to the realm of sensational consciousness we find that the objects which the sensation cognizes are sensible qualities or sensory elements the sensible quality red and the sensation of red one would think differ in that redness is in the quality or is the quality the sensation should have no redness for it is an element in the process of perceiving red this is apparently what stout means so far as the sensation is primarily concerned but the sensation has the property of becoming secondarily an object for another physical state and then of course it has objective qualifications obviously the only quality which we can consistently ascribe to the sensation of red in its secondary capacity is the sensible quality it cognizes in its primary capacity Quote, if we compare the color red as a quality of a material object with the color red as a quality of the corresponding sensation we find the redness as immediately perceived is an attribute common to both the difference lies in the different relations into which it enters in the two cases End quote. the sensation as an object has intensity as well as quality and when referred to the physical world is correlated with wavelength and not with any sensible quality here we have the whole scheme of introspective consciousness a sensation as such is not an object but the awareness of an object hence it is not observable but an observation this stout sees clearly and grants freely and so far we can go with him but demanding that the sensation shall be nevertheless observed for what reason we shall see later stout assumes that the sensation which primarily is consciousness or awareness is or may be secondarily what it is not primarily namely an object for another awareness which may be either subsequent to the first awareness or simultaneous with it we wonder indeed what the mind is which one attends to manual introduction page two and we might indeed wonder what the one who attends is 
these apparent simple assumptions become exceedingly complicated and shaky when introspection is included surely the mind is not the mere sum of the processes for we are told that quote, the most important drawback is that the mind in watching its own workings must necessarily have its attention divided between two objects end quote implying that it is only one process after all which cognizes both objects for that there should be any difficulty in one process cognizing one object and another process cognizing another object whether the second object is or is not the first process does not seem reasonable without question stout is bringing in here illicitly the concept of a single observer and his introspection does not provide for the observation of this observer, for the process observed and the observer are distinct. James's doctrine of introspection, as stated in the Principles, is less inconsistent than Stout's. That James seriously doubted the actual existence of the machinery he built up in theory does not in any way lessen the need for its examination since the influence of james's speculations concerning consciousness is unfortunately very strongly felt in psychology quote, there are realities and there are states of mind and the latter know the former and it is just as wonderful for a state of mind to be a sensation and know a simple pain as it is to be a thought and know a system of related things End quote. volume two pages five through six Quote, the relation of knowing is the most mysterious thing in the world. Knowledge becomes for him, the psychologist, an ultimate relation that must be admitted, whether it be explained or not. End quote. Volume 1, page 216. Here is an unmistakable deviation from Stout. For Stout, the term mental process applies to the knowledge. For James, it is primarily the knower and knowledge is assumed as an additional process, with which James concerns himself little, although involving it freely in his system. Quote, the passing thought then seems to be the thinker. End quote. Volume 1, page 342. This thinker knows external objects, and it also knows past thought. Quote, it may feel its own immediate existence, we have all along admitted the possibility of this, hard as it is by direct introspection to ascertain the fact, but nothing can be known about it until it is dead and gone. End quote. Volume 1, page 341. Introspection is then for James, first, the knowing of the knower, not of the knowing, and secondly, is always retrospection. The division of attention, in regard to which Stout trips, comes in here, however, more legitimately. Quote, the thought, which whilst it knows another thought, and the object of that other, appropriates the other, and the object which the other appropriated, End quote. Volume 1, page 340, is manifestly doing double duty, is simultaneously observing two different things at once. James and Stout agree in postulating an introspection which makes objective that which is primarily non-objective, but differ in that while James is postulating the objectification of the subject and not dealing at all with the knowing, although specifically postulating it in addition to the subject, Stout is postulating the objectification of the knowing and deals with the subject only illicitly. The objectification of the subject is for James not an occasional matter, but an essential aspect of the functioning of the stream of consciousness. Quote, the knowledge of some other part of the stream, past or future, near or remote, is always mixed in with our knowledge of the present thing. End quote. Volume 1, page 606. Although, quote, a mind which has become conscious of its own cognitive function plays the psychologist upon itself. It not only knows the things which appear before it, it knows that it knows them. End quote. Volume 1, pages 272 to 273. Footnote. I must confess that in the above quotations, 
I find more mixed in with the knowledge than James explains, especially in connection with the knowledge of the future, but I think the general meaning is clear. End footnote. This psychologizing is apparently only a special development of the universal function of mind by which it preserves its unity through the present subject of knowing or appropriating to itself the past subjects. The doctrine of the essentially retrospective nature of introspection is very useful to James in defending the transitive states of consciousness which he admits cannot be discovered by introspection. Quote, for a state of mind to survive in memory, it must have endured for a certain length of time. In other words, it must be what we have called a substantive state. Prepositional and conjunctional states of mind are not remembered as independent facts. We cannot recall just how we felt when we said, how, or notwithstanding. Our consciousness of these transitive states is shut up to their own moment. Hence one difficulty in introspective psychologizing. Any state of mind which is shut up to its own moment, and fails to become an object for succeeding states of mind, is as if it belonged to another stream of thought. End quote. Volume 1, pages 643 to 644. The essential points in James's scheme of consciousness are subject, object, and a knowing of the object by the subject. The difference between James's scheme and other schemes involving the same terms is that James considers subject and object to be the same thing, but at different times. In order to satisfy this requirement, James supposes a realm of existence which he at first called states of consciousness or thoughts, and later pure experience the latter term including both the thoughts and the knowing. This scheme, with all its magnificent artificiality, James held on to until the end, simply dropping the term consciousness, footnote, James, Does Consciousness Exist, Journal of Philosophy, etc., Volume 1, page 478, also, A World of Pure Experience, Journal of Philosophy, etc., Volume 1, pages 538 to 541, end footnote, and the dualism between the thought and an external reality. Introspection can hardly be bolstered up by James's mechanical psychology. To assume that the thought of a cabbage knows a feeling of regret, and that the thought of a cabbage may in another moment be known in turn by the thought of a red necktie, is ingenious but ineffectual, as the knower in the act of knowing is not known, but is known only after it has finished its cognizing. The assertion that what is now known was once a knower remains a mere assertion to the end. All that James's system really amounts to is the acknowledgment that a succession of things are known, and that they are known by something. This is all any one can claim except for the fact that the things are known together, and that the knower for the different items is one and the same. This further implication James does not escape, in spite of the assumption of a series of different thoughts assuming the knowing function, for after all, the knowing function is the same in each case. The thoughts all take the same point of view in knowing other thoughts or things, and it is the point of view which constitutes the real I or subject. The real claim to admission which introspection holds in James's original scheme is therefore not based on the turning of a subject into an object, but on the existence of two sorts of objects. There are, according to James's principles, thoughts which are known, and the things corresponding to the thoughts which are also known. A cabbage is known, and there is also in the stream of consciousness a thought of a cabbage, which is known, no matter by what. If this sort of representationalism is accepted, there is no objection to calling the knowing of the thought introspection, meaning therefore by the term exactly what Reed meant by consciousness. But the day for such physical mechanics has gone by. The ghostly world of representational ideas or states of consciousness 
dim shadows through which we may look at the real objects casting them, or on which alone we may fasten our gaze, attracts no longer faith nor interest. It is significant in this connection that James, in giving up the term consciousness, abandoned his whole representational scheme, without, however, giving up the essential mechanics of his doctrine of knowledge. Hence for his last psychology there is virtually no introspection possible. There are probably no psychologists at the present time who hold to introspection explicitly on the representational grounds of Reed and the older view of James. If there are any such, I certainly do not wish to argue the point with them. For one who believes in representationalism, a belief in representationalistic introspection is quite the consistent thing. I am inclined to suppose that the greater number of those modern writers who explicitly presuppose introspection have in mind, however dimly, the sort of introspection which Stout defines. Footnote. See, for example, in addition to the authors above quoted, Calkins, Psychology, 1910, page 68, Myers, Experimental Psychology, 1909, pages 3 to 5, Pillsbury, Essentials of Psychology, 1911, pages 6 to 9, Attention, 1908, pages 212 to 217, Royce, Outlines of Psychology, 1903, pages 16 to 18, Titchener, Textbook of Psychology, 1909, pages 15 to 25, G. E. Moore, The Nature and Reality of Objects of Perception, Proceedings of the Aristotelian Society, New Series, Volume 6, 1905 to 1906, pages 102 to 1104. None of these authors explicitly presents a theory of introspection so that we cannot say positively that they agree with Stout. End footnote. The objections to Stout's theory are not of the same order as the objections to the theory of James, although just as profound. There can be no denial of the existence of the thing knowing, which is alleged to be known or observed, in this sort of introspection. The allegation that the knowing is observed is that which may be denied. Knowing there certainly is, known the knowing certainly is not. I may observe, or be aware of, a color, an odor, or any other sensation, sense datum. I may be aware of relations and feelings, I may be aware of any combination of these, but, stout to the contrary notwithstanding, I am never aware of an awareness. The possible objection to the statement just made, and probably the logical foundation of the introspection hypothesis, is as follows. If one is not aware of awareness, he does not know that it exists. If one denies that he is ever aware of a thing, and that anyone else is ever aware of it, he has no right to say that there is such a thing. The force of this argument is purely imaginary. It may sound paradoxical to say that one cannot observe the process or relation of observation, and yet may be certain that there is such a process, but there is really no inconsistency in the saying. How do I know that there is awareness? By being aware of something. There is no meaning in the term awareness which is not expressed in the statement, quote, I am aware of a color, or what not, end quote. So much for the logical foundation of introspection. There is, however, a psychological reason for the rise of the theory. So many psychologists would not have assumed the reality of introspection if there were not some process or operation which stimulates it. This process, I think, may be readily pointed out when one observes some external object, as for instance sound, there are simultaneously present a number of other objects which are intimately connected with the observing of the sound, and which may not be themselves observed clearly. The muscular sensations from the tympanum, neck, breast, and other regions, the visual images, the feelings, the visceral sensations, all these are definitely modified in the listening for the sound, and yet may not be vivid. On the other hand, the attention may be turned to these accessory facts, 
and the importance of the auditory sensation may be secondary. In this case, there seems to be a turning of the attention from the outer fact, the sound, to the inner facts. These facts are inner in that they concern or are constituents of the body or objective self. By a rather natural step, accordingly, these inner facts are taken to be the process of observing the sound. Observation of them is therefore the process of observing the process of observing the sound. Introspection. Stated in detail, this sort of introspection is quite clearly the observation of things which are just as objective, considered from the point of view of knowledge, as is the sound. The trouble comes from the fact that we are apt to omit detailed statements. The double distinction between the subject and the object, and between the self and the not-self, almost inevitably leads, in the absence of rigid analysis, to the identification of the objective self with the subject, and hence the vague conclusion that processes associated with the knowing of external objects are processes of knowing the same objects. In actual practice, most psychologists who use the term introspection and define it as the observation of consciousness not only do not seek to apply it in strict accordance with this definition, but they even apply it to the whole range of psychological observation. In giving introspective reports on the observation of a sound, for example, the sound itself is usually included as one of the introspected details. So colors, odors, afterimages, and all other objects of consciousness are quite commonly said to be introspectively observed. This practice constitutes effectively the reductio ad absurdum of the introspection theory. Starting as a distinctive kind of observation, the observation of an observation of something, it finishes as the only kind of observation. In other words, there would seem to be really nothing to observe except the observation of something else. There is, as a matter of fact, not the slightest evidence for the reality of introspection as the observation of consciousness. Hence we must, in default of such evidence, cease the empty assumption of such a process. We might keep the word to apply to the processes we have described above, observation of feelings and of kinesthetic and synesthetic sensations a term by which to designate the observation of these factors would be very useful, and introspection is the illegitimate term for the purpose, since these factors are the real inner ones of which psychology has been talking for so long a time. But in view of the words quite disreputable past, it is probably better to banish it for the present from psychological usage. Knight Dunlap The Johns Hopkins University Note. After the foregoing discussion was placed in the hands of the editor, Professor Titchener's interesting Prolegomena to a Study of Introspection appeared in the July number of the American Journal of Psychology. Professor Titchener discards the Hamiltonian doctrine of the mind being self-conscious in every cognition. What he substitutes for this doctrine is not made altogether clear, but apparently it is a theory similar to that of Stout, or else, and this is more probable, the scholastic doctrine. This is indicated by such things as the implicit application of the term introspection to the observation of sounds, the statement that the psychologist is observing his own mind, and the statement that introspection is the interrogation of experience. The strongest indication is the contention that introspection is not necessarily a conscious process. This doctrine, which at first seems highly paradoxical, is quite intelligible if we remember that consciousness in Professor Titchener's mind scheme is made up of processes which are by no means to be identified with cognitions of objects, but rather with objects cognized. It is quite consistent with this terminology to say that introspection is not primarily a conscious process. It is the observation of a conscious process. End of the case against introspection.
The Social Self. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jean Del Frio, Iowa City, Iowa. The Social Self by George Herbert Mead. First published in Journal of Philosophy, Psychology, and Scientific Methods, 10, 374 to 380. Recognizing that the self cannot appear in consciousness as an I, that it is always an object, i.e., a me, I wish to suggest an answer to the question, what is involved in the self being an object? The first answer may be that an object involves a subject. Stated in other words, that a me is inconceivable without an I. And to this reply must be made that such an I is a presupposition, but never a presentation of conscious experience. For the moment it is presented, it has passed into the objective case, presuming, if you like, an I that observes, but an I that can disclose himself only by ceasing to be the subject for whom the object, me, exists. It is, of course, not the Hegelism of a self that becomes another to himself in which I am interested, but the nature of the self as revealed by introspection and subject to our factual analysis. This analysis does reveal, then, in a memory process, an attitude of observing oneself, in which both the observer and the observed appear. To be concrete, one remembers asking himself how he could undertake to do this, that, or the other, chiding himself for his shortcomings, or pluming himself upon his achievements. Thus, in the reintegrated self of the moment past, one finds both a subject and an object, but it is a subject that is now an object of observation, and has the same nature as the object self, whom we present as in intercourse with those about us. In quite the same fashion, we remember the questions, admonitions, and approvals addressed to our fellows. But the subject attitude which we instinctively take can be presented only as something experienced, as we can be conscious of our acts only through the sensory processes set up after the act has begun. The contents of this presented subject, who thus has become an object in being presented, but which still distinguish him as the subject of the past experience from the me whom he addressed, are those images which initiated the conversation, and the motor sensations which accompany the expression, plus the organic sensations, and the response of the whole system to the activity initiated. In a word, just those contents which go to make up the self which is distinguished from the others whom he addresses. The self appearing as I is the memory image self who acted toward himself and is the same self who acts toward other selves. On the other hand, the stuff that goes to make up the me whom the I addresses and whom he observes is the experience which is induced by this action of the I. If the I speaks, the me hears. If the eye strikes, the me feels the blow. Here again, the me consciousness is of the same character as that which arises from the action of the other upon him. That is, it is only as the individual finds himself acting with reference to himself as he acts towards others, that he becomes a subject to himself rather than an object and only as he is affected by his own social conduct in the manner in which he is affected by that of others, that he becomes an object of his own social conduct. 
the differences in our memory presentations of the I and the me are those of the memory images of the initiated social conduct and those of the sensory responses thereto. It is needless, in view of the analysis of Baldwin, of Royce, and of Cooley, and many others, to do more than indicate that these reactions arise earlier in our social conduct with others than in introspective self-consciousness, i.e., that the infant consciously calls the attention of others before he calls his own attention by affecting himself, and that he is consciously affected by others before he is conscious of being affected by himself. The I of introspection is the self which enters into social relations with other selves. It is not the I that is implied in the fact that one presents himself as a me and the me of introspection is the same me that is the object of the social conduct of others. One presents himself as acting toward others. In this presentation, he is presented in indirect discourse as the subject of the action and is still an object. And the subject of this presentation can never appear immediately in conscious experience. It is the same self who is presented as observing himself, and he affects himself just in so far and only in so far as he can address himself by the means of social stimulation which affect others. The me whom he addresses is the me, therefore, that is similarly affected by the social conduct of those about him. This statement of the introspective situation, however, seems to overlook a more or less constant feature of our consciousness, and that is that running current of awareness of what we do which is distinguishable from the consciousness of the field of stimulation, whether that field be without or within. It is this awareness which has led many to assume that it is the nature of the self to be conscious both of subject and of object, to be subject of action toward an object world, and at the same time to be directly conscious of this subject as subject, quote, thinking its non-existence along with whatever else it thinks, end quote. Now, as Professor James pointed out, this consciousness is more logically conceived of as a shusness. The thinker, being an implication rather than a content, while the me is but a bit of object content within the stream of shusness. However, this logical statement does not do justice to the findings of consciousness. Besides the actual stimulations and responses and the memory images of these, within which lie perforce the organic sensations and responses which make up the me, there accompanies a large part of our conscious experience, indeed all that we call self-conscious, an inner response to what we may be doing, saying, or thinking. At the back of our heads, we are a large part of the time more or less clearly conscious of our own replies to the remarks made to others, of innervations which would lead to attitudes and gestures answering our gestures and attitudes towards others. The observer who accompanies all our self-conscious conduct is then not the actual I who is responsible for the conduct in propria persona. He is rather the response which one makes to his own conduct. The confusion of this response of ours, following upon our social stimulations of others, with the implied subject of our action, is the psychological ground for the assumption that the self can be directly conscious of itself as acting and acted upon. The actual situation is this. The self acts with reference to others and is immediately conscious of the objects about it. In memory, it also reintegrates the self acting as well as the others acted upon. But besides these contents, the action with reference to the others calls out responses in the individual himself. 
there is then another me criticizing, approving, and suggesting, and consciously planning, i.e., the reflective self. It is not to all our conduct toward the objective world that we thus respond. Where we are intensely preoccupied with the objective world, this accompanying awareness disappears. We have to recall the experience to become aware that we have been involved as selves, to produce the self-consciousness which is a constituent part of a large part of our experience. As I have indicated elsewhere, the mechanism for this reply to our own social stimulation of others follows as a natural result from the fact that the very sounds, gestures, especially vocal gestures, which man makes in addressing others, call out or tend to call out responses from himself. He cannot hear himself speak without assuming in a measure the attitude which he would have assumed if he had been addressed in the same words by others. The self which consciously stands over against other selves thus becomes an object, an other to himself, through the very fact that he hears himself talk and replies. The mechanism of introspection is therefore given in the social attitude which man necessarily assumes toward himself, and the mechanism of thought, insofar as thought uses symbols which are used in social intercourse, is but an inner conversation. Now it is just this combination of the remembered self which acts and exists over against other selves with the inner response to his action which is essential to the self-conscious ego, the self in the full meaning of the term although neither phase of self-consciousness, insofar as it appears as an object of our experience, is a subject. It is also to be noted that this response to the social conduct of the self may be in the role of another. We present his arguments in imagination and do it with his intonations and gestures and even perhaps with his facial expression. In this way we play the roles of all our group, Indeed, it is only in so far as we do this that they become part of our social environment. To be aware of another self as a self implies that we have played his role, or that of another with whose type we identify him for purposes of intercourse. The inner response to our reaction to others is therefore as varied as is our social environment. Not that we assume the roles of others toward ourselves because we are subject to a mere imitative instinct, but because in responding to ourselves we are in the nature of the case taking the attitude of another than the self that is directly acting. And into this reaction there naturally flows the memory images of the responses of those about us, the memory images of those responses of others which were in answer to like actions. Thus, the child can think about his conduct as good or bad only as he reacts to his own acts in the remembered words of his parents. Until this process has been developed into the abstract process of thought, self-consciousness remains dramatic, and the self, which is a fusion of the remembered actor and this accompanying chorus, is somewhat loosely organized and very clearly social. Later, the inner stage changes into the form and workshop of thought. The features and intonations of the dramatis personae fade out, and the emphasis falls upon the meaning of the inner speech. The imagery becomes merely the barely necessary cues. But the mechanism remains social, and at any moment the process may become personal. It is fair to say that the modern Western world has lately done much of its thinking in the form of the novel, while earlier the drama was a more effective but equally social mechanism of self-consciousness. And, in passing, I may refer to that need of filling out the bare spokesman of abstract thought, which even the most abstruse thinker feels in seeking his audience. The import of this for religious self-consciousness is obvious.
there is one further implication of this nature of the self to which i wish to call attention it is the manner of its reconstruction i wish especially to refer to it because the point is of importance in the psychology of ethics as a mere organization of habit the self is not self-conscious it is this self which we refer to as character when however an essential problem appears there is some disintegration in this organization and different tendencies appear in reflective thought as different voices in conflict with each other in a sense the old self has disintegrated and out of the moral process a new self arises the specific question i wish to ask is whether the new self appears together with the new object or end there is of course a reciprocal relation between the self and its object the one implies the other and the interests and evaluation of this self answer exactly to content and values of the object on the other hand the consciousness of the new object its values and meaning seems to come earlier to consciousness than the new self that answers to the new object the man who has come to realize a new human value is more immediately aware of the new object in his conduct than of himself and his manner of reaction to it this is due to the fact to which reference has already been made that direct attention goes first to the object when the self becomes an object it appears in memory and the attitude which it implied has already been taken in fact to distract attention from the object to the self implies just that lack of objectivity which we criticize not only in the moral agent but in the scientist assuming as i do the essentially social character of the ethical end we find in moral reflection a conflict in which certain values find a spokesman in the old self or a dominant part of the old self while other values answering to other tendencies and impulses arise in opposition and find other spokesmen to present their cases to leave the field to the values represented by the old self is exactly what we term selfishness the justification for the term is found in the habitual character of conduct with reference to these values attention is not claimed by the object and shifts to the subjective field where the effective responses are identified with the old self the result is that we state the other conflicting ends in subjective terms of other selves and the moral problem seems to take on the form of the sacrifice either of the self or of the others where however the problem is objectively considered although the conflict is a social one it should not resolve itself into a struggle between selves but into such a reconstruction of the situation that different and enlarged and more adequate personalities may emerge a tension should be centered on the objective social field in the reflective analysis the old self should enter upon the same terms with the selves whose roles are assumed and the test of the reconstruction is found in the fact that all the personal interests are adequately recognized in a new social situation the new self that answers to this new situation can appear in consciousness only after this new situation has been realized and accepted the new self cannot enter into the field as the determining factor because he is consciously present only after the new end has been formulated and accepted the old self may enter only as an element over against the other personal interests involved if he is the dominant factor it must be in defiance of the other selves whose interests are at stake as the old self he is defined by his conflict with the others that assert themselves in his reflective analysis solution is reached by the construction of a new world 
harmonizing the conflicting interests into which enters the new self. The process is in its logic identical with the abandonment of the old theory with which the scientist has identified himself. His refusal to grant this old attitude any further weight than may be given to the other conflicting observations and hypotheses. Only when a successful hypothesis, which overcomes the conflicts, has been formulated and accepted, may the scientist again identify himself with this hypothesis as his own and maintain it contra mundum. He may not state the scientific problem and solution in terms of his old personality. He may name his new hypothesis after himself and realize his enlarged scientific personality in its triumph. The fundamental difference between the scientific and moral solution of a problem lies in the fact that the moral problem deals with concrete personal interests in which the whole self is reconstructed in its relation to the other selves whose relations are essential to its personality. The growth of the self arises out of a partial disintegration, the appearance of the different interests in the forum of reflection, the reconstruction of the social world, and the consequent appearance of the new self that answers to the new object. End of The Social Self Psychology as the Viewerist Views It Part 1 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Om123 Psychology as the Viewerist Views It Part 1 by John B. Watson, 1913, first published in Psychological Review, 20, 158 to 177. Psychology, as the behaviorist views it, is a purely objective experimental branch of natural science. Its theoretical goal is the prediction and control of behavior. Introspection forms no essential part of its methods, nor is the scientific value of its data dependent upon the readiness with which they lend themselves to interpretation in terms of consciousness. The viewerist, in his efforts to get a neutral scheme of animal response, recognizes no dividing line between man and brute. The behavior of man, with all of its refinement and complexity, forms only a part of the behaviorist's total scheme of investigation. It has been maintained by its followers generally that psychology is a study of the science of the phenomena of consciousness. It has taken its problem on the one hand, the analysis of complex mental states or processes into simple elementary constituents, and on the other, the construction of complex states when the elementary constituents are given. The world of physical objects, stimuli, including here anything which makes that activity in a receptor, which forms the total phenomena of the natural scientist is looked upon merely as means to an end. That end is the production of mental states that may be inspected or observed. The psychological object of observation in the case of an emotion, for example, is the mental state itself. The problem in emotion is the determination of the number and kind of elementary constituents present, their loci, intensity, order of appearance, etc., it is agreed that introspection is the method par excellence by means of which mental states may be manipulated for purposes of psychology. On this assumption, behavior data, including under this term everything which goes under the name of comparative psychology, have no value per se. They pose a significance only in so far as they may throw light upon conscious states. Such data must have at least an analogical or indirect reference to belong to the realm of psychology. Indeed, at times, one finds psychologists who are skeptical of even this analogical reference. Such skepticism is often shown by the question which is put to the student of behavior. What is the bearing of animal work upon human psychology? I used to have to study over this question. Indeed, it always embarrassed me somewhat. I was interested in my own work and felt that it was important, and yet I could not trace any close connection 
between it and psychology, as my questioner understood psychology. I hope that such a confession will clear the atmosphere to such an extent that we will no longer have to work under false pretenses. We must frankly admit that the fact so important to us, which we have been able to clean from extended work upon the senses of animals by the behavior method, have contributed only in a fragmentary way to the general theory of human sense organ processes, nor have they suggested new points of experimental attack. The enormous number of experiments which we have carried out upon learning have likewise contributed little to human psychology. It seems reasonably clear that some kind of compromise must be effected. Either psychology must change its viewpoint so as to take in facts of behavior, whether or not they have bearings upon the problems of consciousness, or else behavior must stand alone as a wholly separate and independent science. Should human psychologists fail to look with favor upon our overtures and refuse to modify their position, the behaviorists will be driven to using human beings as subjects and to employ methods of investigation which are exactly comparable to those now employed in the animal work. Any other hypothesis than that which admits the independent value of behavior material, regardless of any bearing such material may have upon consciousness, will inevitably force us to the absurd position of attempting to construct the conscious content of the animal whose behavior we have been studying. On this view, after having determined our animal's ability to learn, the simplicity or complexity of its methods of learning, the effect of past habit upon present response, the range of stimuli to which it ordinarily responds, the widened range to which it can respond under experimental conditions, in more general terms, its various problems and its various ways of solving them, we should still feel that the task is unfinished and that the results are worthless until we can interpret them by analogy in the light of consciousness. Although we have solved a problem we feel uneasy and unrestful because of our definition of psychology, we feel forced to say something about the possible mental processes of our animal. We say that, having no eyes, its stream of consciousness cannot contain brightness and color sensations as we know them. Having no taste buds, this stream can contain no sensations of sweet, sour, salt, and bitter. But on the other hand, since it does respond to thermal, tactual, and organic stimuli, its conscious content must be made up largely of these sensations. And we usually add, to protect ourselves against the reproach of being anthropomorphic, if it has any consciousness. Surely, this doctrine which calls for an analogical interpretation of all behavior data must be shown to be false. The position that the standing on observation upon behavior is determined by its fruitfulness in yielding results which are interpretable only in the narrow realm of really human consciousness. This emphasis upon analogy in psychology has led the behaviorist somewhat afield. Not being willing to throw off the yoke of consciousness, he feels impelled to make a place in the scheme of behavior where the rise of consciousness can be determined. This point has been a sifting one. A few years ago, certain animals were supposed to possess associative memory, while certain others were supposed to lack it. One meets this search for the origin of consciousness under a good many disguises. Some of our texts state that consciousness arises at the moment when reflex and instinctive activities fail properly to conserve the organism. A perfectly adjusted organism would be lacking in consciousness. On the other hand, whenever we find the presence of diffuse activity which results in habit formation, we are justified in assuming consciousness. I must confess that these arguments had weight with me when I began the study of behavior. I fear that a good many of us are still viewing behavior problems with something like this in mind. More than one student in behavior has attempted to frame criteria of the psychic, to devise a set of objective, structural, and functional criteria which, when applied in the particular instance, will enable us to decide whether such and such responses are positively conscious, merely indicative of conscious, or whether they are purely physiological. Such problems as these can no longer satisfy human behavior. It would be better to give up the province altogether and admit frankly that the study of the behavior of animals has no justification than to admit that our search is of such a will-o-dose character. 
one can assume either a presence or the absence of consciousness anywhere in the polygenetic scale without affecting the problems of behavior by one jot or one title, and without influencing any way the mode of experimental attack upon them. On the other hand, I cannot for one moment assume that the paramecium responds to light, that the rat learns a problem more quickly by working at the task five times a day than once a day, or that the human child exhibits plateau in his learning curves. These are questions which vitally concern behavior and which must be decided by direct observation under experimental conditions. This attempt to reason by analogy from human conscious processes to the conscious processes in animals and vice versa, to make consciousness, as the human being knows it, the center of reference of all behavior, forces us into a situation similar to that which existed in biology in Darwin's time. The whole Darwinian movement was judged by the bearing it had upon the origin and development of the human race. Expeditions were undertaken to collect material which should establish the position that the rise of the human race was a perfectly natural phenomena and not an act of special creation. Variations were carefully sought along with the evidence for the heaping up effect and the weeding out effect of selection. For in these and other Darwinian mechanisms were to be found factors sufficiently complex to account for the origin and race differentiation of man. The wealth of material collected at this time was considered valuable largely in so far as it tended to develop the concept of evolution in man. It is strange that this situation should have remained the dominant one in biology for so many years. The moment geology overtook the experimental study of evolution and descent, the situation immediately changed. Man ceased to be the center of reference. I doubt if any experimental biologist today unless actually engaged in the problem of race differentiation in man, tries to interpret his findings in terms of human evolution, or ever refers to it in his thinking. He gathers his data from the study of many species of plants and animals and tries to work out the laws of inheritance in the particular type upon which he is conducting experiments. Naturally, he follows the progress of the work upon race differentiation in man and in the descent of man but he looks upon these as special topics, equal in importance with his own, yet ones in which his interests will never be vitally engaged. It is not fair to say that all of his works is directed toward human evolution or that it must be interpreted in terms of human evolution. He does not have to dismiss certain of his facts on the inheritance of coat color in mice, because forsooth they have little bearing upon the differentiation of the genus Homo into separate races or upon the descent of the genus Homo from some more primitive stock. In psychology, we are still in that stage of development where we feel that we must select our material. We have a general place of discard for processes, which we anatomatize so far as their value for psychology is concerned by saying, this is a reflex, that is a purely physiological fact which has nothing to do with psychology. We are not interested, as psychologists, in getting all of the process of adjustment which the animal as a whole employs, and in finding how these various responses are associated and how they fall apart, thus working out a systematic scheme for the prediction and control of response in general. Unless our observed facts are indicative of consciousness, we have no use for them, and unless our apparatus and method are designed to throw such facts into relief, they are thought of in just as disparaging a way. I shall always remember the remark one distinguished psychologist made as he looked over the color apparatus designed for testing the responses of animals to monochromatic light in the attic at Johns Hopkins. It was this, and they call it psychology. I do not wish unduly to criticize psychology. It has failed signally, I believe, during the fifty odd years of its existence as an experimental discipline to make its place in the world as an undisputed natural science. Psychology, as it is generally thought of, has something esoteric in its methods. If you fail to reproduce my findings, it is not due to some fault in your apparatus or in the control of your stimulus, but it is due to the fact that your introspection is untrained. The attack is made upon the observer and not upon the experimental setting. 
In physics and in chemistry, the attack is made upon the experimental conditions. The apparatus was not sensitive enough. Impure chemicals were used, etc. In these sciences, a better technique will give reproducible results. Psychology is otherwise. If you can't observe three to nine states of clearness in attention, your introspection is poor. If, on the other hand, a feeling seems reasonably clear to you, your introspection is again faulty. You are seeing too much. Feelings are never clear. The time seems to have come when psychology must discard all reference to consciousness. When it need no longer delude itself into thinking that it is making mental states the object of observation, we have become so enmeshed in speculative questions concerning the elements of mind, the nature of conscious content, for example, imageless thought, attitudes, and beustige large, etc., that I, as an experimental student, feel that something is wrong with our premises and the type of problems which develop from them. There is no longer any guarantee that we all mean the same thing when we use the terms now current in psychology. Take the case of sensation. A sensation is defined in terms of its attributes. One psychologist will state with readiness that the attributes of a visual sensation are quality, extension, duration, and intensity. Another will add clearness. Still another that of order. I doubt if any psychologist can draw up a set of statements describing what it means by sensation which will be agreed to by three other psychologists of different training. Turn for a moment to the question of the number of isolable sensations. Is there an extremely large number of color sensation, or only four, red, green, yellow, and blue? Again, yellow, while psychologically simple, can be obtained by superimposing red and green spectral rays upon the same diffusing surface. If, on the other hand, we say that just noticeable difference in the spectrum is a simple sensation, and that every just noticeable increase in the white value of a given color gives simple sensations, we are forced to admit that the number is so large and the conditions for obtaining them so complex that the concept of sensation is unusable, either for the purpose of analysis or that of synthesis. Tichener, who has fought the most valiant fights in this country for a psychology based upon introspection, feels that these differences of opinion as to the number of sensations and their attributes as to whether there are relations in the sense of elements and on the many others which seem to be fundamental in every attempt at analysis are perfectly natural in the present undeveloped state of psychology. While it is admitted that every growing science is full of unanswered questions, surely only those who are wedded to the system as we now have it, who have fought and suffered for it, can confidently believe that there will ever be any greater uniformity than there is now in the answers we have to such questions. I firmly believe that 200 years from now, unless the introspective method is discarded, psychology will still be divided on the question as to whether auditory sensations have the quality of extension, whether intensity is an attribute which can be applied to color, whether there is a difference in texture between image and sensation, and upon many hundreds of others of like character. The condition in regard to other mental processes is just as chaotic. Can image type be experimentally tested and verified? Are recondite thought processes dependent mechanically of an imagery at all? Are psychologists agreed upon what feeling is? One states that feelings are attitudes. Another finds them to be groups of organic sensations possessing a certain solidarity. Still another and larger group finds them to be new elements correlative with and ranking equally with sensations. My psychological quarrel is not with a systematic and structural psychologist alone. The last 15 years we have seen the growth of what is called functional psychology. This type of psychology decries the use of elements in the static sense of the structuralists. It throws emphasis upon the biological significance of conscious processes instead of upon the analysis of conscious states into introspectively isolable elements. I have done my best to understand the difference between functional psychology and structural psychology. Instead of clarity, confusion grows upon me. The terms sensation, perception, affection, emotion, volition are used as much by the functionalist as by the structuralist. 
the addition of the word process mental act as a whole and like terms are frequently met after it serves in some way to remove the corpse of content and to leave function in its state surely if these concepts are elusive when looked at from a content standpoint they are still more deceptive when viewed from the angle of function and especially so when function is obtained by the introspection method it is rather interesting that no functional psychologist has carefully distinguished between perception and this is true of the other psychological terms as well as employed by the systematist and perceptual process as used in functional psychology it seems illogical and hardly fair to criticize the psychology which the systematist gives us and then to utilize his terms without carefully showing the changes in meaning which are to be attached to them i was greatly surprised some time ago when i opened pillsbury's book and saw psychology defined as the science of behavior a still more recent text states that psychology is the science of mental behavior when i saw these promising statements i thought now surely we'll have texts based upon different lines after a few pages the science of behavior is dropped and one finds the conventional treatment of sensation perception imagery etc along with certain shifts in emphasis and additional facts which serve to give the author's personal imprint one of the difficulties in the way of a consistent functional psychology is the parallelistic hypothesis if the functionalist attempts to express his formulations in terms which make mental states really appear to function to play some active role in the world of adjustment he almost inevitably lapses into terms which are canonative of interaction when taxed with this he replies that it is more convenient to do so and that he does it to avoid the circumlocution and clumsiness which are inherent in any thoroughgoing parallelism as a matter of fact i believe the functionalist actually thinks in terms of interaction and resorts to parallelism only when forced to give expression to his views I feel that behaviorism is the only consistent and logical functionalism. In it, one avoids both the scylla of parallelism and charivadis of interaction. Those time-honored relics of philosophical speculation needs trouble the student of behavior as little as they trouble the student of physics. The consideration of the mind-body problem affects neither the type of problem selected nor the formulation of the solution of that problem. I can state my position here no better than by saying that I should like to bring my students up in the same ignorance of such hypotheses as one finds among the students of other branches of science. This leads me to the point where I should like to make the argument constructive. I believe we can write a psychology, define it as Pillsbury, and never go back upon our definition never use the terms consciousness mental states mind content introspectively verifiable imagery and the like i believe that we can do it in a few years without running into absurd terminology of beer betty von eucal neol and that of the so-called objective schools generally it can be done in terms of stimulus and response in terms of habit formation habit integrations and the like furthermore I believe that it is really worthwhile to make this attempt now. End of Psychology as the Behaviorist Views It, Part 1For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by O123. Psychology as the Behaviorist Views It. Part 2. By John B. Watson. 1913. First published in Psychological Review. 20. 158 to 177. The psychology which I should attempt to build up would take as a starting point. First, the observable fact that organisms man and animal alike do adjust themselves to their environment by means of hereditary and habit equipments these adjustments may be very adequate or they may be so inadequate that the organism barely maintains its existence secondly that certain stimuli lead the organisms to make the responses 
in a system of psychology completely worked out, given the response, the stimuli can be predicted. Given the stimuli, the response can be predicted. Such a set of statements is crass and raw and extreme, as all such generalizations must be. Yet, they are hardly more raw and less realizable than the ones which appear in the psychology texts of the day. I possibly might illustrate my point better by choosing an everyday problem which anyone is likely to meet in the course of his work. Some time ago, I was called upon to make a study of certain species of birds. Until I went to Tartagus, I had never seen these birds alive. When I reached there, I found the animals doing certain things. Some of the acts seemed to work particularly well in such an environment, while others seemed to be unsuited to their type of life. I first studied the responses of the group as a whole, and later those of individuals. In order to understand more thoroughly the relation between what was habit and what was hereditary in these responses, I took the young birds and reared them. In this way, I was able to study the order of appearance of hereditary adjustments and their complexity, and later the beginnings of habit formation. My efforts in determining the stimuli which called forth such adjustments were crude indeed. Consequently, my attempts to control behavior and to produce responses at will did not meet with much success. Their food and water, sex and other social relations, light and temperature conditions were all beyond control in a field study. I did find it possible to control their reactions in a measure by using the nest and egg, or young, as a stimuli. It is not necessary in this paper to develop further how such a study should be carried out and how work of this kind must be supplemented by carefully controlled laboratory experiments. Had I been called upon to examine the natives of some of the Australian tribes, I should have gone about my task in the same way. I should have found the problem more difficult. The types of responses called forth by physical stimuli would have been more varied and the number of effective stimuli larger. I should have had to determine the social setting of their lives in a far more careful way. These savages would be more influenced by the responses of each other than was the case with the birds. Furthermore, habits would have been more complex and the influence of past habits upon the present responses would have appeared more clearly. Finally, if I had been called upon to work out the psychology of the educated European, my problem would have required several lifetimes. But in the one I have at my disposal, I should have followed the same general line of attack. In the main, my desire in all such work is to gain an accurate knowledge of adjustments and the stimuli calling them forth. My final reason for this is to learn general and particular methods by which I may control behavior. My goal is not the description and explanation of state of consciousness as such, nor that of obtaining such proficiency in mental gymnastics that I can immediately lay hold of a state of consciousness and say, this as a whole consists of gray sensation number 350 of such and such extent, occurring in conjunction with the sensation of cold of a certain intensity, one of pressure of a certain intensity and extent, and so ad infinitum. If psychology would follow the plan I suggest, the educator, the physician, the jurist, and the businessman could utilize our data in a practical way as soon as we are able experimentally to update them. Those who have occasion to apply psychological principles practically would find no need to complain as they do at the present time. Ask any physician or jurist today whether scientific psychology plays a practical part in his daily routine and you will hear him deny that the psychology of the laboratories find a place in his scheme of work. I think the criticism is extremely just. One of the earliest conditions which made me dissatisfied with psychology was the feeling that there was no realm of application for the principles which were being worked out in content terms. What gives me hope that the behaviorist disposition is a defensible one is the fact that those branches of psychology which have already partially withdrawn from the parent experimental psychology and which are consequently less dependent upon introspection are today in a most flourishing condition. Experimental pedagogy, the psychology of drugs, the psychology of advertising, legal psychology, the psychology of tests, and psychopathology are all vigorous growths. These are sometimes wrongly called practical or applied psychology. Surely, there was never a worse misnomer. 
in the future there may grow up vocational bureaus which really apply psychology at present these fields are truly scientific and are in search of broad generalizations which will lead to the control of human behavior for example we find out by experimentation whether a series of stanzas may be acquired more readily if the whole is learned at once or whether it is more advantageous to learn each stanza separately and then pass to the succeeding we do not attempt to apply our findings the application of this principle is purely voluntary on the part of the teacher in the psychology of drugs we may show the effect upon behavior of certain doses of caffeine we may reach the conclusion that caffeine has a good effect upon the speed and accuracy of work but these are general principles we leave it to the individual as to whether the results of our tests shall be applied or not again in legal testimony we test the effects of recency upon the reliability of a witness's report we test the accuracy of the report with respect to moving objects stationary objects color etc it depends upon the judiciary machinery of the country to decide whether these facts are ever to be applied for a pure psychologist to say that he is not interested in the questions raised in these divisions of the science because they relate indirectly to the application of psychology shows in the first place that he fails to understand the scientific aim in such problems and secondly that he is not interested in a psychology which concerns itself with human life the only fault i have to find with these disciplines is that much of their material is stated in terms of introspection whereas a statement in terms of objective results would be far more valuable there is no reason why appeal should ever be made to consciousness in any of them or why introspective data should ever be sought during experimentation or published in the results in experimental pedagogy especially one can see the desirability of keeping all of the results on a purely objective plan if this is done work there on the human being will be comparable directly with the work upon animals for example at hopkins mr ulrich has obtained certain results upon the distribution of effort in learning using rats as subjects he is prepared to give comparative results upon the effect of having an animal work at the problem once per day three times per day and five times per day whether it is advisable to have the animal learn only one problem at a time or to learn three abreast we need to have similar experiments made upon man but we care as little about his conscious processes during the conduct of the experiment as we care about such processes in the rats i am more interested at the present moment in trying to show the necessity for maintaining uniformity in experimental procedure and in the method of stating results in both human and animal work than in developing any ideas that i may have upon the changes which are certain to come in the scope of human psychology let us consider for a moment the subject of the range of stimuli to which animals respond i shall speak first of the work upon vision in animals we put our animal in a situation where he will respond or learn to respond to one of the two monochromatic lights we feed him at one positive and punish him at the other negative in a short time the animal learns to go to the light at which he is fed at this point questions arise which i may phrase in two ways i may choose the psychological way and say does the animal see these two lights as i do that is as two distinct colors or does he see them as two grays differing in brightness as does the totally color blind phrased by the behaviorist it would read as follows is my animal responding upon the basis of the difference in intensity between the two stimuli or upon the difference in wavelengths he nowhere thinks of the animal's response in terms of his own experiences of colors and grays he wishes to establish the fact whether wavelength is a factor in that animal's adjustment if so what wavelengths are effective and what differences in wavelength must be maintained in the different regions to afford basis for differential responses if wavelength is not a factor in adjustment he wishes to know what difference in intensity will serve as a basis for response and whether that same difference will suffice throughout the spectrum furthermore he wishes to test whether the animal can respond to wavelengths which do not affect the human eye 
he is as much interested in comparing the red spectrum with that of the chick as in comparing it with man's. The point of view, when the various sets of comparisons are made, does not change in the slightest. However, we phrase the question to ourselves. We take our animal after the association has been formed and then introduce certain control experiments which enable us to return answers to the questions just raised. But there is just as keen a desire on our part to test man under the same conditions and to state the results in both cases in common terms. The man and the animal should be placed as nearly as possible under the same experimental conditions. Instead of feeding or punishing the human subject, we should ask him to respond by setting a second apparatus until standard and control offered no basis for a differential response. Do I lay myself open to the charge here that I am using introspection? My reply is not at all. That, while I might very well feed my human subject for a right choice and punish him for a wrong one, and thus produce the response if the subject could give it, there is no need of going to extremes even on the platform I suggest. But be it understood that I am merely using this second method as an abridged behavior method. We can go just as far and reach just as dependable results by the longer method as by the abridged. In many cases, the direct and typically human method cannot be safely used. Suppose, for example, that I doubt the accuracy of the setting of the control instrument in the above experiments, as I am very likely to do if I suspect a defect in vision. It is hopeless for me to get his introspective report. He will say, there is no difference in sensation, both are reds, identical in quality. But suppose I confront him with the standard and the control and so arrange conditions that he is punished if he responds to the control, but not with the standard. I interchange the positions of the standard and the control at will and force him to attempt to differentiate the one from the other. If he can learn to make the adjustment even after a large number of trials, it is evident that the two stimuli do afford the basis for a differential response. Such a method may sound nonsensical, but I firmly believe we will have to resort increasingly to just such method where we have reason to distrust the language method. There is hardly a problem in human vision which is not also a problem in animal vision. I mentioned the limits of the spectrum, threshold values, absolute and relative, flicker, Talbot's law, Weber's law, field of vision, the Parkinson phenomena, etc. Everyone is capable of being worked out by behavior methods. Many of them are being worked out at the present time. I feel that all the work upon the senses can be consistently carried forward along the lines I have suggested here for vision. Our results will, in the end, give an excellent picture of what each organ stands for in the way of function. The anatomist and the physiologist may take our data and show, on the one hand, the structures which are responsible for these responses, and on the other, the physics-chemical relations which are necessarily involved, physiological chemistry of nerve and muscle, in these and other reactions. The situation in regard to the study of memory is hardly different. Nearly all of the memory methods in actual use in the laboratory today yield the type of results I am arguing for. A certain series of nonsense syllables or other material is presented to the human subject. What should receive the emphasis are the rapidity of the habit formation, the errors, peculiarities in the form of the curve, the persistence of the habit so formed, the relation of such habits to those formed when more complex material is used, etc. Now, such results are taken down with the subject's introspection. The experiments are made for the purpose of discussing the mental machinery involved in learning, in recall, recollection, and forgetting, and not for the purpose of seeking the human being's way of shaping his responses to meet the problem in the terribly complex environment into which he is thrown nor for that of showing the similarities and differences between man's methods and those of other animals. The situation is somewhat different when I come to a study of the more complex forms of behavior, such as imagination, judgment, reasoning, and conception. At present, the only statements we have of them are in content terms. Our minds have been so warped by the 50 odd years which have been devoted to the study of state of consciousness that we can envisage these problems only in one way. 
we should meet the situation squarely and say that we are not able to carry forward investigations along of these lines by the behavior methods which are in use at the present time in extenuation i should like to call attention to the paragraph above where i made the point that the introspective method itself has reached a cul-de-sac with respect to them the topics have become so threadbare from much handling that they may well be put away for a time as our methods become better developed it will be possible to undertake investigations of more and more complex forms of behavior problems which are now laid aside will again become imperative but they can be viewed as they arise from a new angle and in more concrete settings. Will there be left over in psychology a world of pure psychics, to use your key star? I confess I do not know. The plans which I most favor for psychology lead practically to the ignoring of consciousness in the sense that that term is used by psychologists today. I have virtually denied that this realm of psychics is open to experimental investigation. I do not wish to go further into the problem at present because it leads inevitably over into metaphysics. If you will grant the behaviorist the right to use consciousness in the same way that other natural scientists employ it, that is, without making consciousness a special object of observation, you have granted all that my thesis requires. In concluding, I suppose I must confess to a deep bias on these questions. I have devoted nearly twelve years to experimentation on animals. It is natural that such a one should drift into a theoretical position which is in harmony with his experimental work. Possibly I have put up a straw man and have been fighting that. There may be no absolute lack of harmony between the position outlined here and that of functional psychology. I am inclined to think, however, that the two positions cannot be easily harmonized. Certainly, the position I advocate is weak enough at present, and can be attacked from many standpoints. Yet, when all this is admitted, I still feel that the considerations which I have urged should have a wide influence upon the type of psychology which is to be developed in the future. What we need to do is to start work upon psychology, making behavior, not consciousness, the objective point of our attack. Certainly, there are enough problems in the control of behavior to keep us all working many lifetimes without ever allowing us time to think of consciousness and such. Once launched in the undertaking, we will find ourselves in a short time as far divorced from an introspective psychology as the psychology of the present time is divorced from faculty psychology. Summary 1. Human psychology has failed to make good its claim as a natural science, due to a mistaken notion that its fields of facts are conscious phenomena, and that introspection is the only direct method of ascertaining these facts, it has enmeshed itself in a series of speculative questions, which, while fundamental to its present tenets, are not open to experimental treatment. In the pursuit of answers to these questions, it has become further and further divorced from contact with problems which vitally concern human interest. 2. Psychology as the behaviorist views it is a purely objective experimental branch of natural science which needs introspection as little as do the sciences of chemistry and physics. It is granted that the behavior of animals can be investigated without appeal to consciousness. Heretofore, the viewpoint has been that such data have value only in so far as they can be interpreted by analogy in terms of consciousness. The position is taken here that the behavior of man and the behavior of animals must be considered on the same plane, as being equally essential to a general understanding of behavior. It can dispense with consciousness in a psychological sense. The separate observation of states of consciousness is, on this assumption, no more a part of the task of the psychologist than of the physicist. We might call this the return to a non-reflective and naive use of consciousness. In this sense, consciousness may be said to be the instrument or tool with which all scientists work. Whether or not the tool is properly used at present by scientists is a problem for philosophy and not for psychology. 3. From the viewpoint here suggested, 
the facts on the behavior of amoeba have value in and for themselves without reference to the behavior of man in biology studies on race differentiation and inheritance in amoeba form a separate division of study which must be evaluated in terms of the laws found there the conclusions so reached may not hold in any other form regardless of the possible lack of generality such studies must be made if evolution as a whole is ever to be regulated and controlled similarly the laws of behavior in amoeba the range of responses and the determination of effective stimuli of habit formation persistency of habits interference and reinforcements of habits must be determined and evaluated in and for themselves regardless of their generality or of their bearing upon such laws in other forms if the phenomena of behavior are ever to be brought within the sphere of scientific control. 4. The suggested elimination of states of consciousness as proper objects of investigation in themselves will remove the barrier from psychology which exists between it and the other sciences. The findings of psychology become the functional correlates of structure and lend themselves to explanation in physico-chemical terms. 5. Psychology as behavior will, after all, have to neglect but few of the really essential problems with which psychology as an introspective science now concerns itself. In all probability, even this residue of problems may be phrased in such a way that refined methods in behavior, which certainly must come, will lead to their solution. References 1. That is, either directly upon the conscious state of the observer or indirectly upon the conscious state of the experimenter. 2. In this connection, I call attention to the controversy now on between the adherents and the opposers of imagilist thought. The types of reactors, sensory and motor, were also matters of bitter dispute. The complication experiment was the source of another war of words concerning the accuracy of the opponent's introspection. 3. My colleague, Professor H. C. Warren, by whose advice this article was offered to the review, believes that the parallelist can avoid the interaction terminology completely by exercising a little care. 4. He would have exactly the same attitude as if he were conducting an experiment to show whether an ant would crawl over a pencil laid across the trail or go round it. 5. I should prefer to look upon this abbreviated method, where the human subject is told in words, for example, to equate two stimuli or to state in words whether a given stimulus is present or absent, etc., as the language method in behavior. It in no way changes the status of experimentation. The method becomes possible merely by virtue of the fact that, in the particular case, the experimenter and his animal have systems of abbreviations or shortened behavior signs, language, any one of which may stand for a habit belonging to the repetitor, both of the experimenter and his subject. To make the data obtained by the language method virtually the whole of the behavior, or to attempt to mold all of the data obtained by other methods in terms of the one which has by all odds the most limited range, is putting the cart before the horse with a vengeance. 6. They are often undertaken apparently for the purpose of making crude pictures of what must or must not go in the nervous system. 7. There is need of questioning more and more the existence of what psychology calls imagery. Until a few years ago, I thought that centrally erosed visual sensations were as clear as those peripherally erosed. I had never accredited myself with any other kind. However, closer examination leads me to deny in my own case the presence of imagery in the Galtonian sense. The whole doctrine of the centrally erosed images, I believe at present, on a very insecure foundation. Ansel, as well as Farnald, reached the conclusion that an objective determination of image type is impossible. It would be an interesting confirmation of their experimental work if we should find by degrees that we have been mistaken in building up this enormous structure of the centrally erosed sensation or image. The hypothesis that all of the so-called higher thought processes go on in terms of fate reinstatements of the original muscular act, including speech here, and that these are integrated into systems which respond in serial order associated mechanisms is, I believe, a tenable one. It makes reflective processes as mechanical as habit. The scheme of habit which James long ago described, where each return or afferent current 
releases the next appropriate motor tissues is as true for thought processes as for overt muscular acts. Positive imagery would be the rule. In other words, wherever there are thought processes, there are faint contractions of the systems of musculature involved in the overt exercise of the customary act, and especially in the still finer systems of musculature involved in speech. If this is true, and I do not see how it can be gainsaid, imagery becomes a mental luxury, even if it really exists, without any functional significance whatever. If experimental procedures justify this hypothesis, we shall have at hand tangible phenomena which may be studied as behavior material. I should say that the day when we can study reflective processes by such methods is about as far off as the day when we can tell by physico-chemical methods the difference in the structure and arrangement of molecules between living protoplasm and inorganic substances. The solutions of both problems await the advent of methods and apparatus. After writing this paper, I heard the addresses of Professors Thorndike and Angel at the Cleveland meeting of the American Psychological Association. I hope to have the opportunity to discuss them at another time. I must even here attempt to answer one question raised by Thorndike. Thorndike cast suspicions upon ideomotor action. If by ideomotor action he means just that and would not include sensory motor action in his general denunciation, I heartily agree with him. I should throw out a misery altogether and attempt to show that practically all natural thought goes on in terms of sensory motor processes in the larynx, but not in terms of a measless thought, which rarely come to consciousness in any person who has not grabbed for a misery in the psychological laboratory. This easily explains why so many of the well-educated lady know nothing of a misery. I doubt if Thorndike concepts the matter in this way. He and Woodward seem to have neglected the speech mechanisms. It has been shown that improvement in habit comes unconsciously. The first we know of it is when it is achieved, when it becomes an object. I believe that consciousness has just as little to do with improvement in thought processes. Since, according to my view, thought processes are really motor habits in the larynx, improvements, shortcuts, changes, etc., in these habits are brought about in the same way that such changes are produced in other motor habits. This view carries with it the implication that there are no reflective processes, centrally initiated processes. The individual is always examining objects. In the one case, objects in the now accepted sense. In the other, they are substitutes, namely, the movements in the speech musculature. From this, it follows that there is no theoretical limitation of the behavior method. There remains, to be sure, the practical difficulty, which may never be overcome, of examining speech movements in the way that general bodily behavior may be examined. End of Psychology as the Behaviorist Views It, Part 2「ザ・リバー・ヴォックス・レコーディング」「ザ・リバー・ヴォックス・レコーディング」「ザ・リバー・ヴォックス・レコーディング」「ザ・リバー・ヴォックス・レコーディング」「ザ・リバー・ヴォックス・レコーディング」「ザ・リバー・ヴォックス・レコーディング」「ザ・リバー・ヴォックス・レコーディング」When we speak of science, we have in mind a logical, organized body of knowledge that has resulted from certain methods of attacking the problems presented by a particular subject matter. The methods of science are all, in the last resort, observational. The problems of science are all, in the last resort, analytical. The subject matter of a given science may be indicated in two ways. by a simple enumeration of objects, or by a characterization of the point of view from which the science in question regards the common subject matter of all science, namely, human experience. Thus, 
we may say that our psychology will deal with such things as perceptions, feelings, thoughts. Or we may say that psychology, dealing, quote, in some sort with the whole of experience, end quote, is to be distinguished as individualistic from other sciences which are universalistic. It is clear that a characterization of this kind though it necessarily transcends the limits of the science in order to show how those limits are drawn, is far more satisfactory than a mere list of objects. And psychology, these many years past, has therefore had recourse to it. Instead, however, of calling psychology with Ward the, quote, science of experience regarded objectively from the individualistic standpoint, end quote, or with Avenarius, the, quote, science of experience in general, so far as experience depends upon system C, or with culpe, the, quote, science of the facts of experience in their dependency upon experiencing individuals, end quote, or something of that sort. We are accustomed to speak of it as the, quote, science of mind, no harm would be done if we and our readers always remembered what mind, as used in a scientific context, must mean. Harm begins at once when we forget that scientific meaning and start out from the common sense or traditional significance of the word, when we equate mind with consciousness, which we take as the equivalent of awareness, and when we set off a group of conscious phenomena as the particular subject matter of psychology. I do not think that modern psychologists can fairly be charged with neglect of their duty to correct these errors. It seems to me, on the contrary, that our leaders are painfully careful to set their house in logical order. But habits of speech are invertebrate, and common sense is extraordinarily tenacious of life. Small wonder, then, that misunderstanding should arise. It is, for example, a misunderstanding that has prompted the polemical paragraphs of Watson's recent articles on what, I suppose, we must be content to call behaviorism. This doctrine, as set forth by Watson, has two sides, positive and negative. On the positive side, psychology is required to exchange its individualistic standpoint for the universalistic, it is to be a, quote, purely objective experimental branch of natural science, end quote, in the sense in which physics and chemistry are natural sciences. It is to concern itself solely with the changes set up by way of receiving organ and nervous system in muscle and gland. It is differentiated from its sister sciences of life partly by its special point of view, partly by the goal with which it strives to obtain. The changes which it studies are to be approached from a point of view of adjustment to environment. Its categories are stimulus and response, hereditary and habit. Differentiation, however, is not to be understood as separation. There is now no barrier between psychology and the other natural sciences, in the long run, behavior will appear as a matter of physical and chemical causation. While nevertheless, as behavior, it is the subject matter of the special science of psychology to be interpreted and arranged under the rubrics just mentioned. The erection of this special science is both justified and made possible by the practical goal of behaviorism which is the working out of general and special methods for the control of behavior, the regulation and control of evolution as a whole. On the negative side, again, psychology is enjoined by the behaviorist to ignore, even if it does not deny, those modes of human experience with which ordinary psychology is concerned, and, in particular, to reject the psychological method of introspection. Consciousness, in a psychological sense, may be dispensed with. Consciousness, in the sense of a tool or instrument 
with which all men of science work may be utilized by the new psychology without scruple and without examination. Imagery, the, quote, inner stronghold of a psychological based on introspection, is denied outright. One of Watson's principal contentions is that, quote, there are no centrally initiated processes. And if consciousness may be dispensed with, self-observation and the introspective reports that result from it are to be treated in even more summary fashion. They are to be eliminated. There will be no real loss, for most of the essential problems with which psychology as an introspective science now concerns itself are open to behaviorist treatment. And the residue may, quote, in all probability be phrased in such a way that refined methods in behavior, which certainly must come, will lead to their solution. End quote. Such in outline is quote, psychology as the behaviorist views it. Watson, of course, goes into some amount of detail, offering illustration and personal explanation, as well as attacking the method and problems of current psychology. But before I follow him on these various paths, I should like to record two general impressions that the reading of his articles has made upon me. The first impression is that of their unhistorical character, and the second is that of their logical irrelevance to psychology, as psychology is ordinarily understood. I call the articles unhistorical because they give no hint that any similar revolt against an established psychology had taken place earlier in psychological history. Yet, one need go no farther back than Comte to find a parallel. Comte's rejection of introspection has often been referred to. Let me now quote another passage in which he sums up his attack upon ideology. Quote, it is evident, first, that no function can be studied but with relation to the organ that fills it, or to the phenomenon of its fulfillment, and, in the second place, that the affective functions, and yet more the intellectual, exhibit in respect of their fulfillment the particular characteristics that they cannot be directly observed during the actual course of this fulfillment, but only in its more or less immediate and more or less permanent results. There are then only two different ways of studying scientifically such an order of functions. We must either determine, with all attainable precision, the various organic conditions on which they depend, and this is the chief object of phrenological physiology. Or, we must observe the consequence for conduct of intellectual and moral acts, and this belongs rather to natural history. These two inseparable aspects of one and the same subject being, of course, always so conceived that each may throw light on the other. Thus regarded, this great study is seen to be inseparably connected, on the one hand, with the whole, of natural philosophy, and especially with the fundamental doctrines of biology, and on the other hand, with the whole of scientific history, of the animals as well as of man, and even of humanity. But when, by the pretended method of psychology, we discard absolutely from our subject matter the consideration both of the agent and of the act, that is, of the organ of functioning, and of the result of its exercise, what more is there left to occupy the mind than an unintelligible locomachy in which merely nominal entities are everywhere substituted for scientific phenomena? The most difficult study of all is thus placed at once in a state of complete isolation, without any possible point of support in the simpler and more perfect sciences over which it is proposed, on the contrary, to give it sovereign rule. On these two points, all psychologists 
however extreme in their differences in other regards, are found to agree. End quote. Not Watson himself could be more outspoken or more severe, but we need not go back to Comte and the thirties. We need only go back to Courtenay and the year 1851. After a sharp criticism of introspection, Courtenay writes, quote, So we see that the most useful observations on the intellectual and moral nature of man, observations gathered not by philosophers disposed to theories and systems, but by men gifted with the true spirit of observation and prepared to grasp the practical side of things, by moralists, historians, men of affairs, legislators, instructors of youth, have not, as a rule, been the fruit of solitary contemplation and an internal study of the facts of consciousness, but far rather the result of an attentive study of the behavior of men placed in various situations, subjected to passions and influences of all sorts. End quote. Here we are hardly without the circles of those fifty-odd years, which Watson believes, how mistakenly, have been, quote, devoted to the study of states of consciousness. It would not be difficult to cross that line, but it is unnecessary. My point is that Watson's behaviorism is neither so revolutionary nor so modern as a reader unversed in history might be led to imagine and that as psychology has weathered similar proposals in the past, and, I hope and think, has benefited by the storm, so also it may weather and be benefited by this latest trial of its staunchness. The second general impression that I record is that of the logical irrelevance of Watson's program to what is currently called psychology. For suppose that that program were carried out to its last detail. How would introspective psychology be affected? Why, those who were interested in the method and results of introspection would simply start out where Watson had left off. The universalistic psychology being completed, it would be in order for the individualistic to be begun. A shift of standpoint over against the world of experience means the appearance of a new subject matter, or, more strictly, a new aspect of the common subject matter. And any one aspect has the same claim to scientific consideration as any other. Nor is there in science a congregation of the index to allow this, or to forbid that. The behaviorist may, if he will, ignore, quote, consciousness in a psychological sense. He may use consciousness as a tool without making it a special object of observation. There is none to say him nay. But why should not someone who is not a behaviorist scrutinize what he has ignored and try to find out empirically of what materials this particular tool is made? Logically, so far as I can see, behaviorism is irrelevant to introspective psychology. Materially, I believe that psychology will be furthered by it, since increased knowledge of the bodily mechanisms of anything that pertains to avariciousness system C means greater stability of certain parts of the system of psychology. Neither logically nor materially can behaviorism replace psychology. Impressions, however, must give way to closer argument. We must view Watson's articles at shorter range, and we shall, perhaps, make most progress if we begin with his pronouncements regarding the failure of experimental psychology. Psychology, we are told, has failed singly during the fifty-odd years of its existence to make good its claim as a natural science. Its present condition is chaotic. The chances are that such questions as those of the extensive attribute of auditory and the intensive attribute of visual sensations, or the differences obtaining between sensation and image, will be debated 200 years hence as inconclusively as they are debated today. Psychological method is esoteric. 
it has proved unable to grapple with such matters as imagination, judgment, reasoning, conception. These topics have simply become threadbare with much handling. Functional psychology is at fault no less than systematic and structural psychology. Only those, quote, branches of psychology which have already partially withdrawn from the parent, end quote, and which are consequently less dependent upon introspection, experimental pedagogy, the psychology of drugs, the psychology of advertising, legal psychology, the psychology of tests, and psychopathology, are vigorous growths. The complete elimination of introspection from these disciplines will make their results still more valuable and will keep them, as psychology itself empathetically is not, in touch with, quote, problems which vitally concern human interest, end quote. That, I believe, is a fair statement of Watson's position. It is given largely in his own words. I have to reply, first, that fifty-odd years is not necessarily a long period in the history of experimental science. It is not long, of course, regarded as mere duration, for it is in the sixteenth century that, quote, the physicist abandons scholastic speculation and begins to study nature in the language of experiment, end quote. While it is only in the middle of the 19th that psychology becomes experimental, it might be long in a transferred sense if it were crowded with workers, but the number of productive students in systematic, structural, and functional psychology does not compare with the number in physics or chemistry. Has Watson, I wonder, ever counted the number of experimental papers that deal with imagination, judgment, reasoning, and conception? It is notoriously difficult to trace beginnings. But we shall not have gone far wrong if we date the first overt attempts to bring these complexes under experimental control from 1902, 1901, 1908, 1903, respectively, if we say, at any rate, that their experimental study belongs to the present century, and we have already worn such topics threadbare, I should rather judge that we have hardly touched their fringe. How many decades or centuries they will engage the attention of psychologists, I do not know. The important thing is that we should do thoroughly such work upon them as can be compassed in a generation. Our descendants may ask so much of us, but we owe them nothing more. And though I also hope that two hundred years hence other questions may have replaced those of visual attributes and imaginal characters, of orientation in the rat, and of the homing sense of turns, I am far more deeply concerned to sift the materials of discussion than to hurry debate to a conclusion. There remain the succeeding branches, experimental pedagogy and the rest. In their regard, I think, the unhistorical nature of Watson's paper renders his exposition seriously misleading. It is psychology and not behaviorism that has shaped their course, and it is psychology and not behaviorism that they still look to for guidance. Moorman's lectures, for example, are offered as an introduction to experimental pedagogy and its psychological foundations. The work is penetrated with psychology. The pedagogical experiment is said to be, quote, for the most part, the psychological experiment applied to the developing and working schoolchild, end quote. But it is largely owing to Muiman that experimental pedagogy flourishes. Rivers chews the subject of his Cruenian lectures with the desire to show that experimental psychology may be of service to medicine. Stern, who stands to psychology as testimony in somewhat the same relation that Muiman bears to experimental pedagogy, is also through and through psychological. Benet, whose name is inseparably connected with the psychology of tests, might fairly be called an extremist in his devotion to introspection. 
Pick demands eine psychologische Vertiefung der Fossilera and makes constant use of laboratory material. Es ist höchste Zeit, dass die Pathologie endlich von diesen Dingen Kenntnis nimmt. It is worth noting that Muiman, Stern, and Benet, the men to whom we are chiefly indebted for experimental pedagogy, the psychology of testimony, and mental test, would all have been brushed aside by Watson a few years ago as typically introspective psychologists. And it is worth noting also that they themselves look upon this latter work not as the negation of their psychological training, but as its direct extension and practical fulfillment. It is worth noting, again, that a man of Pick's authority ascribes the unprogressive state of psychopathology in large measure to an ignorance of current introspective psychology, and himself makes definite use of the imageless thought, attitudes, and Bewusstseinslage, etc., which Watson condemns. I am not here depreciating behaviorism, but I think there is no justification for behaviorism's depreciation of psychology. In his second article, Watson discusses two topics, quote, which may seem to many to be stumbling blocks in the way of a free passage from structuralism to behaviorism, end quote. These topics one sees with some surprise are image and affection. With surprise, I say, because we had already been prepared to ignore consciousness and to eliminate introspection. It turns out, however, that the difficulty is methodological. For if the psychological counterpart of the image is cortical, then that mode of behavior which is to replace the introspective psychology of thought lies inaccessible within the skull. If, quote, affection is a mental process distinct from cognition, end quote, then affection cannot be an organic sensory experience. So image and affection have to be dealt with, and Watson deals with them faithfully. The existence of the image is denied outright, and the affection is carried willy-nilly to the periphery. Watson offers three bits of evidence for his contention that there are no centrally initiated processes. In the first place, there are experimentalists who maintain that thought processes may go on independently of imagery. In the second place, there is no objective experimental evidence of the presence of different types of imagery. In the third place, even the structuralists seek to reduce higher thought processes to groups of obscure organic processes. I think that these arguments can be met in terms almost as brief as their statement. In the first place, the view that thought is independent of imagery hardly constitutes a presumption that there are no central processes of any kind. In the second place, Fernald does not deny type, but asserts that, quote, an individual's type can be adequately indicated only by an extended statement, end quote and that is the opinion now generally held by psychologists. But let us suppose that types cannot be indicated at all. By what logical inference may we pass from this negative finding to the denial of imagery? In the third place, the reduction of thought to organic processes always implies in the background a cortical set corresponding to the Aufgabe. Watson, nevertheless, denies that there are centrally initiated processes and proposes to find the behaviorist equivalent of thought in movements, chiefly of the larynx. In the same way, he finds the behaviorist parallel of affective processes in terminants and shrinkage of the organs of sex. These views are put forward as matters of hypothesis and of personal conviction, though they are also put forward with some confidence. Time and trial will prove their value. Meanwhile, it would seem that Watson has in both cases, in the case of image as in that of affective process, overshot the logic of his position. The negative argument, as regards imagery, can never be proved in formal logic. 
to say nothing of the fact that it conflicts with a very large body of positive observation. Logical confusion is shown plainly enough in the following remark, quote, I may have to grant a few sporadic cases of imagery to him who will not be otherwise convinced, but I insist that the images of such an one are sporadic and as unnecessary to his well-being as well-thinking as a few hairs more or less on this head. End quote. If there are any images at all, then there are, on Watson's own showing, centrally initiated processes, and behaviorism is bound to take account for them. Of his personal assurance that they are unnecessary to thought is offset at once by the assurance of Watt and others that thought does in fact go on in imaginable terms. Science is concerned with empirical facts, and for the individual man of science to insist that certain facts of observation may be cancelled without loss to the science to whose subject matter they belong is to incur at the very least the charge of a certain rashness of behavior. Another logical objection seems to me to lie against Watson's procedure in this second article. All science works upon assumptions, psychology no less than the other sciences. Munsterberg, for instance, is wholly within his logical rights when he assumes that all conscious contents, without exception, may be transformed into sensations. Given his premise, they must be so transformed, behaviorism would be equally within its logical rights in assuming that all central processes may be transformed into peripheral. Given Watson's premises, they must be so transformed. But you cannot eat your cake and have it too. You may bring up facts in support of your choice of assumptions, and you may show the scientific results to which those assumptions lead. You may not, surely, offer these results, even hypothetically, as facts in proof of your assumptions. If we take up Munsterberg's position, we find nothing but sensations to work upon. But that is not evidence that Munsterberg's position is well chosen. If we take up Watson's position, we find, perhaps, laryngeal movements and changes in the state of the sex organs, but that discovery gives no logical support to the principles of his behaviorism. It is indeed obvious that if the larynx and the sex organs prove refractory, the behavioristic equivalence of image and affection must just be put, hypothetically again, somewhere else, and so on and so forth, for it is a logical consequence of the position that somewhere on the periphery the required movements and changes are to be discovered, and the periphery is complex enough to suggest any number of localizations. But the argument does not end here. I have formulated my criticisms as if Watson's views were rigorously worked out, and as if his centrally initiated processes were conceived rigorously as physiological. That is, evidently not the case. These processes are, in Watson's thought, both mental and physical. Not only are brain changes to be transformed into their equivalent peripheral changes, but the facts of psychology, as psychology is currently taken, are also to be carried, by way of behavioristic substitution, to the bodily periphery. The required peripheral changes are required by the thoughts and emotions of an introspective psychology. And with that, by definition, behaviorism has nothing to do. The confusion here is plain, and the critical point need not be further labored. I must add, however, in the same connection, that I do not understand Watson's attitude to sensation. He admits that there are special cutaneous nerves which mediate pain. He thinks that imagery is the key of the introspective stronghold. Quote, All the outer defenses might be given over to the enemy. End quote. 
These utterances seem to imply that sensation, if not part of the subject matter of behaviorism, is at least neutral ground between that and introspective psychology, whereas in an earlier article, sensation was definitely assigned to psychology. Logically, I do not see how a behaviorist, in Watson's sense, can know anything of pain. I regard sensations as introspective material on precisely the same level with images, and I should challenge the behaviorist to replace or duplicate in his universalistic terms the various observations recorded, for example, in Stump's Tonsichologische or in Herring's new Litzen. All in all, this paper on image and affection, while it is written with a truly scientific candor, shows, I think, that the author has imperfectly grasped the logic of the situation which he has himself created. In trying now to appraise Watson's proposals as a whole, we must begin by clearing them of their personal and accidental accompaniments. Watson demands a psychology, quote, which concerns itself with human life, and whose problems vitally concern human interest. He ascribes to such a psychology the practical goal of the control of behavior, the regulation and control of evolution in general, that is to say, he connects it with euthenics and eugenics. These expressions give his proposed psychology the stamp of a technology, for science goes its way without regard to human interests and without aiming to any practical goal. Science is a transcription of the world of experience from a particular standpoint, deliberately adopted at the outset and deliberately maintained. The pursuit of a practical end is the earmark of a technology. And how does that matter in the present context? It matters very greatly. Watson is asking us, in effect, to exchange a science for a technology, and that exchange is impossible, for a technology draws not upon one but upon many sciences, and draws upon many other sources than science. And so the striking of a balance sheet between a given science and a given technology is out of the question. I said above that behaviorism can never replace psychology because the scientific standpoints of the two disciplines are different. We now see that Watson's behaviorism can never replace psychology because the one is technological, the other scientific. This technological coloring, while it strengthens the emotional appeal of Watson's plea, is nevertheless not of the essence of behaviorism. The behaviorist position as we shall see, may be outlined in the plain black and white of science. The two articles are characterized again by the recurring note of hurry, of impatience. Fifty-odd years gone, and we have accomplished so little. Two hundred years, and we shall have accomplished much more? Surely it would be well to sweep the field clear, to forget the past and to start the race anew. But all reformers, I suppose are likely to be impatient, and their impatience does not affect the value of their proposed reforms. We need not regard this hurry either as of the essence of behaviorism. Watson himself, in less fervid mood, might not grudge us a little time for the study of his plans, would even recognize, I believe, that our hasty acceptance of them without due consideration, must be more dangerous than a reasonable delay. So, we come at last to behaviorism itself, and what I take that to be, I can best indicate by a parallel. In the disciplines which we call physiological psychology and psychophysiology, we are interested, with slight difference of emphasis, in the two aspects of certain phenomena of living organisms, we see to couple physiological with psychological, psychological with physiological, and so to get a complete description of the psychophysical. We may now, in just the same way, speak of biological psychology and of psychobiology, 
indeed, those terms are already in use, and their general significance is plain. But here is the context to which behaviorism, if I understand it all right, must of necessity belong. It is the biological side of a biological psychology or of a psychobiology. I cannot make it more, and I do not think that its practitioners can make it less. The argument is as follows. The behaviorist, as Watson describes him, also studies certain phenomena of the living organism. In theory, he may study these phenomena in either of two different ways. He may regard them as phenomena simply as last facts, as things given, as phenomena to be taken at their face value and described and explained in their own right, then he is working in what we are accustomed to call biology. He has adopted no new standpoint and needs no new name. Or, again, he may regard them as symptomatic, as reporting, expressing, indicating, leading up to something beyond themselves, as claiming detailed study, not only in their own right as a data of biology, but also because of this further and specific character of report or expression. Here is ground for a discipline other than biology. A novel point of view has been attained. At once, however, the question arises, what then is it that the phenomenon report or express? Of what are they symptomatic? The answer seems obvious. They are symptomatic of behavior, and the answer seems satisfactory until we remember that the phenomenon, by hypothesis, are behavior, behavior material, behavior data, and that a phenomenon cannot both be and be a symptom of the same thing. I see no way out of this dilemma. Either the behaviorist is just a biologist, and in that case he has no nearer relation to psychology than have his co-workers who are content to call themselves biologists, or the behaviorist sees expression where the biologist sees ultimate fact, and in that case he may equally well be called psychobiologist, seeing that the phenomena expressed or reported by the organic changes which he studies cannot be anything else than psychical. But if this conclusion is sound, it means two things. It means that behaviorism is correlated with a psychology, with some sort of psychology in the usual sense, and it means that behaviorism must take account of all kinds of organic changes, and not merely of those occurring at the periphery. I believe that both of these consequences must be accepted. Consider again, for example, Watson's reduction of thought to delicate movements of the larynx. Those movements are movements of incipient or vestigial articulation. But words, as Watson seems to have forgotten, are also meanings, and meanings take us either to the nervous system or to psychology. They take us, in fact, to both. Moreover, the very problem of these laryngeal movements is given to the behaviorist by psychology. How would he have lighted on the idea of transforming thought into movement unless psychology had made him acquainted with thought? I do not say that the incentive will come always or must necessarily come from the psychological side. There will be give and take. But it is nonetheless clear that behaviorism and psychology are, in this context, correlative, and that, though an individual student may wisely and successfully confine himself to the study of behavior, yes, and may all his life maintain a polemical attitude to psychology proper, it is yet impossible to have a science of behaviorism independent of all psychology. It is equally impossible, of course, within the same context of psychobiology, to have an independent science of psychology. The two halves are essential to the single whole, and the psychology of the behaviorist will, in matters of selection, emphasis, arrangement, terminology, perspective, 
differ from general psychology just as behaviorism itself differs from general biology. We thus conclude that, to say, as was said above, quote, psychology would begin where a completed behaviorism left off, end quote, is really to say too little. The psychology, which is correlated with behaviorism, begins when behaviorism begins, and the fortunes of the two are bound up in the same bundle. Psychobiology will run the same course as psychophysiology and psychophysics. It is now, I suppose, in its first phase, when pioneer work brings in gross and tangible returns. Next will come the period of revision, of elaboration of details, a period of discouragement, perhaps, as the former was a period of elation, and then will follow the period of slow and steady progress, varied by a certain amount of wholesome interruption. Meanwhile, introspective psychology, which is now entering upon this third stage of its scientific career, will go quietly about its task, wishing the new movement all success, but declining, with the mild persistence natural to matters of fact, either to be eliminated or to be ignored. End of On Psychology as the Behaviorist Views It by Edward B. Titchener Social Devices for Impelling Women to Bear and Rear Children This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Social Devices for Impelling Women to Bear and Rear Children by Lita S. Hollingworth, 1916, Bellevue Hospital, New York City. First published in American Journal of Sociology, Volume 22, pages 19 to 29. Quote, Again, the breeding function of the family would be better discharged if public opinion and religion conspired, as they have until recently, to crush the aspirations of woman for a life of her own. But the gain would not be worth the price. E. A. Ross, Social Control, 1904. In this quotation from Ross, we have suggested to us an exceedingly important and interesting phase of social control, namely, the control by those in social power over those individuals who alone can bring forth the human young, and thus perpetuate society. It is necessary that at the very outset of this discussion we should consent to clear our minds of the sentimental conception of motherhood and to look at facts. Sumner, footnote, W. G. Sumner, Folkways, 1906, and footnote states these facts as well as they have ever been stated, in his consideration of the natural burdens of society. He says, quote, Children add to the weight of the struggle for existence of their parents. The relation of parent to child is one of sacrifice. The interests of parents and children are antagonistic. The fact that there are or may be compensations does not affect the primary relation between the two. It may well be believed that, if procreation had not been put under the dominion of a great passion, it would have been caused to cease by the burdens it entails. End quote. This is especially true in the case of mothers. The fact is that childbearing is in many respects analogous to the work of soldiers. It is necessary for tribal or national existence, it means great sacrifice of personal advantage, it involves danger and suffering, and in a certain percentage of cases, the actual loss of life. Thus we should expect that there would be a continuous social effort to ensure the group interest in respect to population, just as there is a continuous social effort to ensure the defense of our nation in time of war. It is clear indeed that the social devices employed to get children born and to get soldiers slain are in many respects similar. But once the young are brought into the world, they still must be reared, if society's ends are to be served, and here again the need for and exercise of social control may be seen. 
since the period of helpless infancy is very prolonged in the human species, and since the care of infants is an onerous and exacting labor, it would be natural for all persons not biologically attached to infants to use all possible devices for fastening the whole burden of infant tending upon those who are so attached. We should expect this to happen, and we shall see, in fact, that there has been consistent social effort to establish as a norm the woman whose vocational proclivities are completely and naturally satisfied by child-bearing and child-rearing with the related domestic activities. There is, to be sure, a strong and fervid insistence on the maternal instinct, which is popularly supposed to characterize all women equally, and to furnish them with an all-consuming desire for parenthood, regardless of the personal pain, sacrifice, and disadvantage involved. In the absence of all verifiable data, however, it is only common sense to guard against accepting as a fact of human nature a doctrine which we might well expect to find in use as a means of social control. Since we possess no scientific data at all on this phase of human psychology, the most reasonable assumption is that if it were possible to obtain a quantitative measurement of maternal instinct, we should find this trait distributed among women, just as we have found all other traits distributed which have yielded to quantitative measurement. It is most reasonable to assume that we should obtain a curve of distribution, varying from an extreme where individuals have zero or negative interest in caring for infants, through a mode where there is a moderate amount of impulse to such duties, to an extreme where the only vocational or personal interest lies in maternal activities. The facts, shorn of sentiment, then, are, 1. The bearing and rearing of children is necessary for tribal or national existence and aggrandizement. 2. The bearing and rearing of children is painful, dangerous to life, and involves long years of exacting labor and self-sacrifice. 3. There is no verifiable evidence to show that a maternal instinct exists in women of such all-consuming strength and fervor as to impel them voluntarily to seek the pain, danger, and exacting labor involved in maintaining a high birth rate. We should expect, therefore, that those in control of society would invent and employ devices for impelling women to maintain a birth rate sufficient to ensure enough increase in the population to offset the wastage of war and disease. It is the purpose of this paper to cite specific illustrations to show just how the various social institutions have been brought to bear on women to this end. Ross has classified the means which society takes and has taken to secure order, and ensure that individuals will act in such a way as to promote the interests of the group, as those interests are conceived by those who form, quote, the radiant points of social control, end quote. These means, according to the analysis of Ross, are public opinion, law, belief, social suggestion, education, custom, social religion, personal ideals, the type, art, personality, enlightenment, illusion, and social valuation. Let us see how some of these means have been applied in the control of women. Personal Ideals, the Type The first means of control to which I wish to call attention in the present connection is that which Ross calls personal ideals. It is pointed out that, quote, a developed society presents itself as a system of unlike individuals strenuously pursuing their personal ends, end quote. Now, for each person there is a, quote, certain zone of requirement, end quote, and since, quote, altruism is quite incompetent to hold each unswervingly to the particular activities and forbearances belonging to his place in the social system, end quote, the development of such allegiance must be, quote, effected by means of types or patterns, which society induces its members to adopt as their guiding ideals. To this end are elaborated various patterns of conduct and of character, which may be termed social types. These types may become in the course of time personal ideals, each for that category of persons for which it is intended. End quote. For women, obviously enough, the first and most primitive zone of requirement is and has been to produce and rear families large enough to admit of national warfare being carried on 
and of colonization. Thus has been evolved the social type of the womanly woman, the normal woman, the chief criterion of normality being a willingness to engage enthusiastically in maternal and allied activities. All those classes and professions which form the radiant points of social control unite upon this criterion. Men of science announce it with calm assurance, though failing to say on what kind or amount of scientific data they base their remarks. For instance, McDougall, footnote, W. McDougall, Social Psychology, 1908, and footnote, writes, quote, the highest stage is reached by those species in which each female produces at birth but one or two young, and protects them so efficiently that most of the young born reach maturity. The maintenance of the species thus becomes in the main the work of the parental instinct. In such species the protection and cherishing of the young is the constant and all-absorbing occupation of the mother, to which she devotes all her energies, and in the course of which she will at any time undergo privation, pain, and death. The instinct, maternal instinct, becomes more powerful than any other, and can override any other, even fear itself. End quote. Professor Jastro, footnote, J. Jastro, Character and Temperament, 1915, end footnote, writes, quote, Charm is the technique of the maiden, and sacrifice the passion of the mother. One set of feminine interests expresses more distinctly the issues of courtship and attraction, the other of qualities of motherhood and devotion. End quote. The medical profession insistently proclaims desire for numerous children as the criterion of normality for women, scornfully branding those so ill-advised as to deny such desires as abnormal. As one example among thousands of such attempts at social control, let me quote the following, which appeared in a New York newspaper on November 29, 1915. Quote, Only abnormal women want no babies. Trenchant criticism of modern life was made by Dr. Max G. Schlapp, internationally known as a neurologist. Dr. Schlapp addressed his remarks to the congregation of the Park Avenue M.E. Church. He said, the birth rate is falling off, rich people are the ones who have no children, and the poor have the greatest number of offspring. Any woman who does not desire offspring is abnormal. We have a large number, particularly among the women, who do not want children. Our social society is becoming intensely unstable. End quote. And this from the New York Times, September 5, 1915, quote, Normally, woman lives through her children, man lives through his work. End quote. Scores of such implicit attempts to determine and present the type or norm meet us on every hand. This norm has the sanction of authority, being announced by men of greatest prestige in the community. No one wishes to be regarded by her fellow creatures as abnormal or decayed. The stream of suggestions playing from all points inevitably has its influence so that it is or was, until recently, well nigh impossible to find a married woman who would admit any conflicting interests equal or paramount to the interest of caring for children. There is a universal refusal to admit that the maternal instinct, like every other trait of human nature, might be distributed according to the probability curve. Public Opinion let us turn next to public opinion as a means of control over women in relation to the birth rate. In speaking of public opinion, Ross says, quote, Haman is at the mercy of Mordecai. Rarely can one regard his deed as fair when others find it foul, or count himself a hero when the world deems him a wretch. For the mass of men, the blame and the praise of the community are the very lords of life, end quote. If we inquire now what are the organs or media of expression of public opinion, we shall see how it is brought to bear on women. The newspapers are perhaps the chief agents in modern times in the formation of public opinion, and their columns abound in interviews with the eminent deploring the decay of the population. Magazines print articles based on statistics of depopulation, appealing to the patriotism of women. In the year just past, 55 articles on the birth rate have chanced to come to the notice of the present writer. 
54 were written by men, including editors, statesmen, educators, ex-presidents, etc. Only one was written by a woman. The following quotation is illustrative of the trend of all of them. Quote, M. Emile Raymond has made this melancholy announcement in the Senate. We are living in an age when women have pronounced upon themselves a judgment that is dangerous in the highest degree to the development of the population. We have the right to do what we will with the life that is in us, they say. End quote. Thus the desire for the development of interests and aptitudes other than the maternal is stigmatized as dangerous, melancholy, degrading, abnormal, indicative of decay. On the other hand, excessive maternity receives many cheap but effective rewards. For example, the Jesuit priests hold special meetings to laud maternity. The German Kaiser announces that he will now be godfather to seventh, eighth, and ninth sons, even if daughters intervene. The ex-president has written a letter of congratulation to the mother of nine. Law since its beginning as a human institution, law has been a powerful instrument for the control of women. The subjection of women was originally an irrational consequence of sex differences in reproductive function. It was not intended by either men or women, but simply resulted from the natural physiological handicaps of women, and the attempts of humanity to adapt itself to physiological nature through the crude methods of trial and error. When law was formulated, this subjection was defined, and thus furthered. It would take too long to cite all the legal provisions that contribute indirectly to keep women from developing individualistic interests and capacities. Among the most important indirect forces in law which affect women to keep them child-bearers and child-rearers only are those provisions that tend to restrain them from possessing and controlling property, such provisions have made of women a comparatively possessionless class, and have thus deprived them of the fundamentals of power. While affirming the essential nature of woman to be satisfied with maternity and with maternal duties only, society has always taken every precaution to close the avenues to ways of escape therefrom. Two legal provisions which bear directly on women to compel them to keep up the birth rate may be mentioned here. The first of these is the provision whereby sterility in the wife may be made a cause of divorce. This would be a powerful inducement to women who loved their husbands to bear children if they could. The second provision is that which forbids the communication of the data of science in the matter of the means of birth control. The American laws are very drastic on this point. Recently in New York City a man was sentenced to prison for violating this law. The more advanced democratic nations have ceased to practice military conscription. They no longer conscript their men to bear arms, depending on the volunteer army. But they conscript their women to bear children by legally prohibiting the publication or communication of the knowledge which would make childbearing voluntary. Child-rearing is also legally insured by those provisions which forbid and punish abortion, infanticide, and infant desertion. There could be no better proof of the insufficiency of maternal instinct as a guarantee of population than the drastic laws which we have against birth control, abortion, infanticide, and infant desertion. Belief. Belief, quote, which controls the hidden portions of life, end quote, has been used powerfully in the interests of population. Orthodox women, for example, regard family limitation as a sin, punishable in the hereafter. Few explicit exhortations concerning the birth rate are discoverable in the various words of God. The belief that family limitation will be punished in the hereafter seems to have been evolved mainly by priests out of the slender materials of a few quotations from Holy Writ, such as, quote, God said unto them, Multiply and replenish the earth, end quote and from the scriptural allusion to children as the gifts of God. Being gifts of God, it follows that they may not be refused, except at the peril of incurring God's displeasure. Education. The education of women has always, until the end of the nineteenth century, 
been limited to such matters as would become a creature who could and should have no aspirations for a life of her own. We find the proper education for girls outlined in the writings of such educators as Rousseau, Fenelon, St. Jerome, and in Godey's Ladies' Book. Not only have the social guardians used education as a negative means of control, by failing to provide any real enlightenment for women, but education has been made a positive instrument for control. This was accomplished by drilling into the young and unformed mind, while it yet was too immature to reason independently, such facts and notions as would give the girl a conception of herself only as future wife and mother. Rousseau, for instance, demanded freedom and individual liberty of development for everybody except Sophia, who was to be deliberately trained up as a means to an end. In the latter half of the nineteenth century, when the hard battle for the real enlightenment of women was being fought, one of the most frequently recurring objections to admitting women to knowledge was that the population would suffer, the essential nature of woman would be changed, the family would decay, and the birth rate would fall. Those in control of society yielded up the old prescribed education of women only after a stubborn struggle, realizing that with the passing of the old training an important means of social control was slipping out of their hands. Art. A very long paper might be written to describe the various uses to which art has been put in holding up the ideal of motherhood. The mother, with children at her breast, is the favorite theme of artists. The galleries of Europe are hung full of Madonnas of every age and degree. Poetry abounds in allusions to the sacredness and charm of motherhood, depicting the yearning of the adult for his mother's knee. Fiction is replete with happy and adoring mothers. Thousands of songs are written and sung concerning the ideal relation which exists between mother and child. In pursuing the mother-child theme through art, one would not be led to suspect that society finds it necessary to make laws against contraception, infanticide, abortion, and infant desertion. Art holds up to view only the compensations of motherhood, leaving the other half of the theme in obscurity, and thus acting as a subtle ally of population. Illusion This is the last of Ross's categories to which I wish to refer. Ross says, quote, in the taming of men there must be provided coil after coil to entangle the unruly one. Mankind must use snares as well as leading strings, will-o'-the-wisps as well as lanterns. The truth by all means if it will promote obedience, but in any case obedience. We shall examine not creeds now, but the films, veils, hidden mirrors, and half-lights by which men are duped as to that which lies nearest them, their own experience. This time we shall see men led captive, not by dogmas concerning a world beyond experience, but by artfully fostered misconceptions of the pains, satisfactions, and values lying under their very noses. End quote. One of the most effective ways of creating the desired illusion about any matter is by concealing and tabooing the mention of all the painful and disagreeable circumstances connected with it. Thus there is a very stern social taboo on conversation about the processes of birth. The utmost care is taken to conceal the agonies and risks of childbirth from the young. Announcement is rarely made of the true cause of deaths from childbirth. The statistics of maternal mortality have been neglected by departments of health, and the few compilations which have been made have not achieved any wide publicity or popular discussion says Catherine Anthony, in her recent book on Feminism in Germany and Scandinavia, 1915, quote, There is no evidence that the death rate of women from childbirth has caused the governing classes many sleepless nights. End quote. Anthony gives some statistics from Prussia, where the figures have been calculated, showing that, quote, Between 1891 and 1900, 11% of the deaths of all women between the age of 25 and 40 years occurred in childbirth. During 40 years of peace, Germany lost 400,000 mothers' lives, that is, ten times what she lost in soldiers' lives in the campaign of 1870 and 1871. End quote. 
Such facts would be of wide public interest, especially to women, yet there is no tendency at all to spread them broadcast or to make propaganda of them. Public attention is constantly being called to the statistics of infant mortality, but the statistics of maternal mortality are neglected and suppressed. The pains, the dangers, and risks of childbearing are tabooed as subjects of conversation. The drudgery, the monotonous labor, and other disagreeable features of child-rearing are minimized by the social guardians. On the other hand, the joys and compensations of motherhood are magnified and presented to consciousness on every hand. Thus the tendency is to create an illusion whereby motherhood will appear to consist of compensations only, and thus come to be desired by those for whom the illusion is intended. There is one further class of devices for controlling women that does not seem to fit any of the categories mentioned by Ross. I refer to threats of evil consequence to those who refrain from childbearing. This class of social devices I shall call bugaboos. Medical men have done much to help population, and at the same time to increase obstetrical practice, by inventing bugaboos. For example, it is frequently stated by medical men, and is quite generally believed by women, that if first childbirth is delayed until the age of thirty years, the pains and dangers of the process will be very gravely increased, and that therefore women will find it advantageous to begin bearing children early in life. It is added that the younger the woman begins to bear, the less suffering will be experienced. One looks in vain, however, for any objective evidence that such is the case. The statements appear to be founded on no array of facts whatever, and until they are so founded, they lie under the suspicion of being merely devices for social control. One also reads that women who bear children live longer on the average than those who do not, which is taken to mean that childbearing has a favorable influence on longevity. It may well be that women who bear many children live longer than those who do not, but the only implication probably is that those women who could not endure the strain of repeated births die young, and thus naturally did not have many children. The facts may indeed be as above stated, and yet childbearing may be distinctly prejudicial to longevity. A third bugaboo is that if a child is reared alone, without brothers and sisters, he will grow up selfish, egotistic, and an undesirable citizen. Figures are, however, so far lacking to show the disastrous consequences of being an only child. From these brief instances, it seems very clear that the social guardians have not really believed that maternal instinct is alone a sufficient guarantee of population. They have made use of all possible social devices to ensure not only child-bearing, but child-rearing. Belief, law, public opinion, illusion, education, art, and bugaboos have all been used to reinforce maternal instinct. We shall never know just how much maternal instinct alone will do for population until all the forces and influence exemplified above have become inoperative. As soon as women become fully conscious of the fact that they have been and are controlled by these devices, the latter will become useless, and we shall get a truer measure of maternal feeling. One who learns why society is urging him into the straight and narrow way will resist its pressure one who sees clearly how he is controlled, will thenceforth be emancipated. To betray the secrets of ascendancy is to forearm the individual in his struggle with society. The time is coming, and is indeed almost at hand, when all the most intelligent women of the community, who are the most desirable child-bearers, will become conscious of the methods of social control. The type of normality will be questioned, the laws will be replaced and changed, enlightenment will prevail, belief will be seen to rest upon dogmas, illusion will fade away and give place to clearness of view, the bugaboos will lose their power to frighten. How will the social guardians induce women to bear a surplus population when all these cheap, effective methods no longer work? The natural desire for children may, and probably will, always guarantee a stationary population, even if childbearing should become a voluntary matter. 
but if a surplus population is desired for national aggrandizement, it would seem that there will remain but one effective social device whereby this can be secured, namely, adequate compensation, either in money or in fame. If it were possible to become rich or famous by bearing numerous fine children, many a woman would no doubt be eager to bring up eight or ten, though if acting at the dictation of maternal instinct only, she would have brought up but one or two. When the cheap devices no longer work, we shall expect expensive devices to replace them, if the same result is still desired by the governors of society. If these matters could be clearly raised to consciousness, so that this aspect of human life could be managed rationally, instead of irrationally as at present, the social gain would be enormous, assuming always that the increased happiness and usefulness of women would, in general, be regarded as social gain. End of Social Devices for Impelling Women to Bear and Rear Children Recording by Tricia G. Scientific Truth and the Scientific Spirit This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Avai in October 2010. Scientific Truth and the Scientific Spirit by James Gibson Hume, University of Toronto. First published in University of Toronto Monthly, number 16, pages 443 to 445. In Science, March 31, 1916, appears an article by Professor A. B. McCullum on Scientific Truth and the Scientific Spirit, a summary of an address at the annual dinner of the Columbia Biochemical Association. After tactfully referring to the part played by Canadians in 1861 in assisting in the struggle against slavery and the present effort of Canadians on behalf of liberty, he turns to the forces that should bring men together in peaceful cooperation, among these preeminently scientific truth and the scientific spirit. He then shows his versatility by discussing truth and the method of its discovery from the angle of the history of science and the discussions of the two contending schools of philosophy at the present time, the pragmatists and their opponents, whom he describes as believing in an absolute, Quote, absolved from all limitations of time and capable of all that we can conceive and more. End quote. It soon appears that Dr. McCallum enrolls himself as an enthusiastic admirer of the pragmatic school. He traces its rise and its affinities with historical, empirical, and experimental methods in science. The point of emphasis is laid on the progressive character of the discovery of truth and the danger of a dogmatic assumption of complete knowledge. He lays the blame for the persecutions of the Middle Ages at the door of the school of the absolute of that time. A brief sketch of the rise and growth of the science of biochemistry, with a fine statement of the aims and ideals and aspirations of science in general, completes a very interesting and suggestive article. Comment it is not at all surprising that the statement philosophical principles and methods by William James should appeal to a biochemist. James was first of all trained in biology, physiology and medicine and was a teacher in that field before turning to psychology and later to philosophical construction. He therefore had an intimate acquaintance with and sympathy for the work in biology and understood its problems and difficulties and methods. But it is not so evident why Dr. McCallum should follow with such an implicit trust the pragmatists in their misunderstanding amounting to misrepresentation of their philosophical opponents, charging them with a preposterous view of the absolute that comes with it the supposition that any knowledge of any kind and to any degree of an absolute is the belief in an alleged absolute knowledge or complete knowledge. Dr. McCallum then naturally concludes that the pragmatists allow for progress in science, 
whereas the anti-pragmatists deny such progressiveness, being already at their goal. The injustice of this interpretation may be easily demonstrated. The list of absolutists given by Dr. McCallum includes the following names. Green, Caird, Bosanke, Bradley and Royce. Until recently these men were frequently referred to as Neo-Hegelians and Hegel was supposed to be the arch-offender in absolutism. Now the truth is that just a half century before Darwin wrote his epoch-making Origin of Species, Hegel had written his Philosophy of History, etc., and had enunciated the theory of development and applied it to the interpretation of human civilization. The naturalistic philosophical view of evolution in Darwin and the previously announced idealistic philosophical view of development in Hegel are identical in so far as the belief in progressiveness is concerned. Indeed, both had the same tendency to make almost a fetish of this feature of progressiveness, so that to some of their disciples in each case, progressiveness appeared as something inevitable. The view of William James corrects this inevitableness in the Darwinian evolution, representing it on the contrary as conditional, and in the case of human progressiveness dependent on human volition and human effort. But curiously enough, the Neo-Hegelians had gone in ahead on this very point. Green's masterly treatment of the human will in his Prolegomena to Ethics issues in a similar emendation of the Hegelian inevitableness making human progressiveness dependent on human volitional effort. With the possible exception of Bradley, we might show that each one of the other writers, censored for lack of admission of progress, wrote to prove the contrary. Take for instance the work by Caird on The Evolution of Religion Among the Greeks. It is indeed a revelation to find the earlier rationalists guilty for the persecutions in the Middle Ages. We had supposed these were due to the school of the anti-rationalists who desired to accelerate the will to believe. Dr. McCallum has had a preliminary training for philosophical construction similar to that possessed by John Locke and by William James, but with a more extended study of physiological science, and we should welcome further philosophical ventures on this part. As he had nailed to the mast the flag of progressiveness, it is not unlikely that he may yet, while extending his pragmatic views, allow a more charitable interpretation to be put on the views and methods of the constructive idealists. End of Scientific Truth and the Scientific Spirit Is thinking merely the action of language mechanisms? This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mark Kutosh. Is Thinking Merely the Action of Language Mechanisms? by John B. Watson. Footnote. A contribution to the symposium presented at the Congress of Philosophy in Oxford, 24th to 27th of September, 1920. The writer had not the opportunity of seeing the preceding contribution to the symposium. End footnote. First published in British Journal of Psychology, 11, pages 87 to 104. Contents. 1. A correction of statement. 2. More comprehensive use of the term thinking demanded. 3. Illustration of thinking may divert. 4. Behaviorists' right to assume that a process of implicit thinking goes on. 5. Further elaboration of the process of thinking. Some objections reviewed. 6. Conceptual thinking really a fallacy. 7. Meaning an experimental problem and not a problem of philosophy or of speculative psychology. 8. Conclusions. 1. A correction of statement. Before attempting to define further in this symposium the behaviorist's position on thinking, it would seem best to discuss for a moment some of the statements the behaviorist has already made. In advance of any argument, I think we can say that he has never really held the view that thinking is merely the action of language mechanisms. Possibly, my own loose way of writing may have lent colour to such a view. I frankly admit 
that in a number of paragraphs in a recent book, I may justly be accused of having given an affirmative answer to the question before the symposium. I can only make the well-worn excuse that my overemphasis was indulged in for the sake of sharpness of presentation before elementary students. In psychology, we can rarely make a complete observation of everything that a human being does at any one moment, and, in giving an account of what happens, we emphasize those points which the experiment was designed best to bring out. This is what I meant to do in my previous discussion of thinking. I gladly amend any statement I may hitherto have made as follows. A whole man thinks with his whole body, in each and in every part. If he is mutilated, or if his organs are defective or lacking, he thinks with the remaining parts left in his care, but surely he does everything else in exactly the same way. If one studies a game of tennis, one's observation is taken up with the type of strokes the player makes, his serve, his returns, the way he covers the court, etc. In other words, arm and leg activities are principally emphasized. However, everyone admits that the player is using every cell in his body during the game. Nevertheless, if we sever a small group of muscles in his right arm, his playing is reduced practically to that of a novice. Footnote. There remains to the player, of course, a large organization. His verbal organization especially is left intact, as is the training his eyes have received. He's able to act as umpire, to pass judgment upon playing, write manuals on the structure of the game, etc. Probably he could learn to play with his left hand much more rapidly than a poor player who had suffered a similar loss, in view of the fact that his leg and trunk organization is relatively intact. End footnote. This illustration serves us very well in explaining why one emphasizes laryngeal processes in thinking. Surely we know that the deaf and dumb use no such laryngeal processes, nor does the individual whose larynx has been removed. Other bodily processes have to take on the function of the larynx. Such functions are usually usurped by the fingers, hands, arms, facial muscles, muscles of the head, etc. I have, in another place, emphasize the extent to which finger and hand movements are used by the deaf and dumb when they are engaged in silent thinking. Mr. Thompson, in his paper before the symposium, seems more or less to subscribe to the same view. It would be an easy experiment, but so far as I know not hitherto tried, to bind the fingers and arms of such an individual and then give him a problem in arithmetic, memorizing simple stanzas and the like, which have to be worked out without exteroceptive aid. It would be necessary, probably, to tie down eye movements, were such a thing possible, and to restrain even the head and intercostal muscles. While there is no sacrosanct reason why thinking should go on in normal individuals, in the muscular fields of the larynx and throat, there are two very practical ones. There is first the genetic fact that, from childhood onwards, organisation has been forced in the direction of language activity. From the third or fourth year onwards, probably a thousand language adjustments are made to one manual adjustment. There is, too, a biological reason. This arises from the fact that the human being, in his early struggles for existence, had to have an undivided use of arm, finger and hand musculature when hunting and fighting. If he had had to employ the large muscles in thinking, as I am convinced deaf mutes do, manual activity would have been interfered with at critical times, I have never had the opportunity of observing deaf mutes in a fight or in a critical situation where both thinking and delicate action of the manual type were demanded. 2. More comprehensive use of the term thinking demanded. The question is often asked what marks off thinking from the mere sub-vocal unwinding of well-organized language habits. Mr. Bartlett and Ms. Smith have brought out this question explicitly and have formulated an answer which is not satisfactory to me. I think we ought to make the term thinking cover generally all implicit language activity and other activities substitutable for language activity. It should be admitted furthermore that under proper stimulation parentheses, usually a request is sufficient end parentheses, the subject can be made to think aloud. Thinking would comprise then the subvocal use of any language or related material whatever, such as the implicit repetition of poetry, daydreaming, rephrasing word processes in logical terms, running over the day's events verbally, as well as implicit planning for the morrow, and the verbal working out of difficult life situations. The term verbal here must be made broad enough to cover processes substitutable for verbal activity, such as the shrug of the shoulder and the lifting of the brows. It must embrace the implicit movements involved in written words, or the implicit movements demanded in the use of the deaf and dumb sign manual, which are, in essence, 
word activity. Thinking, then, might become our general term to cover all subvocal behavior. It is obvious that this definition can take care of most of the mechanical and deeply grounded of our language habits, such as those used in the subvocal repetition of childhood verse, the repetition of stanzas of poetry, limericks, etc. Those depending more particularly upon emotional stimuli as daydreaming, as well as those verbal processes not completely habitual, such as the working out of a lecture, the planning of a book, and finally, those in which new results are brought out. It is clear that, if in the interests of systematic psychology we need to subdivide the whole process of thinking, three lines of cleavage will at once appear. 1. Mere unwinding of vocal habits, where the word sequences are invariable, illustrated by Himes, quotations, by many of the responses in mathematics, as 2 and 2 equal 4, square root of 9 equals 3, and the like. Here there is no new work, no trial movements like those we see in overt manual activity when a new situation capable of solution is presented the first few times. Such thinking corresponds to an extremely simple stimulus and response type of behaviour. Similarly, daydreaming would fall under this division. We assume that such dreaming takes place in response particularly to deficiency stimuli of one kind or another, such as the absence of sex activity, lack of food and water, lack of habitual surroundings and companions, lack of drugs or even under the sway of drugs. 2. The solving of problems which are not new, but which are so infrequently met with that trial verbal behaviour is demanded, illustrated probably by thinking out of stanzas partially forgotten, in trying to apply one mathematical formula after another in a particular problem at hand. All of the part processes have been met with by the individual and a part of his organisation, but he cannot use these part processes with machine-like facility. 3. Finally we have the extreme extension of two above. Here the problem is new, and the organism, when confronting such a problem, is in a grave situation. We will suppose, for example, that a man loses his position and wealth suddenly, and must be ready, in a few hours, to act explicitly in a new undertaking. The problem, it is assumed, is of such a character that it must be worked out verbally before any overt action can take place. Hundreds of examples of this type immediately suggest themselves. Most of the real social and moral problems appearing in one's life are exactly of this type. Footnote. I am rather startled by the fact that all of the writers in the symposium seem to find some confusion in my use of the term habit. They maintain that I apparently imply by the term a fixed or invariable chain of responses. Of course, there are a few such invariable sequences in every human being, but the number is not large. When used in this sense, I quite agree with them that it is opposed to thinking, if we mean by thinking, the solving of problems such as those indicated in my third division. I have generally made the term habit coextensive with that part of an individual's organism which is not hereditary, but surely in all learning there is a display of previous organization, of habits, parenthesis, and hereditary activity, end parenthesis, most closely connected with the type of situation confronting the learner. No single response already learned, parenthesis habit, end parenthesis, will bring about the present adjustment. There must be a recombination. But the partial habits forming the new whole adjustments, be they laryngeal or manual, have each had a history, and their origin can often be traced. End footnote. These subdivisions are really guesses as to what may go on. No scientific division is as yet possible. It should be expressly stated furthermore that thinking in any of the above forms is not an isolated process. A human animal never gets away from his biography and the varying organic and emotional states the organism is in must exert a tremendous influence upon the course of his thinking, so that once more we would emphasize the fact that thinking, whatever its type, is an integrated bodily process. Probably not many of my colleagues would include one and two under the term thinking. Thinking has come to be identified with three of our division, but for no valid reason. We use the term manual activity when our subject ties his shoestrings, in exactly the way we use it when he is learning to manipulate, parenthesis, for the first time, end parenthesis, the most complicated of machine gun mechanisms. In our opinion, three represents a bit of behavior on the part of the human animal, which, when stripped of its unessentials, is exactly like that bit of behavior which the rat exhibits when put into a complicated maze for the first time. When it gets to the food, the autonomic strivings die down, 
and it goes to sleep. The deficiency stimuli, lack of food, lack of usual surroundings, etc., cease to operate. The adjustment is complete. Surely a similar thing takes place in man. He works verbally, parentheses, that is, particularly verbally. Many other processes go on, of course, such as wrinkling the brow, tearing the hair, etc., end parentheses, until certain verbal acts, in parentheses, conclusions, end parentheses, are executed. If, when this conclusion is reached, the driving stimuli, parentheses, verbal, autonomic, emotional, etc., end parentheses, cease to operate, the adjustment has been completed. 3. Illustration of thinking made overt. The present writer has often felt that a good deal more can be learned about the psychology of thinking by making subjects think aloud about definite problems than by trusting to the unscientific method of introspection. Usually a scientific man is quite willing to enter into the experiment with zest. If I ask my subject in one to think aloud, he overtly responds with his limerick, his daydreaming or his mathematical answer. Similarly, if I ask him to think aloud in two, I notice hesitations here and there, full starts and occasional returns, but in general, a fairly ready response occurs with relatively few errors. It is only when we ask him to think aloud in three above that we begin to grasp how relatively crude is the process of thinking. Here we see typified all of the errors made by the rat in the maze. False starts appear, emotional factors show themselves, such as the hanging of the head, and possibly even blushing when a false scent is followed up. The subject returns again and again to his starting point, as shown by his asking, quote, You say the given facts are so-and-so, end quote. The experimenter says, quote, Yes, end quote, and again the subject starts off. In conducting an experiment of this kind, one has to be careful to impose problems upon his subject which are as far as possible removed from repressed emotional factors. It is never possible, of course, completely to do this, as the analysts have more than once pointed out. The following illustration will make clear some of the points which appear in overt thinking. A colleague of mine came on a visit to stay in an apartment in which I had rooms. In a passage leading from the shower bath was a peculiar piece of apparatus standing near a sink. The essential features were a curved shallow nickel pan, about 12 inches wide by 20 inches long. At one end the pan had been bent in, in the form of a half circle, while at the other end the side pieces did not extend for the full width. The pan was mounted on a stand, adjustable in height. Furthermore, the pan itself was attached to the stand by a ball and socket joint. My friend had never seen anything like it, and asked me what in the world it was. I told him I was writing a paper on thinking, and pleaded with him to think of his problem out loud. He entered into the experiment in the proper spirit. I shall not record all of his full starts and returns, but I will sketch a few of them. Quote, the thing looks a little like an invalid's table, but it is not heavy. The pan is curved, it has side pieces, and is attached with a ball and socket joint. It would never hold a tray full of dishes. Parenthesis, cul-de-sac, end parenthesis. The thing, parenthesis, return to starting point, end parenthesis, looks like some of the failures of an inventor. I wonder if the landlord is an inventor. No, you told me he was a porter in one of the big banks downtown. The fellow is as big as a house, and looks more like a prize fighter than a mechanician. Those paws of his would never do the work demanded of an inventor. End quote, parenthesis, blank wall again, end parenthesis. This was as far as we got on the first day. On the second morning, we got no nearer the solution. On the second night, we talked over the way the porter and his wife lived, and the subject wondered how a man earning not more than $150 per month could live as our landlord did. I told him that his wife was a hairdresser, and earned about $8 per day herself. Then I asked him if he did not see the sign, hairdresser, on the door we entered. The next morning, after coming from his bath, he said, quote, I saw that infernal thing again, end quote. Parenthesis, original starting point, end parenthesis. Quote, it must be something to use in washing or weighing the baby, but they have no baby, parenthesis, cul-de-sac again, end parenthesis. The thing is curved at one end, so that it would just fit a person's neck. Ah, I have it, the curve does fit the neck. The woman you say is a hairdresser, and the pan goes against the neck, and the hair is spread out over it, end quote. This was the correct conclusion. Upon reaching it, there was a smile, a sigh, and an immediate turn to something else. Parenthesis, the equivalent of obtaining food after search. End parenthesis. 4. Behaviorists write to assume that a process of implicit thinking goes on. Notwithstanding the fact that we can make our subjects think aloud, and thereby can observe a large part of the process of thinking, Titchener, some years ago, 
raised against an early paper of mine the objection, quote, How does a behaviorist know there is any such process of thinking, since he cannot directly observe it? End quote. Titchener kindly answered this question to the effect that the behaviorist, qua behaviorist, doesn't know that there is any such thing as thinking. The introspectionist claims that the behaviorist first uses the good, old-fashioned method of introspection to find thinking, and having once found it, shuts his eyes and turns his back upon his original method, and begins to externalize the process, and to put it in the universal language of science. In other words, he describes it merely as the functioning of laryngeal or other motor processes. Before coming to closer terms with this question, the behaviorist would like to posit the assumption, without discussing its many metaphysical implications, that in no physical or biological science is the fact called into question that the investigator can make an observation. For example, that he can note that his galvanometer needle has swung two degrees to the right, that when sodium is burned on the end of a glass rod, the bright visual stimulus in the spectroscope will be located on the scale at 5,800 millimeters that the physiologist can observe that when such a such a thing is done to an animal whose heart rate is being recorded, the rate has decreased or increased. He can also make the same observations on the changes in his own heart rate due to the use of different types of drugs. He can do this either by counting his own pulse, or better, by attaching himself to some form of recording device. In each of these sciences, the observer goes on in his carefree way, accumulating a series of systematic observations. He does not do this in any hit or miss way. A definite stimulus starts him upon his work. The words of the professor over him, or the written or spoken word of an antagonist, or finally, some inward organization exerts its pressure. He works, for example, with the effects of strike nine upon human or animal organisms, because he has had some initial stimulus to drive him to that work. Once started, the changing results he obtains serve as a stimulus for further work, Finally, he groups his facts and a bit of organized science is the result, namely a monograph upon the effects of strike nine upon living organisms. If you ask him or the physicist who has worked up a monograph in a wholly similar way upon the spectroscopic analysis of certain compound substances, quote, did you realize that there was an observer implied during all of your manipulations? End quote. He would probably not know what you meant and he would certainly be mildly angered if you happened to interfere during his working moments with such a question. In other words, he gets along without discussing or even being interested in the fact that there is an implied observer at every moment in science, and that a thousand interesting metaphysical points lie behind an individual's ability to make observations. The behaviorist, likewise, shuts his eyes to the same metaphysical question and asks only to be allowed to make observations on what his subjects are doing under given stimulating conditions. On the metaphysical side, he asks merely to be put into the same basket with other natural scientists. The introspectionist has never made this plea to the metaphysician. He has assumed that the question of the observer is a psychological one, and that he has the answer to it. The behaviorist is not so bold. He is engaged in studying, among other things, the process of observing as it appears in others, where the activity is not complicated by the demands of introspection. He must, as must the introspectionist also, assume that his own process of observing is the same as that of the subject whom he is studying. He hopes, ultimately, to give an adequate account of the process in this subject, an account which will show how even those phenomena, which the introspectionist describes as his consciousness, result from the complexities of behaviour. The introspectionist hopes for a solution of the metaphysical problem through some mystic self-knowledge. The behaviorist believes in no such transcendental human power. He himself is only a complex of reacting systems, and must be content to carry out his analysis with the same tools which he observes his subject using. I cannot therefore agree with Mr. Thompson that there is a mind-body problem in behaviorism. It is a serious misunderstanding of the behavioristic position to say, as Mr. Thompson does, quote, and, of course, a behaviorist does not deny that mental states exist. He merely prefers to ignore them, end quote. He ignores them in the same sense that chemistry ignores alchemy, astronomy, horoscopy, and psychology, telepathy, and psychic manifestations. The behaviorist does not concern himself with them because, as the stream of his science broadens and deepens, such older concepts are sucked under, never to reappear. Granting, then, that the behaviorist is a natural scientist and makes his observations upon his fellow man rather than upon himself, utilizing the aid of instruments whenever possible or necessary, like any other scientist, 
How does he arrive at the concept of implicit thinking? The answer is that he can at present arrive at it only by making use of a logical inference. In those cases where the response to the stimulus is not immediate, but where it finally occurs in some form of explicit verbal or manual behaviour, it is safe to say that something does go on, and that that something is surely not different in essence from that which goes on when its behaviour is explicit. Let us glance for a moment at a manual illustration. I hand a friend a gold cigarette case, which can be opened only by pressing a secret spring. I tell him that he can keep the case if he can open it without violence. I watch him for two minutes, noting his rambling trial manipulatory movements. He fails to open it in this period of time. I then place him in a room alone and tell him to come out when he has opened it. At the end of thirty minutes, he emerges smiling and with the case open. Since there are no marks of violence on the case, the behaviourist, utilising logic, has a right to assume that the subject continued to work at the problem as he had been trained to work at such problems, and that his behaviour in the empty room was essentially the same as that exhibited by him when he was under direct observation. Merely because observation of his behaviour could not take place so long as he was hidden from the observer gives no one the right to assume that any different or unusual process went on. I should not hesitate to call this behaviour on the part of our subject manual thinking or non-language thinking, there is no necessity for it, however, since our categories of trial and error learning, functioning of habit, etc. are adequate. I suggest manual thinking here to show its complete homology with that type of behaviour described below, which is more universally called thinking. Suppose, instead of giving him a problem which can be learned by manual trial and error manipulation, I say, quote, What would be the result on your social and vocational life if through some accident you suddenly had both arms removed? End quote. Assuming, as would be safe in most instances, that such a problem had not hitherto been faced and formulated, he would be unable to give any adequate statement. Suppose we insisted upon a formulation. At the end of an hour, he would probably be able to return a fairly comprehensive reply. Surely I have the right to assume, even as a despised behaviourist, that implicit language activity, sensory motor in character, has been taking place during the hour, on as grand a scale as overt bodily movements would have been taking place had I left him in a room from which there was no obvious exit, and suddenly yelled, FIRE! from the outside. I infer that language activity from infancy onward has been developed just to meet such situations. Hence that during the period of his apparent immobility, he was using implicit language processes. Such processes are the only available types of organisation which we have any objective right to assume can be used in such a situation. Footnote. In other words, since our assumed explanation is simple and straightforward, and adequate to account for all the facts, and is in line with what can actually be observed in other activities, the law of parsimony demands that the upholders of imagery and imageless thought should show the need of such processes and demonstrate objectively their presence. Some unpublished results of experiments by my colleague Dr Lashley begin to approach a scientific proof that essentially the same type of responses goes on in implicit thinking as goes on in more explicit types of verbal response. With a delicate apparatus which recorded the tongue movements in two dimensions, he was enabled to show that the overt but whispered repetition of a sentence produced a tracing on the smoked drum which was wholly similar, except for amplitude, to that obtained when he told the subject to think the same thing without making overt movements. He was unable to verify this again and again. On the other hand, if he obtained a standard tracing to a whispered sentence, and then gave the subject other work to do, and later came back and asked him to think the sentence, there was no obvious correspondence in the two tracings. Parenthesis, the original motor set had changed. In parenthesis. This is not an argument against our point, for I have already shown elsewhere how varied is the musculature of the larynx and the throat. We can write the same word by a dozen different combinations in the holding of a pen. We can speak or think the same word by many different muscular combinations. I am not afraid, furthermore, of yielding too much to our friendly enemies, the introspectionists, when I say that the subject himself could observe during the apparent immobile period that he used words and sentences, parenthesis, and that for a part of the time he did not know what he was using, end parenthesis. I am no more afraid to admit this than I am to admit that a person can observe that he himself is laying bricks or playing a piano. 
I have elsewhere admitted a verbal report method, but at the same time, I have insisted upon its untrustworthiness for scientific purposes. To know anything worthwhile for science about my bricklaying, I must get a Gilbreth, or some other observer, to record by motion pictures or otherwise, my every act while laying bricks. In other words, scientific conclusions demand instrumentation. I can observe, roughly, that I have raised a wall four feet high by my day's work, but I cannot determine how many millions of useless movements I have made, or how these useless movements could be eliminated by a change in my method of work. Now I hold that the same thing is true of thinking. The subject can observe that he is using words in thinking, but how much word material is used, how much his final formulation is influenced by implicit factors, which are not put in words, and which he cannot himself observe, cannot be stated by the subject himself. The behaviourist, as well as the psychoanalyst, holds that there are hundreds of such factors involved, some of which require a minute search into the subject's biography as far back as infancy, before any adequate answer can be returned. Now, two or three years' training in introspection on the observational thought processes will take our subject no further. It has been abundantly demonstrated, both by the failure of psychologists to get anywhere in the problem of thinking, and by psychoanalysts, that such methods simply will not yield results. Such training merely makes him pedantic and insufferably prolix and descriptive of his inward processes. The point I am headed toward here is that if we are ever to learn scientifically any more about the intimate nature of thought other than that which can be obtained by observing the end results, that is, by observing the overt verbally expressed behavior or the overt ensuing bodily actions, we shall have to resort to instrumentation. The time seems far off when such a thing is possible. While awaiting it, the behaviourist has ample with which to occupy himself. Furthermore, he is not in such bad straits after all. The physiologists, in many cases, have to be content with their observations of end results. We know many factors which affect the functioning of the parotid gland. We count the drops of saliva which issue from it under varying conditions of stimulation. We analyse the chemical changes occurring, etc. But what goes on in the gland itself we cannot say. But no one would have the temerity to assume that for this reason there is no physiology of the gland. We can speculate about what goes on inside the gland, what the function of the unstriped muscular tissue is, why the solution is now thick, now thin, whether the gland would secrete if this or that were done. But those speculations to be of any value must be couched in some kind of terms which will lead not to metaphysical fancies, but to some kind of experimental attack. If they do not lead to an experimental attack, no physiologist will long entertain them. I feel that we are in exactly the same position with regard to thinking. 5. Further elaboration on the process of thinking. Some objections reviewed. The behaviourist believes that thinking in the narrow sense, where new adjustments are made, correspond to the trial and error process in manual learning. The process as a whole consists in the organised interplay of laryngeal and related muscular activity used in word responses and substitutive word responses. That is, the motor stage is not always necessarily situated in or even near the larynx. I would write up the process as I infer that it goes on somewhat as follows, drawing my analogy from the wealth of facts we have collected about manual activity. If I hand a subject a mechanical problem box, rather large in size, and ask him to solve it, I note the movements of the hand, the wrist, and even the large muscles of the shoulder as he turns the mechanism from side to side. If, before he finishes solving it, I hand him the same apparatus, only reduced to one-tenth of its size, he continues his manipulations in approximately the same way. But the amplitude of his muscular response is greatly reduced, and many of the movements of the large muscles drop out. The two types of activity are, however, in essence essentially the same. When it comes to thinking, we have the following facts. Children, in large measure, think aloud, and many adults either think aloud or, if not quite aloud, at least overtly. In others, thinking is reduced to such an extent that the bystander can observe only the response of the lips, the jaws, and occasional tongue movements. But the great majority of subjects pass beyond this stage, and all observable explicit activity directly connected with the process of thinking disappears. Parenthesis, there may still be explicit factors remaining, such as walking, wrinkling the brow, sweating, etc. End parenthesis. Having watched in genetic psychology the growth of such processes, having made numerous individuals think aloud in solving their problem, what right have I 
to assume that the process entirely changes its character when it becomes implicit. Here I call attention to Mr. Peer's analysis. He says that the behaviourist catches only the perchings of thought. Quote, when we recall Professor James' description of thought as a series of flights and perchings, it seems that the behaviourist has given us an account of some kinds of perchings, and fascinating as it is, it reads like a description of flying by an aerodrome mechanic who sees only the last stages of the aviator's descent. End quote. But surely Mr. Peer here is hoisted by his own petard. It would be unkind to rob his remarks of their sting by saying that only a well-trained aerodrome mechanic can give after watching a descent, a scientific description of it. The question I would ask Mr. Peer is, what logical right is he to assume that the flight goes on in any different way when it is not under the observation of the mechanic? Surely if we have enough mechanics stationed along the course to watch the entire flight, their combined report would be a faithful account of the flight as a whole. William James's account of transitional states and perchings illustrates very well a fallacy into which Mr. Peer and nearly all other psychologists fall. The, if any part of the process is beyond the range of the bystander's immediate observation, he, the bystander, has a right to assume that something unusually interesting and mysterious may go on at the unobserved points. But since the mysterious never happens when the process is under direct observation, the logical fallacy of assuming that something different does go on is obvious. The motive behind James's classical illustration is not difficult to find. It is the motive behind the resistance to the behaviourist's view of thought, and its roots lie in mysticism and early religious trends. Another similar fallacy runs through both Mr. Peer's paper and that of Mr. Bartlett and Miss Smith, namely that the expression of a thought in some kind of implicit or explicit verbal action, or in general bodily movement, is not necessarily thought. Mr. Peer uses the illustration of a skater, making the figure eight, whereas Mr. Bartlett and Miss Smith show dissatisfaction with my simple illustration of a golf player. The figure eight, Mr. Peer tells us, is not skating, but is the result of an act of skating. The roots of these objections lie in the fact that these authors are discussing behaviorism, not from the behaviorist's own premises, but from those of a structural psychologist. Why should a scientific observer of skating stop upon beholding the figure eight made by some particular performer. He might wonder at its regularity, its smoothness and the like, but he would say, quote, my quest is the goose that laid this golden egg, end quote. In studying skating, he would take up the whole system of responses of the skater, from and including the movements of fastening on the skates until they were removed. His observation would concern itself with arm and leg movements, the way the ankles function, the compensatory movements of the trunk, with the effort put forth by the skater, as shown by the ease and grace of the movements, with the fact as to whether he was perspiring, or whether he showed only signs of exhilaration, or other emotional changes, etc. Nor would he neglect the tracings made on the ice by the skater's various movements. He would go further, and take up the question of the type of training required for such adeptness, of the length of the training period, and the age at which such training should begin. In other words, his final data will be sufficient for answering all questions which might be asked about the whole process of fancy figure skating. After he had made a complete and searching analysis, what would be lacking? The individual's own account, of course. For the sake of completeness, we will take it down. Our claim is that, in the great majority of cases, a report by the subject throws very little light upon the act he is engaged in. Let us ask him the question, however, quote, What were you thinking about while you were skating? End quote. Holt has brought out in his Freudian wish the reply one usually gets to such a question. I shall take the liberty of rephrasing Holt's example so that it will fit the present case. Quote, what was I thinking about? I was wondering whether that queen over there in the red sweater was watching me. End quote. In a similar vein, Mr. Bartlett and Miss Smith object to the following statement of mine. Quote, when we study implicitly bodily processes, we are studying thought just as when we study the way a golfer stands in addressing his ball and swinging his club, we are studying golf, end quote. Their objection appears in the following words, quote, but to say we are studying golf in the second case is to assume that golf, the structure and character of the game itself, is identical with how a given player plays golf, end quote. I fail to see any special force in this objection. What I want to know when I have a given individual under observation is how he thinks or how he plays golf. 
perhaps I should have worded it differently. When we study an individual's implicit bodily processes, we are studying his thinking. And when we study the way a golfer stands in addressing his ball, in swinging his clubs, etc., we are studying the way he plays golf. But let us study many other individuals, both their implicit bodily processes, parenthesis, thought, and parenthesis, and their golf playing. Let us write down what we see, and record movements in motion pictures, and use all possible methods and instrumentation in our quest. In the end, we shall arrive at a monograph on thinking, and at another on golf playing. Destroy all books on golf, and a man from Mars, in a month's time, never having seen the game, could, by watching individuals play, write a decent manual on the rules, structure, and technique of golf. After having made a searching analysis as we like upon several players playing of golf, what will be left out? The individual's own accounts. Again, suppose we take down their overt responses to any questions we may ask, and incorporate them into our record. They are of relatively little value. No one that since objective studies upon golf have been made trusts the verbal report of a golf player. He will tell you that he never takes his eyes off the ball when making a stroke. The cinema shows that he is a prevaricator. I have never been able to get one valuable scientific statement from a golf player. He does not know how he holds his hands, he cannot tell how he stands, nor the arc he makes with his club, nor whether the arc can vary within wide limits and not affect his stroke. He knows practically nothing about the condition his body is in. To verify this, one needs only to play with a man whose driving has gone off a bit, and who has to resort again to trial and error for correction. He asks after every failure, quote, What did I do that time? Did I bend my body? Did I move my foot? End quote. And so on. A most interesting illustration of the failure of a tennis player to be able to give any worthwhile verbal report came to my hands while preparing this paper. A. Took up tennis again after a ten-year period of non-practice. He played against B. On the first day, his form was pitiful to behold. He stooped at every stroke and twisted his body in every conceivable way. He played five sets and failed to get a game in any set. The score was deuce on only two occasions. On the second day, the score was due several times and he won one game. He put over several good serves and his form showed great improvement. On the third day, there was again steady improvement in form. The returns were swift and fully 50% of his first serves were good. On the fourth day, he won three games in succession, but he was still unable to win a set. All the way through, he was terribly discouraged. He had formerly been a fair player, with a good serve. He kept saying to his opponent, quote, I play worse than I did the first day. My wrist is not flexible. I can't get the knack of serving the ball the way I used to. I have forgotten how and when to play the net and to place my balls. End quote. It was not until B pointed out the objective facts indicated above that A was convinced that his playing had improved. It would be folly to say that in no case is a verbal report wholly without service. To enumerate the places where it is of service is not particularly pertinent to our present discussion. 6. Conceptual thinking really a fallacy. Mr. Bartlett and Miss Smith have, I fear, hearkened too much to the logician in their treatment of so-called general relations. They find fault with my simple illustration of building a bridle path. The statement they object to is as follows. Quote, if the grade is too steep, I build my road around the side of the hill. End quote. I quote their criticism. Quote, but the real fact of the case is concealed in that statement. Insofar as a response is a thought response, it is definitely a response to steepness, not merely to a particular set of visual reactions, because that would not lead on, of itself, to the further set of muscular and other reactions involved in making the path around the hill. Not merely to the steepness of this hill, because that also would not take me around it, but especially to steepness as a quality common to this and to other situations, and independent of any particular context, end quote. From the whole history of the way responses grow up, I cannot yield this point, and yet it would probably be assented to by most psychologists. Mr. Thompson, I think, has come to my rescue upon this, and I believe he would assent to my further elaboration. One of the first stumbling blocks I had in structural psychology was its treatment of concepts and general ideas. Long before behaviorism took me in tow, I came to the conclusion that such things were mere nonsense, that all of our responses are to definite and particular things. I never saw anyone reacting to tables in general, but always to some particular representative. When I began to watch how a child learns to react to words denoting 
parenthesis, from the standpoint of logic, end parenthesis, a class, the process became clear. When he had his arms full of toys and the stimulus for depositing them was present, his mother would say, quote, put them on the table, end quote. Whether the table was one-legged, an extension table, a library or dining table, the word thus becomes conditioned. The word table, parenthesis, any class or abstract word, such as animal, justice, mercy, infinity, has the same history, end parenthesis, becomes thereafter a single individual object, a part of his world or objects, ready to call out a single, definite response. Parenthesis, appropriate to the situation he is in, end parenthesis, when he speaks it himself, thinks it, or hears it spoken. In a similar way, the definite reaction to the word steepness grows up. The lad takes a walk with his mother over stretches where there are no paths. When he goes up a hill, he pants and blows and sweats. His mother says, quote, steep, isn't it? End quote. Steep becomes substitutable for panting and blowing and sweating. They come to another hill. The mother says, quote, steep, isn't it? You are tired. Let's go round. End quote. He learns by trial and error that the word steep is followed by sweating, hard work and tired limbs and that this exertion can be avoided by turning to the right or left and circling instead of keeping straight on. When interested in constructing a bridle path after reaching adult life, he comes to a hill. His whole organization is such that the hill itself, parenthesis, the situation, in parenthesis, calls out the word steep, parenthesis, conditioned, end parenthesis, and steep in turn calls out, quote, turn right or left and circle, end quote. I can see nothing in his reaction not explainable by conditioned word responses and simple trial and error learning. As Mr. Thompson points out, after reactions to such situations has become habitual, merely being in a situation where he is confronted by a hill leads him to the correct response, namely circling up its side. Thinking, in the sense of implicit word processes, need not go on at all. I think, then, we need not agree with Mr. Bartlett and Miss Smith when they say, Quote, but what, in this instance, switches me off from the series going in this direction to the series going in that? Is the response to a universal quality or reaction? That and that alone gives us the peculiar characteristic of thinking. End quote. 7. Meaning, an experimental problem and not a problem of philosophy or of speculative psychology. This type of argument brings us perilously close to the so-called problem of meaning. I should like to say frankly and without combativeness that I have no sympathy with those psychologists and philosophers who try to introduce a concept of meaning. Parenthesis, values is another sacred word, end parenthesis, into behaviour. At every point we would describe all of psychology in terms of what we see the organism doing. The question of meaning is an abstraction, a rationalisation, and a speculation serving no useful scientific purpose. In our seminary at Johns Hopkins University during the past year, we went over the various formulations of meaning of the psychologists and philosophers. A more barren wilderness of words, it has never been my lot to meet. From the bystanders' or behaviorist's point of view, the problem never arises. We watch what the animal or human being is doing. He means what he does. It is foolish to ask him, while he is acting, what he is meaning. His action is the meaning. Hence, exhaust the concept of action, and we have exhausted the concept of meaning. It is a waste of effort to raise a problem of meaning apart from actions which can actually be observed. To answer what the church means to men, it is necessary to look upon the church as a stimulus, and to find out what reactions are called out by this stimulus, in a given race, in a given group, or in any given individual. Parallel with this query, we can carry out another as to why the church calls out such and such responses. This might take us into folklore and into the influence of the code upon the individual, into the influence of parents upon children, causing the race to project the father and mother into a heavenly state hereafter, finally into the realms of the incest complex, homosexual tendencies and so on. In other words, it becomes like all others in psychology, a problem for systematic observation and experimentation. I have emphasized these general statements about meaning in this connection because it is often said that thinking somehow peculiarly reveals meaning. If we look upon thinking as a form of action, comparable in all its essential respects to manual action, such speculations concerning meaning and thinking lose their mystery and hence their charm. 
8. Conclusions. Thinking is then largely a verbal process. Occasionally expressive movements, substitutable for word movements, parenthesis, gestures, attitudes, etc., end parenthesis, enter in as a part of the general stream of implicit activity. Thinking, in the narrow sense where learning is involved, is a trial and error process, wholly similar to manual trial and error. Verbal manipulation along one line is checked and stopped, and a new line is begun for exactly the same reasons that such processes are checked and begun in manual learning. Parenthesis, so-called processes of control. Footnote. Situations plus training and organization, parenthesis, the individual's biography, end parenthesis, are the only control factors we need in psychology, either for regulating overt bodily action or implicit thought action. End footnote. The thinking adjustment is completed when the final word grouping, parenthesis, sentence or judgment, end parenthesis, or overt bodily reaction, which comes as the end result of the process of thinking, makes the initial stimulus to thinking inoperative or inert. That is, the final reaction, verbal or other, so changes the general state of the organism as a whole that the original stimulating factor can no longer affect the subject. A crude illustration, which can properly be carried over to thought, is to be found in the hungry hunter's eager search for game. He finds it, captures it, prepares and eats it, lights his pipe, and lies down. The hares and quail may peek at him from every corner of the brush, but their driving power for the time is gone. End of Is Thinking Merely the Action of Language Mechanisms? Conditioned Emotional Reactions this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Conditioned Emotional Reactions by John B. Watson and Rosalie Rayner, 1920 First published in Journal of Experimental Psychology, 3, pages 1-14 to In recent literature... Various speculations have been entered into concerning the possibility of conditioning various types of emotional response, but direct experimental evidence in support of such a view has been lacking. If the theory advanced by Watson and Morgan, footnote, Emotional Reactions and Psychological Experimentation, American Journal of Psychology, April 1917, Volume 28, pages 163 to 174. End footnote. To the effect that, in infancy, the original emotional reaction patterns are few, consisting, so far as observed, of fear, rage and love, then there must be some simple method by means of which the range of stimuli which can call out these emotions and their compounds is greatly increased. Otherwise, complexity in adult response could not be accounted for. These authors, without adequate experimental evidence, advanced the view that this range was increased by means of conditional reflex factors. It was suggested there that the early home life of the child furnishes a laboratory situation for establishing conditioned emotional responses. The present authors have recently put the whole matter to an experimental test. Experimental work has been done so far only on one child, Albert B. This infant was reared almost from birth in a hospital environment, his mother was a wet nurse in the Harriet Lane home for invalid children. Albert's life was normal. He was healthy from birth and one of the best developed youngsters ever brought to the hospital, weighing 21 pounds at nine months of age. He was on the whole stolid and unemotional. His stability was one of the principal reasons for using him as a subject in this test. We felt that we could do him relatively little harm by carrying out such experiments as those outlined below. At approximately nine months of age, we ran him through the emotional tests that have become part of our regular routine in determining whether fear reactions can be called out by other stimuli than sharp noises and the sudden removal of support. Tests of this type have been described by the senior author in another place. Footnote. Psychology from the standpoint of a behaviourist, page 202. End footnote. In brief, 
the infant was confronted suddenly and for the first time successively with a white rat, a rabbit, a dog, a monkey, with masks, with and without hair, cotton wool, burning newspapers, etc. A permanent record of Albert's reactions to these objects and situations has been preserved in a motion picture study. Manipulation was the most usual reaction called out. At no time did this infant ever show fear in any situation. These experimental records were confirmed by the casual observations of the mother and hospital attendants. No one had ever seen him in a state of fear and rage. The infant practically never cried. Up to approximately nine months of age, we had not tested him with loud sounds. The test to determine whether a fear reaction could be called out by a loud sound was made when he was eight months, twenty-six days of age. The sound was that made by striking a hammer upon a suspended steel bar four feet in length and three-fourths of an inch in diameter. The laboratory notes are as follows. One of the two experimenters caused the child to turn its head and fixate her moving hand. The other, stationed back of the child, struck the steel bar a sharp blow. The child started violently, his breathing was checked, and the arms were raised in a characteristic manner. On the second stimulation the same thing occurred, and in addition the lips began to pucker and tremble. On the third stimulation the child broke into a sudden crying fit. This is the first time an emotional situation in the laboratory has produced any fear or even crying in Albert. We had expected just these results on account of our work with other infants brought up under similar conditions. It is worthwhile to call attention to the fact that removal of support, dropping and jerking the blanket upon which the infant was lying, was tried exhaustively upon this infant on the same occasion. It was not effective in producing the fear response. This stimulus is effective in younger children. At what age such stimuli lose their potency in producing fear is not known, nor is it known whether less placid children ever lose their fear of them. This probably depends upon the training the child gets. It is well known that children eagerly run to be tossed into the air and caught. On the other hand, it is equally well known that in the adult, fear responses are called out quite clearly by the sudden removal of support if the individual is walking across a bridge, walking upon a beam, etc. There is a wide field of study here, which is aside from our present point. The sound stimulus thus, at nine months of age, gives us the means of testing several important factors. 1. Can we condition fear of an animal, e.g. a white rat, by visually presenting it and simultaneously striking a steel bar? 2. If such a conditioned emotional response can be established, will there be a transfer to other animals or other objects? 3. What is the effect of time upon such conditioned emotional responses? 4. If, after a reasonable period, such emotional responses have not died out, what laboratory methods can be devised for their removal? Part 1. The Establishment of Conditioned Emotional Responses At first, there was considerable hesitation upon our part in making the attempt to set up fear reactions experimentally. A certain responsibility attaches to such a procedure. We decided finally to make the attempt comforting ourselves by the reflection that such attachments would arise anyway, as soon as the child left the sheltered environment of the nursery for the rough and tumble of the home. We did not begin this work until Albert was 11 months, 3 days of age. Before attempting to set up a conditioned response, we, as before, put him through all of the regular emotional tests. Not the slightest sign of a fear response was obtained in any situation. The steps taken to condition emotional responses are shown in our laboratory notes. 11 months, 3 days. 1. White rat suddenly taken from the basket and presented to Albert. He began to reach for rat with left hand. Just as his hand touched the animal, the bar was struck immediately behind his head. The infant jumped violently and fell forward, burying his face in the mattress he did not cry, however. 2. Just as the right hand touches the rat, the bar was again struck. Again the infant jumped violently, fell forward, and began to whimper. 
in order not to disturb the child too seriously, no further tests were given for one week. 11 months, 10 days. 1. Rat presented suddenly without sound. There was steady fixation, but no tendency at first to reach for it. The rat was then placed nearer, whereupon tentative reaching movements began with the right hand. When the rat nosed the infant's left hand, the hand was immediately withdrawn. He started to reach for the head of the animal with the forefinger of the left, not without effect. He started to reach for the head of the animal with the forefinger of the left hand, but withdrew it suddenly before contact. It is thus seen that the two joint stimulations given the previous week were not without effect. He was tested with his blocks immediately afterwards, to see if they shared in the process of conditioning. He began immediately to pick them up, dropping them, pounding them, etc. In the remainder of the tests, the blocks were given frequently to quiet him and to test his general emotional state. They were always removed from sight when the process of conditioning was under way. 2. Joint stimulation with rat and sound. Started, then fell over immediately to right side. No crying. 3. Joint stimulation, fell to right side and rested upon hands, with head turned away from rat. No crying. 4. Joint stimulation, same reaction. 5. Rat suddenly presented alone, puckered face, whimpered and withdrew body sharply to the left. 6. Joint stimulation, fell over immediately to right side and began to whimper. 7. Joint stimulation, started violently and cried, but did not fall over. 8. Rat alone. The instant the rat was shown, the baby began to cry. Almost instantly he turned sharply to the left, fell over on left side, raised himself on all fours, and began to crawl away so rapidly that he was caught with difficulty before reaching the edge of the table. This was as convincing a case of completely conditioned fear response as could have been theoretically pictured. In all, seven joint stimulations were given to bring about the complete reaction. It is not unlikely that had the sound been of greater intensity or of a more complex clang character, that the number of joint stimulations might have been materially reduced. Experiments designed to define the nature of the sounds that will serve best as emotional stimuli are underway. Part 2. When a conditioned emotional response has been established for one object, is there a transfer? Five days later, Albert was again brought back into the laboratory and tested as follows. 11 months, 15 days. 1. Tested first with blocks. He reacted readily for them, playing with them as usual. This shows that there has been no general transfer to the room, table, blocks, etc. 2. Rat alone. Whimpered immediately, withdrew right hand and turned head and trunk away. 3. Blocks again offered. Played readily with them, smiling and gurgling. 4. Rat alone. Leaned over to the left side as far away from the rat as possible, then fell over, getting up on all fours and scurrying away as rapidly as possible. 5. Blocks again offered. Reached immediately for them, smiling and laughing as before. The above preliminary test shows that the conditioned response to the rat had carried over completely for the five days in which no tests were given. The question as to whether or not there is a transfer was next taken up. 6. Rabbit alone. The rabbit was suddenly placed on the mattress in front of him. The reaction was pronounced. Negative responses began at once. He leaned as far away from the animal as possible, whimpered, then burst into tears. When the rabbit was placed in contact with him, he buried his face in the mattress, then got up on all fours and crawled away, crying as he went. This was a most convincing test. 7. The blocks were next given him, after an interval. He played with them as before. It was observed by four people that he played far more energetically with them than ever before. The blocks were raised high over his head and slammed down with a great deal of force. 8. Dog alone. The dog did not produce as violent a reaction as the rabbit. The moment fixation occurred, the child shrank back and as the animal came nearer, he attempted to get on all fours, but did not cry at first. As soon as the dog passed out of his range of vision, he became quiet. The dog was then made to approach the infant's head, 
He was lying down at the moment. Albert straightened up immediately, fell over to the opposite side, and turned his head away. He then began to cry. 9. The blocks were again presented. He began immediately to play with them. 10. Fur coat. Seal. Withdrew immediately to the left side, and began to fret. Coat put close to him, on the left side. He turned immediately, began to cry, and tried to crawl away on all fours. 11. Cotton wool. The wool was presented in a paper package. At the end, the cotton was not covered by the paper. It was placed first on his feet. He kicked it away, but did not touch it with his hands. When his hand was laid on the wool, he immediately withdrew it, but did not show the shock that the animal's or fur coat produced in him. He then began to play with the paper, avoiding contact with the wool itself. He finally, under the impulse of the manipulative instinct, lost some of his negativism to the wool. 12. Just in play, W put his head down to see if Albert would play with his hair. Albert was completely negative. Two other observers did the same thing. He began immediately to play with their hair. W then brought the Santa Claus mask and presented it to Albert. He was again pronouncedly negative. 11 months, 20 days. 1. Blocks alone, played with them as usual. 2. Rat alone, withdrawal of the whole body, bending over to left side no crying, fixation and following with eyes. The response was much less marked than on the first presentation of the previous week. It was thought best to freshen up the reaction by another joint stimulation. 3. Just as the rat was placed on his left hand, the rod was struck. Reaction violent. 4. Rat alone. Fell over at once to left side. Reaction practically as strong as on former occasions, but no crying. 5. Rat alone. Fell over to left side, got up on all fours and started to crawl away. On this occasion there was no crying, but strange to say, as he started away he began to gurgle and coo, even while leaning far over to the left side to avoid the rat. 6. Rabbit alone. Leaned over to left side as far as possible, did not fall over, began to whimper, but reaction not so violent as on former occasions. 7. Blocks again offered. He reached for them immediately and began to play. All of these tests so far discussed were carried out upon a table supplied with a mattress located in a small, well-lighted, dark room. We wished to test next where the conditioned fear responses so set up would appear if the situation were markedly altered. We thought it best before making this test to freshen the reaction both to the rabbit and to the dog by showing them at the moment the steel bar was struck. It will be recalled that this was the first time any effort had been made to directly condition response to the dog and rabbit. The experimental notes are as follows. 8. The rabbit at first was given alone. The reaction was exactly as given in test 6 above. When the rabbit was left on Albert's knees for a long time, he began tentatively to reach out and manipulate its fur with his forefingers. While doing this, the steel rod was struck. A violent fear reaction resulted. 9. Rabbit alone. Reaction wholly similar to that on trial 6 above. 10. Rabbit alone. Started immediately to whimper, holding hands far up, but did not cry. Conflicting tendency to manipulate very evident. 11. Dog alone. Began to whimper, shaking head from side to side, holding hands as far away from the animal as possible. 12. Dog and sound. The rod was struck just as the animal touched him. A violent negative reaction appeared. He began to whimper, turned to one side, fell over and started to get up on all fours. 13. Blocks. Played with them immediately and readily. On this same day and immediately after the above experiment, Albert was taken into the large, well-lighted lecture room belonging to the laboratory. He was placed on a table in the centre of the room and immediately under the skylight. Four people were present. The situation was thus very different from that which obtained in the small dark room. 1. Rat alone. No sudden fear reaction appeared at first. The hands, however, were held up and away from the animal. No positive manipulatory reactions appeared. 2. 
Rabbit alone. Fear reaction slight. Turned to left and kept face away from the animal, but the reaction was never pronounced. 3. Dog alone. Turned away but did not fall over. Cried. Hands moved as far away from the animal as possible. Whimpered as long as the dog was present. 4. Rat alone. Slight negative reaction. 5. Rat and sound. It was thought best to freshen the reaction to the rat. The sound was given just as the rat was presented. Albert jumped violently, but did not cry. 6. Rat alone. At first he did not show any negative reaction. When rat was placed nearer, he began to show negative reaction by drawing back his body, raising his hands, whimpering, etc. 7. Blocks. Played with them immediately. 8. Rat alone. Pronounced withdrawal of body and whimpering. 9. Blocks. Played with them as before. 10. Rabbit alone. Pronounced reaction. Whimpered with arms held high. Fell over backward and had to be caught. 11. Dog alone. At first the dog did not produce the pronounced reaction. The hands were held high over the head. Breathing was checked, but there was no crying. Just at this moment the dog, which had not barked before, barked three times loudly, when only about six inches from the baby's face. Albert immediately fell over and broke into a wail that continued until the dog was removed. The sudden barking of the hitherto quiet dog produced a marked fear response in the adult observers. From the above results, it would seem that emotional transfers do take place. Furthermore, it would seem that the number of transfers resulting from an experimentally produced conditioned emotional reaction may be very large. In our observations, we had no means of testing the complete number of transfers which may have resulted. Part 3. The effect of time upon conditioned emotional responses. We have already shown that the conditioned emotional responses will continue for a period of one week. It was desired to make the time test longer. In view of the imminence of Albert's departure from the hospital, we could not make the interval longer than one month. Accordingly, no further emotional experimentation was entered into for 31 days after the above test. During the month, however, Albert was brought weekly to the laboratory for tests upon right and left-handedness, imitation, general development, etc. No emotional tests whatever were given, and during the whole month his regular nursery routine was maintained in the Harriet Lane home. The notes on the test given at the end of this period are as follows. One year, 21 days. 1. Santa Claus mask. Withdrawal, gurgling, then slapped at it without touching. When his hand was forced to touch it, he whimpered and cried. His hand was forced to touch it two more times. He whimpered and cried on both tests. He finally cried at the mere visual stimulus of the mask. 2. Fur coat. Wrinkled his nose and withdrew both hands. Drew back his whole body and began to whimper as the coat was put nearer. Again there was the strife between withdrawal and the tendency to manipulate. Reached tentatively with left hand but drew back again before contact had been made. In moving his body to one side his hand accidentally touched the coat he began to cry at once, nodding his head in a very peculiar manner. This reaction was an entirely new one. Both hands were withdrawn as far as possible from the coat. The coat was then laid on his lap and he continued nodding his head and whimpering, withdrawing his body as far as possible, pushing the while at the coat with his feet but never touching it with his hands. 3. Fur coat. The coat was taken out of his sight and presented again at the end of a minute. He began immediately to fret, withdrawing his body and nodding his head, as before. 4. Blocks. He began to play with them, as usual. 5. The Rat. He allowed the rat to crawl towards him without withdrawing. He sat very still and fixated it, intently. Rat then touched his hand. Albert withdrew it immediately, then leaned back as far as possible, but did not cry. When the rat was placed on his arm... He withdrew his body and began to fret, nodding his head. The rat was then allowed to crawl against his chest. He first began to fret, then covered his eyes with both hands. 6. Blocks. 
Reaction normal. 7. The rabbit. The animal was placed directly in front of him. It was very quiet. Albert showed no avoiding reactions at first. After a few seconds he puckered up his face, began to nod his head, and to look intently at the experimenter. He began to push the rabbit away with his feet, withdrawing his body at the same time. Then, as the rabbit came nearer, he began pulling his feet away, nodding his head and wailing, Da, da. After about a minute, he reached out tentatively and slowly and touched the rabbit's ear with his right hand, finally manipulating it. The rabbit was again placed in his lap. Again he began to fret and withdrew his hands. He reached out tentatively with his left hand and touched the animal, shuddered and withdrew the whole body. The experimenter then took hold of his left hand and laid it on the rabbit's back. Albert immediately withdrew his hand and began to suck his thumb. Again the rabbit was laid in his lap. He began to cry, covering his face with both hands. 8. Dog The dog was very active. Albert fixated it intensely for a few seconds, sitting very still. He began to cry but did not fall over backwards, as on the last contact with the dog. When the dog was pushed closer to him, he at first sat motionless, then began to cry, putting both hands over his face. These experiments would seem to show conclusively that directly conditioned emotional responses, as well as those conditioned by transfer, persist, although with a certain loss in the intensity of the reaction, for a longer period than one month. Our view is that they persist and modify personality throughout life. It should be recalled again that Albert was of an extremely phlegmatic type. Had he been emotionally unstable, probably both the directly conditioned response and those transferred would have persisted throughout the month unchanged in form. 4. Detachment or removal of conditioned emotional responses Unfortunately, Albert was taken from the hospital the day the above tests were made. Hence, the opportunity of building up an experimental technique by means of which we could remove the conditioned emotional responses was denied us. Our own view expressed above which is possibly not very well grounded, is that these responses in the home environment are likely to persist indefinitely unless an accidental method for removing them is hit upon. The importance of establishing some method must be apparent to all. Had the opportunity been at hand, we should have tried out several methods, some of which we may mention. 1. Constantly confronting the child with those stimuli which called out the responses in the hopes that habituation would come in corresponding to fatigue of reflex when differential reactions are to be set up. 2. By trying to recondition by showing objects calling out fear responses, visual, and simultaneously stimulating the erogenous zones, tactual. We should try first the lips, then the nipples, and as a final resort, the sex organs. 3 by trying to recondition by feeding the subject candy or other food, just as the animal is shown. This method calls for the food control of the subject. 4. By building up constructive activities around the object by imitation and by putting the hand through the motions of manipulation. At this age, imitation of overt motor activity is strong, as our present but unpublished experimentation has shown. Incidental observations. A. Thumb sucking as a compensatory device for blocking fear and noxious stimuli. During the course of these experiments, especially in the final test, it was noticed that whenever Albert was on the verge of tears or emotionally upset generally, he would continually thrust his thumb into his mouth. The moment the hand reached the mouth, he became impervious to the stimuli producing fear. Again and again, while the motion pictures were being made, at the end of the 30-day period, we had to remove the thumb from his mouth before the conditioned responses could be obtained. This method of blocking noxious and emotional stimuli, fear and rage, through erogenous stimulation, seems to persist from birth onward. Very often in our experiments upon the work adders, with infants under 10 days of age, the same reaction appeared. When at work upon the adders, both of the infant's arms are under slight restraint. Often rage appears. They begin to cry, thrashing their arms and legs about. If the finger gets into the mouth, crying ceases at once. 
The organism, thus apparently from birth, when under the influence of love stimuli, is blocked to all others. Footnote. The stimulus to love in infants, according to our view, is stroking of the skin, lips, nipples and sex organs, patting and rocking, picking up, etc. Patting and rocking, when not conditioned, are probably equivalent to actual stimulation of the sex organs. In adults, of course, as every lover knows, vision, audition and olfaction soon become conditioned by joint stimulation with contact and kinesthetic stimuli. End footnote. This resort to sex stimulation, when under the influence of noxious and emotional situations, or when the individual is restless and idle, persists throughout adolescence and adult life. Albert, at any rate, did not resort to thumb-sucking except in the presence of such stimuli. Thumb-sucking could immediately be checked by offering him his blocks. These invariably called out active manipulation instincts. It is worthwhile here to call attention to the fact that Freud's conception of the stimulation of erogenous zones as being the expression of an original pleasure-seeking principle may be turned about and possibly better described as a compensatory and often conditioned device for the blockage of noxious and fear and rage producing stimuli. b. Equal primacy of fear, love and possibly rage. While in general the results of our experiments offer no particular points of conflict with Freudian concepts, one fact out of harmony with them should be emphasised. According to proper Freudians, sex, or in our terminology love, is the principal emotion in which the conditioned responses arise which later limit and distort personality. We wish to take sharp issue with this view on the basis of the experimental evidence we have gathered. Fear is as primal a factor as love in influencing personality. Fear does not gather its potency in any derived manner from love. It belongs to the original and inherited nature of man. Probably the same may be true of rage, although at present we are not so sure of this. The Freudians twenty years from now, unless their hypotheses change, when they come to analyse Albert's fear of a seal-skin coat, assuming that he comes to analysis at that age, will probably tease from him the recital of a dream, which upon their analysis will show that Albert, at three years of age, attempted to play with the pubic hair of the mother, and was scolded violently for it. We are by no means denying that this might in some other case condition it. If the analyst has sufficiently prepared Albert to accept such a dream when found as an explanation of his avoiding tendencies, and if the analyst has the authority and personality to put it over, Albert may be fully convinced that the dream was a true revealer of the factors which brought about the fear. It is probable that many of the phobias in psychopathology are true conditioned emotional reactions, either of the direct or the transferred type. One may possibly have to believe that such persistence of early conditioned responses will be found only in persons who are constitutionally inferior. Our argument is meant to be constructive. Emotional disturbances in adults cannot be traced back to sex alone. They must be retraced along at least three collateral lines to conditioned and transferred responses set up in infancy and early youth in all three of the fundamental human emotions. End of section. Why Babe Ruth is the Greatest Home Run Hitter This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Matthew Reese Why Babe Ruth is Greatest Home Run Hitter by Hugh S. Fullerton Popular Science Monthly tests in the laboratory his brain, ear, eye, and muscle, and gets his secret. The game was over. Babe, who had made one of his famous drives that day, was tired and wanted to go home. Not tonight, Babe, I said. Tonight you go to college with me. You're going to take scientific tests which will reveal your secret. Who wants to know it? asked Babe. I want to know it, I reply, and so do several hundred thousand fans. We want to know why it is that one man has achieved a unique batting skill like yours. 
just why you can slam the ball as nobody else in the world can. So away we went, Babe in his baseball uniform, not home to his armchair, but out to Columbia University to take his first college examination. Babe went at the test with the zeal of a schoolboy, and the tests revealed why his rise to fame followed suddenly after years of playing, during which he was known as an erratic although powerful hitter. How he abruptly gained his unparalleled skill has been one of baseball's mysteries. Albert Johansson, M.A., and Joseph Holmes, M.A., of the Research Laboratory of Columbia University's Psychological Department, who, in all probability, never saw Ruth hit a baseball, and who neither know or care if his batting average is 007 or 450, are 500 hitters in the psychology game. They led Babe Ruth into the great laboratory of the university, figuratively took him apart, watched the wheels go round, analyzed his brain, his eye, his ear, his muscles, studied how these worked together, reassembled him, and announced the exact reasons for his supremacy as a batter and a ball player. Baseball employs scores of scouts to explore the country and discover baseball talent. These scouts are known as ivory hunters, and if baseball club owners take the hint from the Ruth experiments, they can organize a clinic, submit candidates to the comprehensive tests undergone by Ruth, and discover whether or not other Ruths exist. By these tests, it would be possible for the club owners to discover, during the winter perhaps, whether the ball players are liable to be good, bad, or mediocre, and to carry the practical results of the experiments to the limit, then may be able to eliminate the possibility or probability of some player pulling a boner in mid-season by discovering, before the season starts, how liable he is to do so. The scientific ivory hunters of Columbia University discovered that the secret of Babe Ruth's batting, reduced to non-scientific terms, is that his eyes and ears function more rapidly than those of other players, that his brain records sensations more quickly and transmits its orders to the muscles much faster than does that of the average man. The tests prove that the coordination of eye, brain, nerve system, and muscle is practically perfect, and that the reason he did not acquire his great batting power before the sudden burst at the beginning of the baseball season of 1920 was because, prior to that time, pitching and studying batters disturbed his almost perfect coordination. Ruth the Superman The tests revealed the fact that Ruth is 90% efficient, compared with a human average of 60%, that his eyes are about 12% faster than those of the average human being, that his ears function at least 10% faster than those of the ordinary man, that his nerves are steadier than those of 499 out of 500 persons, that in attention and quickness of perception he rated one and a half times above the human average that in intelligence, as demonstrated by the quickness and accuracy of understanding, he is approximately 10% above normal. It must not be forgotten that the night on which the tests were made was an extremely warm one, and that in the afternoon he had played a hard, exhausting game of baseball before a large crowd, in the course of which he had made one of those home-run hits which we at Columbia were so eager to understand and account for. Under such circumstances, one would think that some signs of nerve exhaustion would be revealed, the instigation lasted more than three hours, during which Ruth stood for most of the time, walked up and down stairs five times, and underwent the tests in a close, warm room. At the end of that time I was tired and nervous, and although Ruth showed no symptoms of weariness, it is probable that under more favorable conditions his showing would have been even better. The tests used were ones that primarily test motor functions and give a measure of the integrity of the psychophysical organism. Babe Ruth was posed first in an apparatus created to determine the strength, quickness, and approximate power of the swing of his bat against the ball. A plane covered with electrically charged wires, strung horizontally, was placed behind him, and a ball was hung over the theoretical plate, so that it could be suspended at any desired height. I learned something then which perhaps will interest the American League pitchers more than it will the scientists. This was that the ball Ruth likes best to hit and can hit hardest is a low ball pitched just above his knees on the outside corner of the plate. The scientists did not consider this of extreme importance in their calculations, but the pitchers will probably find it of great scientific interest. Science discovers the secret. The ball was adjusted at the right height and, taking up a bat that was electrically wired, Ruth was told to get into position and to swing his bat exactly as if striking the ball for a home run to make the end of it touch one of the transverse wires on the plate behind him, then swing it through its natural arc and hit the ball lightly. 
The bat, weighing fifty-four ounces, exactly the weight of the bats Ruth uses on the diamond, was swung as directed, touched the ball, and the secret of his power, or rather, the amount of force with which he strikes the ball, was calculated. At least, the basis of the problem was secured. The bat, weighing fifty-four ounces, swinging at a rate of one hundred ten feet a second, hits the ball traveling at the rate of, say, sixty feet a second, the ball weighing four and a quarter ounces and striking the bat at a point four inches from the end. How far will it travel? There are other elements entering into the problem, such as the resilience of the ball, the English placed on it by the pitcher's hand, and a few minor details. But the answer, as proved by the measurements, is somewhere between 450 and 500 feet. This problem cannot be worked down to exact figures because of the unknown quantities. The experimenters, however, were not so much interested in the problem in physics as they were in the problems in psychology. The thing they wanted to know was what made Ruth superior to all other ball players in hitting power, rather than to measure that power. Babe could beat his own record. Before proceeding to the psychological tests, however, we tried another in physics to satisfy my curiosity. A harness composed of rubber tubing was strapped around Ruth's chest and shoulders and attached by hollow tubes to a recording cylinder. By this means, his breathing was recorded on a revolving disc. He was then placed in position to bat, an imaginary pitcher pitched an imaginary ball, and he went through the motions of hitting a home run. The test proved that, as a ball is pitched to him, Babe draws in his breath sharply as he makes the backswing with his bat, and really holds his breath or suspends the operation of his breathing until after the ball is hit. But for that fact, he would hit the ball much harder and more effectively than he now does. It has been discovered that the act of drawing in the breath and holding it results in a sharp tension of the muscles and a consequent loss of striking power. If Ruth expelled his breath before striking the ball, the muscles would not become tense, and his swing would have greater strength and rhythm. The first test to discover the efficiency of his psychophysical organism was designed to try his coordination. A simple little test. The scientists set up a triangular board looking something like a Ouija board, with a small round hole at each angle. At the bottom of each hole was an electrified plate that registered every time it was touched. Ruth was presented with a little instrument that looked like a doll-sized curling iron, the end of which just fitted into the holes. Then he was told to take the instrument in his right hand and jab it into the holes successively, as often as he could in one minute, going around the board from left to right. He grew interested at once. Here was something at which he could play. The professor shushed me, fearing that I would disturb Ruth or distract his attention as he started around the board, jabbing the curling iron into the holes with great rapidity. He would put it into the holes twelve to sixteen times so perfectly that the instrument barely touched the sides. Then he would lose control and touch the sides, slowing down. Only twice did he pass the hole without getting the end of the iron into it. With his right hand, he made a score of 122. Not unnaturally, his wrist was tired and Babe shook it and grinned ruefully. Then he tried it with his left hand, scored 132 with it, proving himself a bit more left than right-handed, at least in some activities. The significance of the experiment, however, lies in the fact that the average of hundreds of persons who have taken that test is 82 to the minute, which shows how much swifter in the coordination of hand, brain, and eye Ruth is than the average. Every Test But Another Triumph In a sequel to this test that followed, Babe tapped an electrified plate with an electrically charged stylus with the speed of a drum roll, scoring 193 taps per minute with his right hand and 176 with his left hand. The average score for right-handed persons undergoing this wrist-racking experiment is 180, and while there is no data covering right-handed persons using the left hand, it is certain that Ruth's record is much above the average, as he is highly efficient with the left hand. But steadiness must accompany speed, and so they tested the home-run king for his steadiness of nerve and muscle by having him thrust the useful little curling iron stylus in different sized holes pierced through an electrified plate, which registered contacts between the stylus and the side of the hole. These measured respectively 16, 11, 9, 8, and 7 sixty-fourths of an inch. Small enough, but not too small for Babe, for he made a score that showed him better than 499 persons out of 500. The tests that interested me most were those to determine how quickly Ruth's eye acts, and how quickly its signals are flashed through the brain to the muscles. Showing an amazingly quick reaction time, they interpreted what happens on the ball field when the stands rock under the cheering that greets another of Ruth's smashes to the fence, 
proved an eye so quick that it sees the ball make an erratic curve and guides the bat to follow. The scientists discovered exactly how quickly Ruth's eye functions by placing him in a dark cabinet, setting into operation a series of rapidly flashing bulbs, and listening to the tick of an electric key by which he acknowledged the flashes. The average man responds to the stimulus of the light in 180 one-thousandths of a second. Babe Ruth needs only 160 one-thousandths of a second. There is the same significance in the fact that Babe's response to the stimulus of sound comes 140 one-thousandths of a second as against the average man's 150 thousandths. Human beings differ very slightly in these sight and sound tests, or rather the fractions are so small that they seem inexpressive, yet a difference of 20 or 10 one-thousandths of a second indicates a superiority of the highest importance. Translate the findings of the sight test into baseball if you want to see what they mean in Babe Ruth's case. They mean that a pitcher must throw a ball 20 one-thousandths of a second faster to fool Babe than to fool the average person. If the results of these tests at Columbia are a revelation to us, who know Ruth as a fast-thinking player, they must be infinitely more amazing to the person who only comes into contact with the big fellow off the diamond and finds him unresponsive and even slow when some non-professional topic is under discussion. The scientific ivory hunters at but Columbia demonstrated that Babe Ruth would have been the home-run king in almost any line of activity he chose to follow, that his brain would have won equal success for him had he drilled it for a long time on some line entirely foreign to the national game. They did it just as they proved his speed and his steadiness by simple laboratory tests. For instance, they had an apparatus with a sort of camera shutter arrangement that opened, winked, and closed at any desired speeds. Cards with letters of the alphabet on them were placed behind the shutter and exposed to view for one fifty thousandth of a second. Ruth read them as they flashed into view, calling almost instantly the units of groups of three, four, five, and six letters. With eight shown, he got the first six and was uncertain of the others. The average person can see four and one-half letters on the same test. When cards marked with black dots were used, Ruth was even faster. He called up the number of dots on every card up to twelve without one mistake. The average person can see eight. To test him for quickness of perception and understanding, he was given a card showing five different symbols, a star, a cross, and three other shapes, many times repeated, and was told to select a number, one, two, three, four, or five, for each symbol, then to mark each selected number under each one as rapidly as he could go over the card. He scored 103 hits on that test, which is the average of all who have tried it, but when given a card covered with printed matter and told to cross out all the A's, he made a score of 60, which is one and a half times the average. The secret of Babe Ruth's ability to hit is clearly revealed in these tests. His eye, his ear, his brain, his nerves, all function more rapidly than do those of the average person. Further, the coordination between eye, ear, brain, and muscle is much nearer perfection than that of the normal healthy man. The scientific ivory hunters dissecting the home-run king discovered brain instead of bone, and showed how little mere luck or even mere hitting strength, has to do with Ruth's phenomenal record. End of Why Babe Ruth is Greatest Home Run Hitter Recording by Matthew Reese Accepting the Universe This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Accepting the Universe by Ethel Puffer Howes An antinomy, O oh my non-philosophical reader, is a contradiction between conclusions from two equally good premises. Thus, for example, did Kant, the philosopher, prove that space both is and is not infinite in extent, and that time both has and cannot have, beginning and an end, thereby getting a foothold or excuse for his world-shaking critique of pure reason itself. And even so can be shown, I ween, the self-contradictions of woman's nature and her present predicament. Is it too much to hope that a way may thus be pointed to a critique of woman's world? 1. The career open to talent is now presupposed in our modern life, but the career open to women 
is a condition sought, not yet attained. Women still greatly lack both opportunities and incentives for the highest achievements, and are therefore still unable to bring their performance up to the level of their acknowledged abilities. And the basic inhibition still operating to suppress the powers of women is the persistent vicious alternative, marriage or career, full personal life versus the way of achievement. Thus might be paraphrased the uttered views of more than one leader or counselor of women today. Women have not yet been offered anything approaching a like opportunity to that put before men, says Dr. Simon Flexner. The scientific career means too often for them, if consistently pursued, the denial of domestic companionships and compensations which men easily win and enjoy. In how far this condition alone will operate to bar women from the higher pursuits and greater rewards of a scientific career, only experience can show. Still more emphatically is it put by President M. Carey Thomas in a recent address, everything leads us to believe that society cannot expect to benefit from the genius and ability of women as a sex until it gives its girls as well as its boys, its women as well as its men, the same opportunities and the same incentives to achieve distinction, and until all women of genius and talent, all women scholars and women teachers, and all women of every profession and every occupation, are permitted by public opinion and social sanction to marry and go on with their job, instead of being found fault with, threatened, and in many cases actually deprived of their bread and butter for doing so. It would be unbelievable if it were not the fact that in all the years of battling for women's rights to be educated and to have a voice in public affairs, this question of the ultimate destination of all women's talents should never have been deliberately faced. Suffragists, of course, met it in the cry, Women's place is in the home but this was so palpably absurd as an argument against women's voting that they were content to show its irrelevance and to pass it by. But the question of the full professional career for women in its relation to marriage, the principle of the independence of work from status, why was it ignored? Did the army of unquestionably celibate women standing ready to enter the few openings available make argument unnecessary? Or were the odds against women so heavy that the basic problem was instinctively postponed until vantage ground at least should have been won? I am inclined to think that the question was, at first, not even formulated. It was tacitly assumed that marriage barred or terminated a career. Whatever the reason, it has been an extraordinary unanimity of silence. Even the two most recent practical and detailed treatises on women's work, Filene's Careers for Women and Adam's Women Professional Workers, in their notes on the advantages and drawbacks of special professions, do not speak of their availability in relation to marriage, still less compare them on that basis. An occasional bit of undesigned testimony, like the phrase, Openings occur, a woman editor marries, and gives up her business career. Filene makes plain that the tacit reference is to unencumbered women. In the last year or two, articles in women's magazines have been observable in a kind of pendular sequence, satires on people who think a woman can't combine a home and a job, alternating with fictional variations on the theme of Mrs. Jellybee and Borea Bulaga. The president of Bryn Mawr College seems to have been the first person in authority to take the bull by the horns. To state the issue clearly, and not as an issue but as a principle, to wit, that the ultimate employment of women's talents must be in the specific fields of those talents, irrespective of status. Also the first to face the issue in action, inasmuch as the practice of the Bryn Mawr College administration has for years admirably squared with this principle, by opening the way for its faculty women 
to continue their work after marriage but that it is to-day the paramount nay the only issue for women of ability and professional training none of them at least need be told if ever there were a question that needed thinking through realistically it is this one of the professional career as a universal consideration in the lives of trained and able women two now let it be admitted at once that equal or commensurate rewards and opportunities incentives and achievements of women are not to be expected in the present organization of society until women do enter the field as fully and as freely as men do unmarried women limited in numbers and in contacts with life cannot charge the citadel of professional privilege in sufficient volume and momentum to carry it until all women of ability in the sense in which it may be said of all men of ability are in action it is probable that few women will reach the highest and the avenues will remain obstructed secondly let it be admitted that every woman should have the right to marry and go on with her job the right meaning a fair field and no disfavor from trustees administrators employers of whatever type or from her social fellows not only the right but the need of every human being to live a normal emotional life as a general condition for full development of latent powers is at least acknowledged and the adjustment of any personal relations whatever to the requirements of a profession is as truly a right of the individual woman as it is a right of the individual man but when so much has been conceded what does it amount to social and professional sanction of the job after marriage would be just so much watered stock it has and will have no value until a vast amount of development work shall have given it value i do not mean on account of the paucity of openings for women but even if we suppose a perfectly fluid distribution or free trade in jobs the gateway is wide open the visa front even so the visa tergo is completely wanting i may have the permission of the universe to wag my ears but the mechanics therefore have not been provided in plain words the job of the kind we are envisaging is at present a physical and mechanical impossibility for the young married woman as a sex for it is the sex we are arguing about for thirty years mrs gilman has been inveighing against the wicked waste of housework without making so far as i can see a dent in the social mechanism nothing can be more absurd to those actually at grips with the facts than the usual references to labor-saving devices as making the professional work of married women possible hours of labor and physical fatigue of the housewife have indeed been reduced but the amount of labor in the home is not the problem of the woman who we are supposing is entering on a professional career it is the possibility of mental concentration of long sustained intensive application of freedom from irrelevant cares and interruptions which every professional man knows is a dire necessity if he is to touch success we did not need candida to explain what every woman knows the amount of subterranean ordering protecting fending off which the ordinary career for men requires this the right to concentrate at need no young married woman who is making a home with her husband can now command it may be theoretically possible but an infinite deal of study experiment and social invention must proceed household operation must be so organized that the young couple in the average community just starting up the professional ladder may both give to their work the best of which they are capable there is for instance any amount of facile talk going about on the subject of cooked food services every unmarried feminist refers to them brightly as about to solve the professional woman's household problems but the bald fact is that no such arrangements now exist 
a number have been initiated, and all have dropped off for different reasons, all excellent ones. Two or three cooperative day nurseries for college professors' wives, I know of only one, a cooperative laundry or two, make up the tale for our thousands of would-be professional women. A few commercial undertakings of the kind exist, but these are quite beyond the means of young people with money success still to achieve. There is probably no service which women of experience and intellectual background, like the Association of American University Women, could do for the younger generation, greater than the research and organizing effort necessary to solve the problem of the basic domestic functions for women professional workers, how a modest household can operate without the personal entanglement of the feminine member. Household engineering, so called, contributes little here, for it deals only with a special technique of housework, and assumes a resident engineer, the housewife herself, and it stops short of the self-propelling activity which alone can be useful to the woman we have in mind. Field organization, not technique, is what is needed. Mrs. Gilman took a shot at the idea in her What Diantha Did. She imagined, for the average small town, an establishment for visiting workers, the commercial undertaking of an educated and intelligent woman. The Woman's Land Army of America, in its brief career, actually set up a type of organization something like what is needed. This was a real social invention, deserving the serious attention of students, which, by the way, in spite of a wide reclaim, it never received. That the particular kind of service supplied was confined to the land does not affect the value of the object lesson. The Woman's Land Army put into the field units for service which were economically self-sustaining, democratic, and within the means of the farmer. The technique of unit management and feasible economical operation were being scientifically studied at the Wellesley College training camp for land army leaders in the summer of 1918. The pressing need of the farmer passed with the war. Many of the early units failed. Others were maintained by wealthy patrons, but of the hundred or more organized, a sufficient number survived, and were successful, to show that the idea was a sound one, and capable of creating a revolution in the status of land workers. Something like this, in method of approach and in type of organization, could be done for the basic household services, food, laundry, nursing, general housework. The economically feasible standards of size, of units, methods, costs, could be determined. Cooperative organization could bring further economy. But just as technique was, after all, the minor problem of the land army, so, for the household, the actual bringing into being of the needed groups is the crux. There would have to be established, in actual operation, Units for such service in every community harboring women professional workers. It cannot, however, be too earnestly affirmed that until this veritable revolution has taken place, and not in a few large cities, but generally, a revolution comparable to the introduction of the telephone, it is premature to urge professional work on married women. Even though doors may be opened, they cannot go through them. More, it is unfair to the talented girl to offer her all the kinds of professional advice and information, except the kind she is most in need of, a clear view of the actual state of the art for married women. What is the mission of the American University woman? Was a question publicly put, with perhaps more sense of duty than sense of humor. I would answer as seriously, to work to clear the way, where it is now most obstructed for every woman's full use of her university training. Is there an antinomy here? Women have learned the alphabet. The necessary and actual consequence is that they press to use to the utmost their natural talents. Yet their present disability is so complete that it amounts to a contradiction in principle. The forms of household mechanics 
to which they themselves blindly cling, render that full use as yet impossible. 3. Imagine, however, this great work of research and organization done. Suppose the mechanical conditions for women's professional work supplied. What of the personal element in marriage as it affects a career? Well, for the sake of the argument, we may assume that with good will and mutual accommodation, two separate careers are mentally and morally compatible in marriage. But two careers are often not physically compatible. Just as two objects cannot occupy the same space at the same time, so one entity, the married pair, is not, to be imagined as occupying two quarters of the globe continuously. The editor of a magazine in New York might conceivably, let us say, be the wife of a college professor in New England, but suppose he gets a call to Tokyo. The institution head who moved on from chair to chair, such things have happened, would not be an eligible husband for a corporation lawyer who was building up a practice in a great city. Yet a relative mobility, freedom to make the best adjustments of location, is the sine qua non of success in a profession, and the force of this requirement increases, the higher in the scale we get. Clearly, all those professions which require continuous operation in the same place would be extra hazardous risks for the double career marriage. And these, the static occupations, are beyond all comparison in possession of the field. Authors, artists, inventors, sailors, all the tribe of the free lances of whatever kind, are indeed not affected, or only measurably affected by the argument. If the feminine partner wants to set up a jungle laboratory, or a mountain observatory, we can imagine the author, though not the actor, as a husband for her. But how many such footloose individuals there are against the millions bound to institutions, colleges, hospitals, libraries, laboratories, city, state, and federal administrations, fixed points like mines, railroads, publishers' offices, or clientels it has taken years to establish? No artificial sex restriction need be invoked to explain the inhibitions of achievement. When two able individuals seek to build separate careers on a partnership of affection alone, the limitations of space and time are enough. Women ought to be able to marry and go on with their job, admitted as a principle, but the space forms of their universe seem to contradict it. And this is the second antinomy. Assuming, nevertheless, as we must assume, women's right and need to develop their powers, and their ability to apply common sense to the inevitable, we may at least expect a very marked limitation in the range of romantic possibilities. Marriage will have to become much more an affair of arrangement, with an eye to the exigencies of occupations, than we in America like to think it is now. It will become more and more necessary to marry, in the profession, as most actors, singers, and circus performers already do. A limited partnership in work will become desirable and necessary where the work is spatially conditioned. Thus, the chemist may take for mate another chemist, or a freelance, like a painter, but not a mining engineer or a ranchman on penalty of stultification for one of the pair. It all sounds very humorous, does it not? Perhaps this is why no effort has ever been made to meet the issue intelligently and consciously, and may hundreds and thousands of talented women, who have married for love, with a world well lost, have found the world of work lost to them, indeed. It should not be forgotten that the greatest scientist among women, Madame Curie, was one of just such a married partnership in work. 4. And now, when we have come so far, I am ready to throw all my arguments away as irrelevant, impertinent, and incompetent. These be but minor antinomies to be resolved by a critique, first, of idols of the house, second, of idols of romance. 
but the supreme self-contradiction is in the intrinsic nature of the woman herself, as everyone knows after all. We have been rightly demanding the life of normal emotional activity and development as a necessary condition of the full growth of women's powers. But we have spoken only of marriage. And marriage, so far as the argument is concerned, is meaningless without motherhood. Of course there have been happy marriages without children, as there have been full lives without marriage. Nevertheless, any theory or regimen of life which shall be relevant for able women as a sex must have motherhood as an integral part. The argument on which our discussion opened referred to a career for women in its intrinsic sense, in the sense in which women should compete with men, a sustained, intensive, creative, or constructive effort, a permanent and serious business. Adams. No one supposes that men expect to achieve without the most intense and most ruthless concentration. Are mothers capable of this? Tolstoy has somewhere, in Anna Karenina, I believe, the picture of a man who is carrying a burden up a mountain. His arms and hands are occupied with the burden, and he cannot use them to help himself up. He stumbles, breathless and suffering. At last he places the burden on his back and binds it safely. Now that his hands are free, he can help himself. He goes on up, stoutly. Now a man's forbidden love, says Tolstoy, is in the first case. He must carry it always in his arms. It prevents his normal activities. It prevents his helping himself. That is how I see the love of children. The mother always carries her children in her arms. It is not possible for her to shift the burden, even if she would. The father can carry them like a burden safely stowed away. He is free to forget them. The mother never. Leaving for the moment all that physical care for the child, which no mother can or will entirely delegate, all those household responsibilities which she needs of children infinitely multiply, and which, I repeat, are years away from being organized to allow real freedom, looking only at the mental conditions, I do not believe, subject to certain exceptions, that the highest order of achievement in any field requiring sustained, intensive, continuous thought or effort is possible to a woman who is a mother. And there is no profession or high-grade occupation which does not require just this. Remember that we are considering on our first supposition not the mother whose children are out of the fold, but the young woman, the woman who is to marry relatively early and go on with her job. On that supposition she is at once in the formative stages of her career, and the lower grades of her income and the early years of her children. It is not primarily a matter of the will, but a direct psychological disability. Physicians have noted that for months after childbirth, the mother suffers from what is sometimes an even painful inconsecutiveness of mind, a felt inability for sustained attention for anything but the child itself. I should like to see detailed studies made for a period covering the early years of motherhood. I believe the results would show, what introspection certainly indicates, a relative failure in sustained attention. But, whether or no this is true as regards the elementary forms of mental activity, there is much testimony to the lapse of that spontaneous and ruthless absorption which preeminent achievement involves. The mother has suffered a transmutation of values. Self-absorption in a task apart has become less possible to her. I do not believe that the conditions are greatly different for the average able woman who has a job and is keeping it. A job means responsibility to hours, places, duties, a certain kind of concentrated effort which must be for times or periods, at the call of the work, intense and protracted. Every executive or executive secretary knows what I mean. The business or professional woman who is taking money for her work 
must be on call for it. Innumerable must be the mental conflicts between preoccupation with her children and duty to her performance. Whether the children suffer or not, the quality of her work must suffer. The woman professional worker will reserve time for her children, we are told, and provide expert care for the rest of their waking and working hours, quoted from a recent newspaper article by a well-known woman. Now it ought to be necessary, in these days of general knowledge of the mental hygiene of the child, to show what mother-love in presence means for his mental and moral health. The physical care may perhaps be organized, though Dorothy Canfield never said a truer word than that the important times in a little child's life are when things are happening to him. Baths, meals, walks, the putting on of overshoes. Recent studies in infant psychology suggest that the shocks of even the first year may be permanently impressed upon the growing child, determining his responses, modifying his vocational future. Expert care is a weasel word. It means simply trained nurses and teachers. But the high type of person who as a nurse or individual teacher can to any degree replace the mother in the rest of his waking and working hours is certainly not to be provided, in addition to other house service, by young professional salaries, even if she were to be had, one to every professional family, which is not the case, even in the largest cities or the most superior neighborhoods. There is no mental or moral understudy for mother love. Even if the mother could summon her whole energy of mind to outside work, the child whose mother is not on call is bound to lose. Shall we pity the tenement child shut out on the streets by its working mother for its lack of a warm shelter and hot dinner, and not see that the real deprivation for any child is of the mother herself, direct refuge and confidant and comforter? I am not writing an anti governess essay. I am simply showing that the requirements of successful work in a profession are just those which conflict with the deepest needs of children and mothers. This is where the average woman professional workers fare worst in the argument. Their hours of work, eight-hour desk jobs, appointments in business hours, daylight trips, the commuter's day, are precisely the worst possible as assessed by children's needs. It is far from being merely another practiced difficulty. It is, on the contrary, symbolic of the whole situation, that the hour of getting off for school, the hour on whose adequacy, from the mother's side, the mental and physical health of the young child's whole day depends, is the hour which, by every other possible criterion, should be free from nervous tension for the professional. As to this time reserved, Ask the professional mother, at the end of her commuter's day, how well able she is to enjoy counsel or correct her young children. Nor is part-time work for married women at all the panacea it is heralded as being. For a career, in any full sense, it is impossible. Miss Filene is right. Anyone who wishes to succeed in any line of work keeps irregular hours. The critical periods which spell preeminence or failure are those of effort without stint or limit. Part-time for anything but a routine job is an aggravation. For a routine job, it is subject to nearly all the disadvantages for the mother herself of the full-time job. It is, of course, often said that the so-called woman of society spends as many hours away from her children as the professional woman. But it should be noted that she has no engagement that is not revocable on the instant. She has no duty to her public, no contract obligation of any kind. Moreover, the children's day falls largely without the hours of society, so that the gayest young mother may, by a little effort, be with her children at all their strategic moments. It all comes down to the paramount duty, and it seems to me that clients or employers' recognition of what call must be paramount 
accounts for nearly all the alleged discrimination against women in the professions. 5. I said that there were exceptions to the principle of motherhood as an inhibiting influence on a career. The exceptions occur, I believe, when the work is of a naturally intermittent or inspirational type. Even the scientific imagination works in flashes. And when the children are demonstrably safe and near, the woman writer, painter, sculptor, musician, home teacher, private investigator, student, or consultant of whatever kind, who can work always within call of her children, is in the happiest case. What a heartening incident is that of George Sand, writing her first novel in a Paris garret, with her boy and girl playing about her feet. The actress, the woman physician, the farmer, the occasional lecturer, all those who absent themselves by appointments adjusted to children's hours, or on a light and flexible schedule, like the college teacher, come next among the exceptions. But beyond these, of the two hundred or so careers for women listed, all but two or three would indeed be unavailable for mothers. One has but to cite the exponents of successful careers, as quoted in Miss Filene's book, Publicity, not confining but intensive, Public stenographer, one must be ready to work continuously thirty-six hours if it becomes necessary in some special case, Private secretary, irregular hours, Executive secretary, irregular hours, should be a member of every committee of the organization, Community center work, aren't enough hours in the twenty-four. Supervisor of physical education, no limit to the amount of time required for making plans, holding meetings, attending games, meets, demonstrations, etc. Employment management consultant, traveling, all kinds of sacrifice of personal life and comfort. Political organizer, no eight-hour day. The good Sunday editor never thinks of clocks. A lawyer controls her own hours, but if she is going to make her profession worth while, her hours will be long and her perseverance never ending. Dean of Women Longer hours, shorter vacations, nervous strain. There are eminent women who have actually combined happy families with high professional achievement outside the home. But these cases present, on analysis, a fortunate combination, say, of flexible working hours with independent income, or with a partnership of affectionate and self-devoted female relatives, a kind of happy chance which is not an intrinsic condition of normal family life, or one on which it is possible to base a philosophy of women's work. If no man without an active mother or unmarried sister could become a geologist or a court pleader or the field secretary of a welfare organization, we should have a situation somewhat analogous. The normal family, professional or not, must stand on its own feet. The paradox is that the only universally possible assistance is paid assistance. That certainly does not offer the emotional insight with children, responsibility, and continuity, which alone can free mothers effectively. Family affection and assistance does sometimes give it but the possibility of such assistance is pure chance. It would seem, then, that while women are forced by a normal principle of growth to seek to use fully the abilities which their education has set free, a natural and original principle in turn saps their effort at its spring. Women are both inevitably impelled to, and interdicted from, marriage, children, and careers. What can one say but that woman, like space and time, being subject to so complete an antinomy, requires like them to have the conditions of her world somehow transcended? I accept the universe, cried Margaret Fuller. Gad, she'd better, was Carlyle's retort, so much acclaimed by men. But I think she was, for women, or hasty. 6. The only solution I can now see of the problem of a career, 
for a creature with a natural paramount interest elsewhere, is quite in the line of Kant's denial of space, already overpassed by Einstein. Why not deny, erase, transcend the whole notion of a career, with its connotations of competition, success, rewards, honors, titles? Might it not have an epochal effect on the progress of science if one half of the able people in the world should consciously, explicitly, and proudly refuse to compete? What an illuminating phrase dropped by Madame Curie. Her husband had been so deep in science that he had not paid the necessary attention to his career. Is it then to this vague utopian precept that our promised realistic analysis has brought us? Certainly, it is only by greater vagueness that the myth of women's equal competence, not ability, has been maintained. The woman's antinomy will be thrown up ever more clearly as increasing numbers seek careers. Perhaps to try the other way will hasten the day when the method of contest and survival will disappear. For the present, the practical application of the principle would be in a deliberate, purposeful making over of the conditions of women's work. Many desk jobs, much appointment and consultation work, can be adjusted to family life. Piecework, emergency, substitute, overseers, directors, and allied jobs will increase, and will take the place of office work. I think that the possibilities open here to a recognized intention would surprise us, but the great transformation would be through the marriage partnerships and work already forecast. The flexible schedule and mutual replacements of such a partnership would open up nearly all lines of work to a mother. How much it would make for companionship in marriage is clear enough, but beyond the scope of this argument. The chance to work and learn and earn would still remain if married women were explicitly to forego the career. It is not to be expected or desired that women should now stifle the energies they have at last discovered and proved. But this I know, that unless we are to have as our next generation a race of dry, cold, warped, inhibited little creatures, we have got to make some such changes as I have suggested in the line of women's actual occupation. The philosophy of the whole thing has got to be changed. Suppose all women of ability could plan for love and children, and each for the joy of the working, but then women would have all the really desirable things. End of Accepting the Universe A new formula for behaviorism. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jean Dofrio, Indianapolis, Indiana. A new formula for behaviorism. Footnote. Read in part before the Western Psychological Association. Berkeley, California, August 5th, 1921. End footnote. Edward Chase Tolman, 1922. First published in Psychological Review, 29, 44 to 53. The idea of behaviorism is abroad. In the most diverse quarters, its lingo if not its substance, is spreading like wildfire. Why? In the first place, it is to be observed that ever since the days of Ebbing Hoss's experiments on memory, the inadequacy of the merely introspective method as such has been becoming more and more obvious. And the recent work in mental tests and animal psychology has strengthened this conviction. In the second place, there has always been a formal, logical difficulty about the introspective method which has troubled certain minds. That is, the definition of psychology as the examination and analysis of private conscious contents 
has been something of a logical sticker. For how can one build up a science upon elements which by very definition are said to be private and non-communicable? And thirdly, the introspective method is practically arduous and seemingly barren of results. It is these three features, then, which seem to have been primarily responsible for the spread and catching of behavioristic categories. What now does the behaviorist offer as a substitute? We turn to the arc behaviorist, Watson. Behaviorism, he says, will be the study of stimulus and response such that given the stimulus we can predict the response, and given the response we can predict the stimulus. Very good, but how does he define stimulus and response? He defines them, he says, in the terms in which physiology defines them. That is, stimuli are such things as, quote, rays of light of different wavelengths, sound waves differing in amplitude, length, phase, and combination, gaseous particles given off in such small diameters that they affect the membranes of the nose, end quote, etc. And responses are such things as, quote, muscle contractions and gland secretions, end quote. Footnote, Psychology from the Standpoint of a Behaviorist, page 10, and footnote. We turn, however, to a later chapter. Footnote. Opere citato. Chapter 6. Hereditary Modes of Response. Emotions. Page 195. End footnote. And read with astonishment in a footnote that, quote, It is perfectly possible for a student of behavior entirely ignorant of the sympathetic nervous system and of the glands and smooth muscles, or even of the central nervous system as a whole, to write a thoroughly comprehensive and accurate study of the emotions. End quote. But how can this be, we ask, if, by very definition, behavior is a matter of muscle contractions and gland secretions? How, on the basis of this definition, can a person ignorant of glands and muscles write a behavioristic account of anything. That he can write such an account, we would admit. The only difference between our point of view and Watson's would be that we should insist that such an account would be the only truly behavior account, and that an account in terms of muscle contraction and gland secretion, as such, would not be behaviorism at all but a mere physiology. It should be noted that the possibility of a behaviorism which shall be not a mere physiology, but something different, has apparently already occurred to a number of writers. Thus, for example, Holt says that, quote, the phenomena evinced by the integrated organism are no longer merely the excitation of nerve or the twitching of muscle, nor yet the play merely of reflexes touched off by stimuli. These are all present and essential to the phenomena in question, but they are merely the components. Now the biological sciences have long recognized this new and further thing and called it behavior. Footnote E. B. Holt, Journal of Philosophy, Psychology, and Scientific Methods, 1915, 12, 366. And footnote. Mrs. De Laguna also explicitly states that what we want is a behaviorism which is not mere physiology. Quote, In order to understand behavior, we must resolve it into a system of interrelated functions. Just as in order to understand the physiological workings of the human body, we must envisage the complex of chemical and mechanical processes as falling into such fundamental groups as digestion, circulation, etc., constitutive of the physiological economy. Now, just as there is a physiological economy, so there is a larger vital economy in closest union with, yet distinguishable from it. This is the system of behavior, by means of which the being, animal or human, 
maintains his relations with the environment and forms a factor in its transformation. The science of behavior has the task of tracing the lineaments of this larger economy. End quote. Footnote. Grace A. De Laguna. Psychological Review, 1919, 26, 410 to 411. See also other articles by the same author. Dualism in Animal Psychology, in the Journal of Philosophy, Psychology, and Scientific Methods, 1918, 15, 617 to 627. And Dualism and Animal Psychology, a Rejoinder, in the Journal of Philosophy, Psychology, and Scientific Methods, 1919, 16, 296 to 300, and Empirical Correlations of Mental and Bodily Phenomena in the Journal of Philosophy, Psychology, and Scientific Methods, 1918, 20, 533 to 541. End footnote. A.P. Wace also seems to some slight extent at any rate, to lean towards the same view of the desirability of a non-physiological behaviorism. For example, the following, quote, The investigation of the internal neural conditions form part of the behavioristic program, of course. But the inability to trace the ramification of any given nervous excitation through the nervous system is no more a restriction on the study of effective stimuli and reactions in the educational, industrial, or social phases of life than is the physicist's inability to determine just what is going on in the electrolyte of a battery while a current is passing, a limitation that makes research in electricity impossible. End quote. Footnote. The relation between physiological psychology and behavior psychology in the Journal of Philosophy, Psychology, and Scientific Methods, 1919, 16, 626. End footnote. The two essential theses which we wish to maintain in this paper are, first, that such a true non-physiological behaviorism is really possible, and, second, that when it is worked out, footnote, attention should be drawn to two other very significant attempts to begin a detailed working out of such a behaviorism in addition to Mrs. de Laguna's in the article on emotion and perception from the behaviorist standpoint, already quoted from. These are to be found in a series of articles by J. R. Cantor, A Functional Interpretation of Human Instincts in Psychological Review, 1920, 27, 50 to 72. Also in Suggestions Toward a Scientific Interpretation of Perception in Psychological Review, 1920, 27, 197 to 216, and also in An Attempt Towards a Naturalistic Description of Emotions in Psychological Review, 1921, 28, 19 to 42, and 120 to 140, and in a Tentative Analysis of the Primary Data of Psychology, Journal of Philosophy, 1921, 18, 253 to 269, and in a series of articles by R. B. Perry, A Behavioristic View of Purpose, Journal of Philosophy, 1921, 15, 85 to 105, and in the Independent Universality of Purpose and Belief, Journal of Philosophy, 1921, 18, 169 to 180, and in The Cognitive Interest and Its Refinements, in the Journal of Philosophy, 1921, 18, 365 to 375. It must be pointed out, however, that whereas both these authors are given yeoman strokes in the direction of just such a non-physiological behaviorism as the writer is contending for, neither of them seems himself to be wholly self-conscious of this essential difference between such a true behaviorism and a mere physiology. End footnote. This new behaviorism will be found capable of covering not merely the results of mental tests, objective measurements of memory, 
and animal psychology as such, but also all that was valid in the results of the older introspective psychology. And this new formula for behaviorism which we would propose is intended as a formula for all of psychology. A formula to bring formal peace, not merely to the animal worker, but also to the addict of imagery and feeling tone. But how can this be done? By what single common set of concepts can we possibly take care both of the facts of gross behavior and those of the consciousness and imagery? Before attempting to suggest such a set of concepts, let us indulge in a preliminary epistemological skirmish. Let us start from the usual dualistic hypothesis implicit in traditional psychological thinking. Suppose, that is, we assume that consciousness is, paren, for the purposes of psychology at any rate, if not for those of an ultimate metaphysics, and paren, a new kind of something or other which is added to certain behavior situations, but not to others. Introspective psychology claims the study and analysis of this new something or other as its own peculiar field. Consciousness is assumed by it to be something private to each individual, which he alone can analyze and report upon. And the introspective account purports to be such an analysis and report. What now can our behaviorism answer to this? Our behaviorism will reply that whether or not there is such a private something or other present in the conscious behavior situation, and lacking in the unconscious one, this private something or other never gets across, as such, from one individual to another. All the things that do get across are merely behavior phenomena or the objective possibilities of such phenomena. Suppose, for example, that I introspect concerning my consciousness of colors. All you can ever really learn from such introspection is whether or not I shall behave towards those colors in the same way that you do. You never can learn what the colors really feel like to me. It is indeed conceivable that just as immediate feels, paren, if there are any such things, and paren, the colors may be something quite different for me from what they are for you. And yet if I agree with you in behaving to them, i.e., in my namings of and pointings to the colors, no amount of introspection will ever discover to you this fact of their uniqueness to each of us as immediate feels. You will only discover what the colors are for me as behavior possibilities. Let us now turn to some of the actual concepts which seem to me to be required by such a point of view. We will confine ourselves to four. Stimulating agency, behavior cue, behavior object, and behavior act. They may be thought of as very loosely analogous to the physiologist's concepts of external stimulus, receptor process, conductor process, and effector process. The stimulating agency may be defined in any standardized terms, those of physics, of physiology, or of common sense, and it constitutes the independent, initiating cause of the whole behavior phenomenon. Thus, on different occasions, it may consist variously in, and be describable as, as sense organ stimulation, paren, in the case of perceptual behavior, and paren, as the administering of a particular drug, e.g. hashish, paren, in the case of hallucinatory behavior, and paren, or as the neurological end result of a preceding activity, paren, in the case of a behavior based upon memory or recall, and paren. The nature of the behavior cue will be understood most readily from a consideration of the dialectic which underlies the experimental work on sensory discrimination in animals. In such work, the results, when strictly interpreted, are found to tell us nothing but the possibility of differences of behavior as a result of different stimulating agencies. If, for example, 
we find that a mouse can learn to behave differently as a result of blue and yellow stimuli, but not as a result of a red and green stimuli. We do not conclude anything as regards the animal's consciousness of these colors as such, but merely something as regards the behavior cues which these colors are capable of evoking in him, that is, blue and yellow wavelengths are capable of producing in him two different behavior cues, whereas red and green wavelengths are capable of producing in him only one. In other words, where the older psychology talked about sense qualities, our new behaviorism will talk about behavior cues. The new concept is identifiable with the older one insofar, but only insofar, as the latter explained the possibility or lack of possibility of differences of behavior. The new concept departs utterly from the old insofar as the latter implied something concerning immediate feels as such. By applying different stimulating agencies to our organism, we discover the number and range of his possible behavior cues. We learn which stimulating agencies he can use as a basis for differences of behavior and which he cannot use as cues for different behaviors. And we learn something concerning the degrees of difference between these different behavior cues. For example, we learn that, in a human of normal color vision, although the stimulating agencies designated as orange and red wavelengths produce behavior cues which are different from one another, still, these behavior cues are more similar to one another, paren, in that, on occasion, they are more likely to lead to an identical behavior, end paren, then are the two behavior cues produced by the stimulating agencies known as red and green wavelengths, and so on. In other words, the sum of the behavior cues possible for any given organism constitutes a total system which is to be defined not merely in terms of its relation to the stimulating agencies which evoke its members, but also in terms of the interrelations of similarity and difference between those members. We do not learn, however, anything about sensation qualities as such, neither when we observe the gross behavior of another organism, nor when we ask the latter to introspect. We learn the nature of his behavior cues. We do not learn the nature of his immediate feels. Let us turn now to a consideration of the next of our four concepts, that of the behavior object. Just as the concept of the behavior cue was found to bear a certain relation to a concept of the older psychology, paren, viz. that of sense quality, and paren, so the concept of the behavior object bears an analogous relation to another concept of the older psychology, viz. that of the perceived or apperceived meaning. A behavior object results from a behavior cue or a group of behavior cues which, because of a particular behavior situation, possesses for the organization in question a specific behavior meaning. For example, we present an ordinary Western European with a chair. It produces in him, because of the structure of his sense organs, and as a result of its color, shape, etc., certain specific behavior cues. In addition, however, because of his particular training and past experience and state of behavior readiness, at the moment, such behavior cues resulting from these shapes, colors, etc., arouse in him a very specific group of behavior tendencies, e.g., those of sitting upon, getting up from, kneeling on, moving up to the table, etc. This group of aroused tendencies defines his behavior object. That is, they constitute on that particular occasion the behavior meaning of the colors, shapes, etc. To use the terminology of the older psychology, we would say that the behavior cues in question are here apperceived as the behavior object chair. On another occasion, however, this same group of behavior cues might be apperceived not as a chair, but as a very different sort of behavior object. If we were drunk, it might be apperceived not as a thing to sit on, 
to kneel on, but as a thing to run away from, to scream at, etc. Thus, the behavior object is to be defined in the last analysis simply in terms of the group of behaviors to which it may lead. And it is to be emphasized that it, no more than the behavior Q, can be defined in terms of immediate conscious feels. For no one of us ever knows for certain what another organism's conscious feels may be. We know only the behavior implications of those conscious feels. We turn now to the last of our four concepts, that of the behavior act. The behavior act is simply the name to be given to the final bits of behavior as such. The behavior act together with the stimulating agencies constitute the fundamentals upon which the rest of the system is based. They are such entities as to sniff, to sit, to scratch, to walk, to gallop, to talk. They are directly correlated with the action system of the given organism. They vary and increase in number with the growth and development of the organism. But it is they alone which, at any given stage in this growth and development, tell us all that we know of such an organism's mentality. Paren, even when that organism is another human being who can introspect. Footnote. Such introspection is itself but one of these behavior acts. End footnote. End paren. Used as a means of comparing different stimulating agencies on the basis simply of the relative discriminability and non-discriminability of the latter, the behavior acts provide us with our definition of behavior cues, paren, i.e., sensation and image qualities, end paren and used to discover the totality of different alternative behaviors which may result from a given collection of behavior cues. The behavior acts provide us with our definition of behavior objects, paren, i.e., perceptions and ideations, end paren. If, now, we sum up the situation, it will appear that the problems of our behavioristic science must fall into three groups those of 1. Given the stimulating agency, determining the behavior cues, 2. Given the behavior cues, determining the behavior object, and 3. Given the behavior object, determining the behavior act. The first of these problems is the well-known one of the older physiological psychology of determining the relations between sensory and image qualities and their underlying physiological conditions. The second problem, that of the relation of behavior object to behavior cue, is the old one of perception and apperception. Our rewording of it will not, I think, make it any the less easy of final solution. Finally, the problem of the relation of behavior act to behavior object is the extremely important problem of motive. It is the problem of desire, emotion, instinct, habits, determining set. It is a problem which the older analytical formulation tended to obscure and make almost impossible. If our behavioristic formulation has any practical value at all, if, that is, it has any value in addition to that of unifying under a single rubric all the different types of method which psychology employs, then that practical value will be, I believe, in the more successful treatment which it will allow and suggest for this matter of motive, determining set, and the like. What, finally, are we to say about those difficult, and to the opponents of behaviorism, seemingly insuperable problems of imagery, feeling tone, language, introspection? An adequate discussion would cover many pages. I can here merely throw out a suggestion or two. In the first place, I would suggest that consciousness as such, i.e., conscious behavior as opposed to merely unconscious behavior, is to be thought of simply as the case in which a number of behavior acts are being made or tending to be made simultaneously. If I am conscious of the chairness of a chair, 
It is because I tend not only to sit, but to stand up, to kneel, etc., simultaneously. If, in addition, I am conscious of the color and shape of the chair as such, I tend, am set, not merely to behave in these appropriate ways toward chairs, but also to discriminate by all other possible behaviors its particular color and shape from all other colors and shapes. Images and ideas would be simply a particular case where behavior object and behavior cue have different space and time implications from those holding in the case of presented objects and qualities. And feelings and emotions would be treated as combining both behavior objects and behavior cues in that they involve both discriminable qualities and specific unvarying types of behavior, paren, for example, approach, avoidance, and the like, and paren. Finally, language in general and introspection in particular are simply themselves behavior acts which in the last analysis indicate to the observer the very same behavior cues and behavior objects which might be indicated by the mere gross forms of behavior for which they are substitutes. In closing this very brief and inadequate sketch, it may be remarked that its excuse is to be found in the hope that it may have suggestive and propaganda value, if nothing else. The five points I should wish to emphasize are 1. There are obvious formal inconsistencies in the subjectivistic formula as such. 2. The possibilities of a new non-physiological behaviorism have already found expression on the part of a number of writers. 3. Such a non-physiological behaviorism seems to be capable of covering not only behaviorism proper, but introspectionism as well. For if there are any such things as private mental feels, they are never revealed to us, paren, even in introspection, and paren. All that is revealed are potentialities for behavior. 4. As a first step in working out such a non-physiological behaviorism, I suggest the concepts of stimulating agency, behavior cue, behavior object, and behavior act, and 5. The value of the new formation will be in part theoretical, in that it will bring under a single rubric all the apparently different and contradictory methods of actual psychology, but in part also practical, in that it will allow for a more ready and adequate treatment of the problems of motive, purpose, determining tendency, and the like, then was made easy by the older subjectivistic formula. End of A New Formula for Behaviorism